This is Audible. Podium Audio presents Enemies and Allies, Book Four of Earth at War, written by Rick Partlow, performed by Scott Aiello. Chapter One. I don't understand. Brady Evans said, his boyish face screwed up in a frown. Why you're a major? God knows that makes two of us. I admitted. Colonel Evans was, I decided, four weeks ago when this voyage of the damned started, an asshole. It wasn't a shock. He was a colonel, and I think I could count the number of colonels I'd met who weren't assholes on one hand, and still have a finger left to pick my nose. The thought made my nose itch, and I reached through my open visor and rubbed it carefully. The Svalin powered armor amplified my natural musculature, and breaking my own nose was pretty far up among the things I was trying to avoid. No, Evans insisted, and I might have been uncharitable when I thought of his eyes as piggish, but it was the only word that came to mind. I mean, you were a first lieutenant when you got out of active duty, right? I was. I very carefully did not sigh, although I wanted to, badly. I went into the reserves and wound up getting kicked up to captain and made a company commander. I shrugged, though it didn't register enough for the armor to imitate it. And then I promptly retired. So why major? Motherfucker just wouldn't leave it alone. Why couldn't he have ridden in the other shuttle with the rest of the Ranger Company's headquarters platoon like Danny Brooks always did? Mostly because I don't fit in the command structure, I said, past caring how it sounded. I started out as an advisor with no command and no real duties other than to be Jiminy Cricket on Colonel Oliveira's shoulder. Jiminy, who? Dude, you are not younger than me, so don't even fucking start. And not important. Anyway, Oliveira didn't want me to be a captain because he didn't want the Ranger Company commanders thinking they could order me around, so they brought me in as a major. Okay, I get that. He said, with an expression like he just passed a particularly stubborn turd. But Jesus, you won the medal. I mean, the medal. And you've seen more dismounted combat off planet than anyone alive. You're leading Reaction Force One. I winced. Pops hated that name. His Delta team, well, my Delta team now, though I still had trouble thinking of it that way. Had a name and a designator, and by God, that was still who they were. Even if they operated on other planets now, and had a dumbass marine major for a commanding officer. But I suppose that the Joint Chiefs had a point that they were special, but they were not going to be unique much longer. They, we, had been too successful for that. So we were Reaction Force One now, and Reaction Force Two was already in training. And selection was underway for Reaction Force Three, and because of diversity, two was made up of Navy SEALs and probably already had a book deal. Three would probably be Royal Marines or French Foreign Legion or something. Yeah, and maybe when we get back, they'll kick me up to Light Colonel. But after, I closed my eyes, trying not to choke on the words because it was another lame-ass melodramatic name we all hated. After the battle for Earth. Julie and I were set on getting out, so no one was bothering. You know, what changed your mind? Well, we're going out farther than anyone in the whole alliance has gone before. I reminded him, trying to find the lost gods who created four races out of Earth animals and terraformed hundreds of planets. How many people do you know who could resist that? So far, all we've seen is one lifeless planet after another. Evans said, making a face. Which was difficult, since he pretty much always looked like he was making a face. I hope to God this one is different. If you two are done whining, Julie Nieves said, we're about to jump. Whoops, Julie Clanton. Now we hadn't been married long enough for me to get used to that. You'd whine too, I told her, grinning just at the sound of her voice in my ear. If you were stuck in a damned shuttle every time we jumped into a new star system, think how I feel. Pops put in from the seat to my right-hand side, just behind the shuttle's co-pilot. I'm stuck in here, and I have to listen to you whine.
Chief Warrant Officer Mark Tremonti had earned the nickname Pops by virtue of being the oldest man on the Delta team back when Jambo had led it. He was still the oldest, though you couldn't tell it just by looking at him anymore. The Helta genetic therapy that they'd made available to all of us puny humans had reversed the aging process for those of us past our prime, and Pops looked a lot more like the guy in the induction ceremony photo than he did the grizzled old veteran I'd met back at the beginning of this whole thing. You should all know the official Space Force technical term for the process by now, General Michael Oliveira reminded us, chuckling. It's hyperdimensional translation, not hyperspace jump. This is not a science fiction movie, after all, particularly not a shitty one. Ooh, low blow, Julie laughed. You should know better than to diss his favorite movie, sir. Tell me. Another voice came over the intership comms, a deeper one, not quite human. What you're talking about? The translator program is giving me a vague idea of what you mean by the word movie. A fictional story told in two-dimensional projection. But what particular story are you talking about? It was strange having Anu Neem Klaas on the James Bowie, but he'd insisted on coming along. This was a mission for the whole alliance, and there should be representatives from one of the other races. I was glad it was him, though, instead of one of the weird octopus people. A werewolf I could take. A talking octopus would have been harder to deal with. Only the best three movies and one TV series ever made, I said. Remind me to play them for you when we get a chance, Anu. There were nine movies and like six TV series, Oliveira said, and I saw red. No, there were not, I snapped, forgetting I was talking to a general. There were three movies and one TV show, and anyone who says anything else is a damned liar. Boys, Julie murmured, focus, hyperdimensional translation in ten seconds. She didn't count down from ten because she knew I hated it. Instead, we just jumped. Coming in and out of hyperspace wasn't much easier or more pleasant now than it had been the first time. But I had perhaps grown used to the feeling of having my soul ripped out, twisted, folded, spindled, and mutilated before being stuffed back into the general vicinity of my body. I shook the sensation off and touched a control on the back of my left forearm to tie into the Jambo's tactical feed, then pulled down my visor so I could see the heads-up display. G-Class Star the ship's tactical officer reported. We had another new guy at the position, and I couldn't remember his name for the life of me, so I cheated and checked the roster ID sitting under his station listing. Captain Charles Graziano. That was the problem with crewing the flagship of our fledgling Starfleet. They kept cycling new crew through her to get them trained. We're at the edge of the system. I'm picking up six planets, I think. Computer says only one in the Goldilocks zone, though. The display was giving me the same information if I knew how to read it correctly, but the narration simplified things, and I could put the glowing dots the computer projected on the app into some sort of perspective. The farthest out was an ice giant, decorated with a set of rings, then two gas giants, smaller than Saturn but still respectable, each carrying a complement of about a dozen moons, then an asteroid belt, because every system seemed to have one, and finally the terrestrial worlds. One of the terrestrial planets was too cold, one was too hot, and one was just right. But has anyone been eating the porridge? Are we getting any signs of civilization? Oliveira asked the question in a much more serious way than I had in my head. No transmissions on the electromagnetic spectrum, sir, the communications officer piped up. He was a Brit, among the first of the international crews the Space Force was fielding as a bone thrown to our allies. Lieutenant Rajiv Shah was competent at his job, but I'd never forgive him for displacing our last communications officer, Lieutenant Adams, who had been as big a sci-fi geek as I was. I'm not picking up any space activity yet, sir, Graciana reported. No exhausts, no thermal signatures, no spectroscopic analysis results. Well, damn, Evans murmured. Even Oliveira sighed. He was as tired of dry holes as the rest of us. The planet is definitely habitable, though, Graciano added. Spectroscopic analysis confirms a nitrogen-oxygen atmosphere. I suppose that's something, Oliveira said. Might as well get a closer look. Jump us to a minimum safe distance, Julie, then make for high orbit. 
Aye, sir. You heard the commander, guys and gals. It's a micro jump. Clench up and try not to puke. Joy, Sergeant Randy Quinn commented. I think I'd almost rather get shot at. He was somewhere behind me, strapped in with the rest of Reaction Force One. He had been a ranger, part of the very first company assigned to the ship, but after he'd distinguished himself in multiple battles, I'd asked for him to be assigned to the team. Even with the new T.O.N.E. and them not strictly being a U.S. Army Special Operations Detachment Delta team anymore, Pops hadn't been completely sold on allowing anyone on the team who hadn't been through selection. But we both figured he'd proven himself, and God knows we had holes to fill. He had not, as of yet, earned a nickname. You didn't choose a nickname on the team. One got chosen for you, and not lightly. I'd suggested Tarzan for his part in the now-legendary elk hunt that had solidified our friendship with the Skrith in general and Anunim Klaas in particular. But Pops had insisted that the action had happened before he was part of the team and was thus ineligible for nickname status. Maybe them damn seals hand out nicknames like candy, he'd said, stubborn as a mule. But that ain't us. We may be Reaction Force One now, but some things ain't gonna change. Jumping now. The jumping now wasn't the bad part. It was the next jumping now that hurt. Micro jumps inside a single star system meant spending only seconds inside hyperspace before hopping back out again. And if jumping once was a punch in the gut, doing it twice in a few seconds was a kick in the balls, metaphorically, by a metaphorical NFL kicker who was trying to make a 60 yard field goal in a playoff game. And we're through. Like I needed the announcement, the muscle spasms and the existential crisis that went with them told the story very well. It took me a moment to refocus my eyes, but when I did, a blue-green planet filled my vision. It looked a lot like Earth, though the continents didn't match up, of course. A bit less land, or maybe the land was just spread out into more islands with shallow seas between. Pretty, Quinn said. I wasn't surprised he was savvy enough to link into the feed. He'd been doing this as long as I had. Bet the fishing's good. This place have a name yet, General? I asked Oliveira. Not unless the Alliance gave it one, he said. Anonim Klaas? We have not, the Skrith ambassador assured us. Not even the Helta and Shamblisi have sent probes this far from our home systems. To us, these stars are numbers on a map, and the planets not even that. We should call it Fishing Hole. I suggested. Sergeant Quinn observed that there was probably good fishing down there, and we should be thinking long term. Someone's got to make a killing on extraterrestrial real estate, and I don't see why it can't be us. We're in position for drone launch, sir, Julie said, ignoring me. Still nothing on the sensors? Oliveira took the hint and did the same, which I found vaguely annoying. Nothing that would indicate heavy industry, Graziano told him. We're not going to see much more from up here. Launch the drones. The drones were something new, brought in especially for this mission. They were cheap and simple and disposable, and everything the military wasn't, which was because they were the brainchild of Daniel Gatlin, the eccentric entrepreneur whose private lunar orbiter I'd been aboard when the Helta first showed up in our system. He'd been on a personal crusade to remake the military procurement process in his own image, ever since we'd been invited into the Alliance, and these were his latest. Off-the-shelf rocket motors, off-the-shelf ablative material left over from Orion capsules no one used anymore, off-the-shelf surveillance drones that would have been sold as surplus otherwise. The only non-standard equipment was the satellite transceiver, and even that was pulled off another defense contract that was moribund due to alien technology. There was much wailing and gnashing of teeth in the military-industrial complex, and there'd been just as much yelling and screaming in Congress, but ultimately, being the first constituency to receive fusion reactors and industrial fabricators had overruled the few hundred suddenly obsolete defense production jobs. I still wasn't sure if I was okay with that. Ultimately, we'd expand out to Alpha Centauri and some of the former Tavinian colonies, and there'd be plenty of opportunities for work, but at the moment, we were headed for a pyramid economy where all the technical jobs were centrally controlled and everyone at the bottom was well-fed, well-entertained, and taken care of, but useless. I'd written dystopian novels that started that way. The current administration understood that, 
and President Crenshaw had assured me he had plans to avoid it. But administrations didn't last forever. Maybe we'd moved past the point in history where a new administration could undo everything that had been done. Maybe it had a momentum of its own, and we'd finally start to act like rational people. Oh, good God. I write science fiction. I've been to other star systems. I've talked to intelligent bears and wolves, and even I couldn't buy that. Drones are in atmosphere, Graziano announced. A blade of shells have been ejected and parachutes deployed. I was still tied into the technical station, and it only took another flick of the controls on the back of my wrist to loop me into the feed from the drones. There were four of them, and the display was quartered in the upper left corner of my HUD, which made everything almost too small to see. But all I had to do was stare at one of the sections for a second or two, and it expanded to fill my vision. Two of them were coming in on the night side, and although the thermal and infrared cameras were giving us data, there was something more viscerally satisfying about the daylight feed, so I chose one of those to bring up. The image bobbed like a pendulum, swinging lightly at the end of the parachute cords, waiting for the altitude where it would be cut loose and use its wings and propeller. I could have been staring out of an airplane window over the Pacific, though the islands below were larger than the ones I'd seen on Earth. Not quite Australia, New Zealand large, but big enough. When the drone separated from the parachute, my stomach dropped with it, and I had to clench my teeth and close my eyes to reestablish my sense of up and down. The flight was quick, the descent a roller coaster, and I wondered if Graziano knew I'd dialed in and was trying to give me motion sickness. But once it leveled off, I forgot all about my stomach and my inner ear and stared at the rolling waves of the sea off the largest island. There were boats on the water. Is anyone else seeing this? I wondered. Take the drone lower, Graziano, Oliveira ordered. Give me a look at whoever's running those things. The boats were nothing to write home about. No three-masted schooners or triremes with banks or oarsmen. Outrigger canoes. That was what they looked like, though with some kind of crude sail hung up as well. Technology that predated metallurgy and could have been produced with tools fashioned out of lava rock. As the drone descended, coming close enough for them to see it, the stick figure humanoids at the oars began pointing, gesticulating in what might have been a panic or maybe a religious fervor. They were wearing some sort of cloaks, I thought, something multicolored and gaudy that went from head to toe except for a leather harness over their torsos. That was what I thought at first. I was holding my breath, and I didn't know why. What was I expecting? I wasn't sure, but I knew something was off. That way you can just tell when someone is watching you, some ancient instinct acting faster than the human mind. As the drone drew closer, I knew why. They were humanoids, but they weren't human. Those weren't cloaks. They were feathers. Chapter 2 I have, Anonim Claus declared, never seen anything like that before. Coming from a wolf man, that was saying something. Mind you, the Skrith were not like the modern movie werewolf, not a wolf that walked on two legs, but more the classic Lon Chaney Jr. wolf man, a humanoid with wolfish features, pronounced canines, pointed ears. They were what you got when you took a wolf or maybe a dire wolf, from tens of thousands of years ago, and genetically manipulated it until it was a bipedal humanoid. And the images in the projection above the conference table in the operations center were what you got when you took, I don't know, a macaw, a peacock, a secretary bird, and did the same thing. I couldn't have told you what species the fabled elders had snatched off of Old Earth to make the beings paddling the dugout canoe, just that they were avian. Are you sure? I asked him, aware that I was repeating myself, but pressing the point because it was important. There weren't any old legends or ruins of dead planets with the remains of these things. I am not as learned in the ways of science as our late respected friend Junpa of the Helta, he said, and the words had the air of being carefully crafted to show respect for Junpa despite the fact that the Skrith and the Helta didn't particularly like each other. But I do have access to the complete archaeological and paleontological records of the Alliance, and I checked them before this meeting. 
If these things were known by anyone in the Alliance, they did not share the knowledge with the rest of us. Why is this important? Evans wondered. Now that the stand-to was over and we knew the system held no threats, we, the rest of the reaction force and the rangers, were out of our powered armor and back in duty uniforms. Evans looked much less imposing without the exoskeleton, and I had a couple inches and maybe ten pounds on him. But rangers were skinny bastards in general, so I didn't hold that against him. His hair was a close-cropped blonde, and I guess it had once had some gray in it before the Helta rejuvenation treatments. I'd read his file and talked to him briefly, so I knew his record. Venezuela, same as me, though he'd been there first. Arcom, as a company commander. Army Commendation Medal, which was as common as halitosis among ranger officers in Venezuela, so I didn't know how much he'd actually done. Still, he was here, and they didn't assign anyone to the Jambo unless they were cream of the crop. But he'd still asked a dumbass question, and I was about to inform him of that when Dr. Haskett did it for me. It's important, Colonel, the brusque, mop-haired civilian told him. Because if this alien race is not in the Alliance records, that means they were either left over from an earlier experiment by the Elders, or a later one. And either possibility means we're heading in the right direction. Ashley Haskett was a polymath, one of the few I'd ever encountered in a secondary career full of interviews with every science type I thought might have expertise handy for my science fiction novels. Everyone was a specialist nowadays, and not just in biology or physics, but in one tiny subfield, but not Haskett. She was a generalist through the fields of evolutionary biology, molecular biology, physiology, and zoology, and a notable enough one that she'd been on the cover of various magazines and had more television interviews than even me. And if that left off the entire physics side of the aisle, well, we didn't honestly need a civilian for that. We had an engineering crew full of them not to mention a handful of Alliance researchers who mostly kept to their little alcoves and labs. How so? Evans asked, and I counted to ten before I answered, hoping Haskett would save me the trouble, but she just sighed and rolled her eyes. If it's one of their early experiments, Oliveira said with much more patience than I would have had, then they were doing it closer to home before they moved inward toward the Alliance. If it's one of the later ones, then it was when they were on their way out of the Alliance systems, heading to wherever they went. Oh, okay. I mean, yes, sir. And I didn't quite know if he actually understood, but that was okay, as long as he shut up. And maybe the most significant thing about finding the bird people, Julie said, leaning back in her chair, arms crossed, is that we've been heading down this hyperdimensional track for three weeks, and this is the first sentient life we've found. Sentient, but not very advanced, I said, shrugging. I didn't see anything above the Stone Age in the drone feed. I frowned at Oliveira, a mirror of the perpetual expression on his tanned, dour face. Maybe we should have landed a research team, made sure there wasn't some ancient ruins filled with high-tech goodies. As likely as that sounds, he said, arching an eyebrow, we don't have either the time or the personnel for an archaeological dig. Not to mention that the natives might have thought we were demons from the sky and thrown spears at us. And I really didn't want to have to kill a bunch of primitive bird people. This is in 19th century England, and I don't want to have to start acting like I'm Sir Francis Drake. He was 16th century. I just had to tell him. The curse of a history degree. Whatever. We're heading on. But this does bring up something I wanted to go over with you. We left in a bit of a rush, and honestly... I wasn't sure this subject would come up, but we need to go over the protocols for first contact with a technologically inferior race. We have protocols for that? I cocked my head and looked at him sidelong. Seriously? What? He spread his hands. You think the government doesn't have the imagination to figure it might happen and come up with a plan? Well, no, I admitted. It suggests a level of competence I have yet to encounter in any government operation. Present company excluded, of course. Sometimes, Anu interjected, I feel as if my translator is malfunctioning. Oh, don't worry, Julie assured him. Junpa said the same thing on more than one occasion. You get used to it. As you say. The Alliance, of course, had official policies in place for dealing with less advanced cultures. 
but those were necessarily modified when your planet was brought into our ranks. Now we are in a flux, and I do not believe anyone has come up with a replacement plan. Well, we have, Oliveira declared. He rose from his chair and paced across the compartment. He was, I believed, more grateful than any of us for the Hilta gift of artificial gravity, because without it, dramatic pacing would have been impossible. And there's nothing general officers like better than dramatic pacing. And if they're not exactly fair, they do allow a certain flexibility. Flexible and unfair, I repeated, leaning my chin on my fist. You have my undivided attention. If we encounter any culture with spaceflight, we have orders to contact them immediately and try to at least establish peaceful communications. He shrugged. I suppose that's on the theory that we need all the friends we can get, and anyone who's far enough along to build rockets should be kept at our side before the Tavinians can get their hands on them. Sounds reasonable so far, Julia allowed, using that tone she usually reserved for me when I was trying to explain something really stupid that I'd done and make it sound intelligent. Any culture that has nuclear weapons and or nuclear energy, but not space flight, Oliveira went on, the decision of whether or not to establish first contact is commander's discretion. You get to decide, I interpreted. I'd tried not to make it sound like an accusation, but he smirked at me anyway. After consulting with my trusted officers and scientific staff, he amended, there are several factors to consider, including how stable their political situation is and whether first contact would improve it or just make it worse. Basically, we don't want to be responsible for starting anyone else's nuclear war. Also reasonable, Julie said. She spread her hands. When do we get to the unfair part? Getting there, he assured her. If we encounter any culture that is the equivalent of the Bronze Age or below, we're supposed to steer clear. Nothing but drone overflights. No landing parties, nothing else. A few drone flights might make some fanciful stories around the campfire, but landing a shuttle could start a new religion, and we don't want to be responsible for that. I don't know, I said, shrugging. I seem to recall another science fiction writer who did pretty well for himself starting a religion. Please, Julie said, making a quelling motion. We don't want to get sued. However, Oliveira continued, ignoring our little interplay. If the culture is into the Iron Age and has any large, politically stable government, we're clear to contact them if and only if they're humans. It had taken me months and months to become familiar enough with Helta body language and facial expressions to read them reliably, and I was nowhere close to that with the script. So I couldn't have said for certain that Anu Nim Klaas was pissed off. But his face did remind me of the one my old German shepherd had made when I took him to the vet. And what, he asked, is the purpose of this a restriction? Again, it's the Tavinians, Oliveira explained. Their only interest in non-human races is what they can take from them, and they'd likely ignore a technologically backward alien culture. But other humans... He shook his head. They'd consider them allies, perhaps. Or if not, then at least cannon fodder to be drafted into their armies. We have to make some effort to prevent this. In case the Tavinians have also detected this signal and head down this way at some point. I suppose I understand this, Anu said, and we were as free to believe that as we chose. Anu was my friend, but that didn't necessarily mean he liked humans all that much. I got one more question, Evans said, and I moaned somewhere deep inside my chest. Yes, Colonel, Oliveira said, hands clasped behind his back. Well, we set out on this mission to investigate the signal the Helta detected. So far, so good. At Oliveira's nod, he went on. I got the same briefing the rest of you did from the Secretaries of Defense and State, so I understand the idea behind checking out each system, to check for any indication of the Elders, having left bases or ships or anything behind. I get that. But why are we thinking about contacting anyone we happen to find along the way? I mean... We got some incredible combat officers, some hard-ass door kickers, and Dr. Haskett. But we didn't bring any diplomats, right? How the hell are any of us qualified to do that? That was... 
Actually, a damn good question, and one I hadn't thought to ask before we left. Yeah, I echoed, squinting aside at Oliveira. Why didn't we bring a diplomatic crew? It was considered, he said, and my author ears pricked up at the passive voice. It was a sin as a writer, and it was a telltale sign as a marine or a soldier. Whenever a senior officer used the passive voice when referring to a decision that had been made, it was because they were reluctant to condemn whatever superior had made it. In this case, that meant the Joint Chiefs, the Cabinet, or President Crenshaw. But it was decided, he went on with all of his passive voice iniquity, that having a diplomatic crew trained in dealing with terrestrial governments might be more of a hindrance than a help. That's actually why Anonim Klaas is along. I was under the impression, the Skrith cut in, that I was along, because this is an alliance mission, and I am a representative of the alliance government. That too, Oliveira assured him. But you have experience dealing with other races at varying levels of technology. It was thought you'd have more insight than anyone from the State Department. It was thought. It was thought by who? I'd have been willing to lay odds it was thought by the president himself, after one of his famous blow-ups with the Secretary of State. The president was, I believed, a good man, and had done a good job dealing with the whole alien war thing. But he'd done it using a lot more muscle flexing than diplomacy. Some people resented that, and a lot of them were in the State Department. Me? I was more interested in results than process, and we now lived in a world with FTL travel and fusion reactors. A world where China and Russia and the OPEC nations were toothless dogs. Where, in a few years, there wouldn't be anything resembling poverty, famine, or plague. Where people could live for centuries. If the cultural relativists were pissed about how we got there, they could kiss my pale, hairy ass. Getting back to the avian humanoids, Dr. Haskett said, with the sort of dogged determination usually shown only by career NCOs. I think there's more significance here than just showing us we're on the right track. Please, go on, Doctor, Oliveira invited, taking a pause from his dramatic Space Force General pose to sit on the edge of the table, something he never let anyone else get away with. Okay, he never let me get away with it. It's the whole avian thing, she said, standing to jab a finger at the projection of the closest shot we had of one of the bird people. You're going to have to take my word for it, unless you want me to deliver a doctoral dissertation here, but avians would be so much tougher to adapt into a humanoid form than the other species we've seen, even the Chamblisi. I have to think there was a reason the elders attempted it. And what do you think that might be? I asked, leaning toward her. I have no idea, she said, laughing like this was the coolest thing ever. I found myself liking Dr. Haskett. She had that little kid air, like she was just really jazzed to be here, and I knew exactly how that felt. But it's got to be important. Either they were trying to achieve something, something they hadn't yet reached with the rest of the races they uplifted. You did not just say uplifted, did you? I interrupted, smiling so wide it hurt. Tell me you did it on purpose. Of course, she returned my grin. I mean, I know things have been rough. She tried to force herself to be grim, though she didn't quite bring it off. I know you all have lost friends and colleagues and things were very volatile back on Earth for a while, but this has all been the greatest thing that ever happened in the history of history. It's not just that we're living in a science fiction world, Major Clanton, it's that we're living in all the best science fiction worlds. Have you read my stuff? I asked, ever hopeful. No she admitted, wincing in what I thought was guilt. But I watched the TV show. God damn it, it never fails. And again, Anu said, rubbing a hand across his chin in a gesture I had learned meant consternation. I feel as if my translation software has become corrupted. You didn't finish, Doctor, Oliveira reminded her, glaring me to silence. You said either they hadn't achieved what they wished to accomplish, Or, oh, yes, well, I'm sure you've read the speculation on late history involvement by the elders in the technological development of Earth and the Helter. I sniffed. I had. 
I had also come up with the idea first and made the mistake of mentioning it to one of the intelligence analysts after the battle for Earth, then watched my idea become fodder for every talk show and internet video for weeks afterward with not a bit of credit thrown my way. I wasn't sure about them interfering with Earth history, but I was certain that they'd given the Helta the hyperdrive. Even the Helta aren't entirely clear on when the thing was invented or how. Well, she went on, the fact that these avians were still in such a primitive state says to me that the elders never came back to help them along, give them a technological boost like they did the other races they were involved with. Either they hadn't achieved what they were trying for, or else this was some new experiment, something they didn't have time to finish. And if they didn't have time to finish, Julie mused, then that might mean they couldn't come back to it. You believe some ill fate befell them? Anu said, and I frowned at the turn of phrase, or at least how the translator had chosen to render it. The software was usually less melodramatic than that, so I suppose the original Scrith phrase must have been equally dramatic. They left for a reason, I pointed out. Maybe it was because they thought whatever experiment they were carrying out with us and the Tavinians and the races of the Alliance had run its course. Or maybe it was because something scared them away. Either possibility is worth looking into while we're out here. You've obviously got something in mind, Oliveira deduced. After hanging out with me for so long, he could tell. And one of the things I liked about him was that he appreciated my wild speculation. Spit it out. The elders were like gods. I mean, they were definitely like gods to the Divinians, and they're just about gods compared to us. They could terraform planets like we throw up an apartment complex. They engineered intelligent species from animals. So if something did manage to chase them out of this section of the galaxy, I shook my head. It would have to be pretty damned formidable. And what? he asked. You think there's a chance we could run into them, since we're heading for where the elders are? For all we know, we're not going to where they are, I pointed out. We're going to the last place they were. Julie looked skeptical, and I raised a hand to forestall any doubts. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying we should be careful. That's why we brought you along, he said. I usually liked Michael Oliveira well enough, and I certainly respected the hell out of him. But at the moment, I felt like smacking that self-satisfied smile off his face. I'm going to be honest. I had a fairly high opinion of myself and a higher one of the Delta team, but if there was something out there that could chew up the elders, well, we wouldn't even be a speed bump. Chapter 3 Okay, Dr. Haskett said, rubbing her hands together like she was about to attempt to deadlift twice her weight. We've had avians, cetaceans, and some sort of unidentified ungulate. Anyone want to place bets on what this one will be? I'd be happy if any of them had even had metalworking, Oliveira griped, still seated in his command chair, fingertips thumping a tuneless rhythm on the armrest. So far, we haven't seen anything as sophisticated as the snails on those dugout canoes the bird people had. You guys sold us on this as adventure, excitement. Julie told him, fingers still dancing on the haptic holograms of the controls, as she prepared the ship to exit hyperspace. I mean, I'm as jazzed to see whale people and deer people and whatever as the next guy, but we're veering dangerously close to boredom, or at least as close as you can get to it on a starship traveling to the edges of known space. The hours of boredom I can handle, I said, leaning against the railing behind Oliveira's station, my usual kibitzing spot. It's the minutes of sheer terror that get to me. After the second dry hole, we decided to rotate the ground forces, standing two in the shuttles for every drop. Because we could be gone for months, and expecting the same troops to sit for hours in the shuttle every time was too much to ask. This was my turn out of the suit, and I was spending it on the bridge because that was where the action was. Pops and the rest of the team were performing PMCs on the suits and the weapons even though we'd done it four times in a month and hadn't used them once because that was how Delta rolled. I would do my own suit later because I had to be more conscientious than everyone else in order to lead them, which I'd known since I was a Marine platoon leader, but it took on a whole new meaning when the team I was leading was the best of the best. What? Julie asked, shooting me a half-second glance. 
You think we're going to find the boogeyman out here? Ten seconds, she added, so nonchalant about transitioning in and out of another dimension now. A long pause. Jumping. Julie hadn't been very exacting about using the correct technical terms since we'd come back from our abbreviated honeymoon for this mission, or exacting about anything other than doing her job well, from which she'd never slack off. She seemed to be a lot more laid back about the sort of spittin' polished discipline the Space Force was trying to instill, as it lurched inevitably towards the Space Navy it should have been from the beginning. And only Vera seemed content to let her, probably because he was trying to convince her to stay in and transition into captaining her own ship. It was a lost cause. I knew my wife, and she was a fighter pilot at heart. She didn't even care too much for piloting something as large as a cruiser. But the fact that the first starship pilot ever had been a female and a naval aviator tickled her enough to stay in the job. If there was one thing she had no desire to do, it was command other people and send them to their deaths. She'd seen what it had done to me. The planet hung a hundred thousand miles or so off our port side, not too incredibly different from any other we'd seen, though this one had fewer and larger continents than the last batch. It wasn't quite Pangea, but maybe Gondwanaland, a huge continent surrounded by smaller ones, and Gondwanaland had some huge sweeping plains that must have stretched for two or three thousand miles in every direction. Comes. Oliveira asked, his tone dolorous, as if he already knew what to expect. Not a peep, sir, Shaw said, his accent weighing heavy on the words. Not so much as a Doctor Who rerun. Oliveira spared him a sidelong glance, clearly losing patience with all the pop culture aficionados in his crew. I'm getting something, sir, Graciano said, leaning into his display, as if he could get a better look at the hologram from a couple inches closer. The man reminded me of the service technician at the car dealership in Vegas, where I'd bought my last SUV, squinting at his computer screen, trying to read a part number. It's not much, not an energy signature, but I think I'm picking up a city. Hallelujah, Oliveira exclaimed, clapping his hands like a Baptist preacher. Any activity in orbit? No, sir. Nothing anywhere in sensor range. You want me to launch drones? Absolutely. Let's see what we're dealing with, Mr. Graciano. What we were dealing with, as it turned out, was humans. Holy shit, I breathed, eyes glued to the drone footage playing out on the main screen, larger and closer than the latest superhero movie. It's King Arthur and the fucking round table. Okay, I was exaggerating. They weren't exactly medieval knights, and they certainly weren't the Romano-Celtic Britons were the closest thing to a real King Arthur in actual history. But the horsemen galloping out of the gates of the city were certainly within spitting distance of either. Chain mail, glittering in the afternoon glare of a star I was tempted to call the sun, though it was nothing but some vague designator in a Helta or Shamblisi database. And it wasn't just the warriors who were armored, but the horses as well, which spoke to a level of manufacturing that was at least on par with Imperial Rome. I couldn't make out the faces of the mounted soldiers, but bushy black beards were the order of the day, and even accounting for padding beneath their armor, these were some pretty big dudes. Spears, lances, really, stuck up from horses big enough to rival Clydesdales, coming up the center of the formation, while others on the flanks carried something smaller, something I couldn't quite make out. I don't know what they thought they were going to do against the drone, since it was four or five hundred feet up, but they tried their best anyway. Horse archers, Oliveira noted, like the Mongols. I nodded, impressed both with his knowledge and with the distance the horse archers got with their arrows. A hail of them rose like a cloud from the first rank of riders, arcing up a good three hundred feet before they gave up the ghost and tumbled back to the ground. They're sporty, I'll say that for them. They're human. Haskett stated the obvious, staring at the screen with undisguised fascination. Like the Tavinians, though maybe with a bit higher technology than those barbarians started out with. Iron Age, I'd say, but I'm no expert on archaeology or classical history. I studied it as a hobby in the academy, Oliveira said, surprising me. I thought the man ate shit and bled his job. He hadn't struck me as the sort to have a hobby unless it was something like shooting model rockets at other people's camera drones. 
They're more industrial about it than the Tavinians, but I don't see any real difference in abstract technology. I get what you're saying, though, Doctor. You think they might be from a different era later on. But I don't know. I think it might be something as simple as a different part of the world. There's only one way to find out, I said. Do you suggest, Anu said, speaking for the first time since the drones had launched, that you will go down and talk to these barbarians? He seemed horrified at the thought, and I understood why. To him, they were no better than the Tavinians, and probably just as dangerous, and I understood the sentiment. We're here to collect intelligence, I reminded the Skrith. We can only get so much sitting up in orbit flying drones. You want to go, Andy? Oliveira asked, cocking an eyebrow my way, as if he had his own doubts about it. Me and the team, I confirmed, and someone who knows how to talk to these people. The translation programs should work fine, if they speak any Earth language in history. Oliveira said, shaking his head. Yeah, that'll get us a language, I acknowledged, but not a common frame of reference. If these guys are from an Iron Age civilization, we might have no common perspectives. I need someone who knows something about their way of life. Unless we have a staff historian who I wasn't aware of, Oliveira said. That would have to be me. What? Julie blurted, eyes going wide. I mean, sir, you can't be serious. You're not going to go all Captain Kirk on us, are you? You sure you don't want to take the XO and the ship's surgeon along just in case? I could have tried not to laugh, but I didn't. I love you, I told Julie. And I love you too, Colonel Nieves. Sorry, Colonel Clanton, Oliveira said, eyeing her balefully. But I'm still your commanding officer, and it's my call. If your husband and a team of Delta operators in high-tech powered armor can't keep me safe from Iron Age warriors on horseback, then we were hosed anyway. Colonel, you have the ship. She made a face that showed what she thought of that, too, but she remembered their respective ranks and nodded. I have the con, sir. I grinned at that, but didn't laugh, because General Oliveira was already scowling, as determined to keep the Space Force rooted in the Air Force, as Julie and I were to turn it into the Space Navy. I shall accompany you. Anu Neem Klaas said, standing from his assigned acceleration couch and offering a bow of his head in respect to Oliveira's leadership. If you don't mind, I have some experience attempting to negotiate with the Tavinians prior to the war. It may be of use. Major Lee, Oliveira said, touching a control on his data link, the cell phone looking thing we all carried that was tied into the ship's communications system and could also bounce a signal off a drone or satellite at need. Prep us a shuttle. We're going down. We landed about a half mile outside the walls of the city, in what I took to be the edge of someone's farm. I frowned at crushed rows of what might have been wheat, flattened under the bulk of the hammerhead shuttle, and hoped they wouldn't hold it against us. We're close to the road here. Pop said, sounding worried as he deployed the team into a defensive perimeter. I wouldn't have called it a road, more of a dirt track, but I took his meaning. I know, but we're here to make contact, and the road leads to the city. At least we ain't got to worry about air attack. He tipped back his visor and took a whiff, or air pollution for that matter, though it does smell like cow shit. I cracked my own visor and agreed. Fertilizer for the crops, I suppose. Movement teased at my far vision and I sealed my helmet again and zoomed in using the built-in optics. It was a horse, maybe three-quarters of a mile away, pulling some sort of cart with two men walking behind it. They're out there doing something, I told him. What? I had no idea. The only thing I'd ever grown was a cactus my ex-wife had given me as a gift for the office. Still farming, even with the gods falling out of the sky. If they don't farm, people starve, Pops reasoned. He paused, nodding back to where Oliveira was speaking with Anu. They were both wearing light body armor and carrying sidearms. I hadn't been able to talk either of them into a helmet, though. Still don't like having the general along. I don't either, I admitted. But I think he's been getting stir-crazy cooped up on the ship for the last month. I have, too. I would have been willing to surf with the bird people to get some fresh air. I mean, clomping around in the Svalin armor wasn't quite the same thing as walking barefoot in the sand with Julie, but at least down here, I could feel the wind and smell something besides recycled air conditioning. 
even if what I was smelling was cow shit. I scanned the team, all of them down on a knee, their M900 KE rifles at their shoulders. They would have been in the prone, except for the damned wheat, which would be shit for cover, but was great concealment. How are the new guys doing? I had my own opinions, but Pops had been Delta for nearly 20 years, and his judgments were undoubtedly better informed. Of our original team, the one we'd started off with on our first trip from Earth, we only had Dog, Ringo, and Jumper left. Scooter was a later addition, and Quinn had been with the Rangers, but Nunez, Yao, Avery, Gregson, Shannon, and Vincent were all brand new, green enough that they didn't have nicknames yet. Not all of the missing were dead, of course. Too many were, but a few others had been pulled away to start their own teams. Reaction force teams, that is. They'd be rotated in and out from now on, now that everything was organized and formalized, and I didn't know if I wanted to be a part of that. Pops shrugged. They're okay. I mean, they're CAG, so they're already better than okay, but this ain't CAG, you know? This is next-level shit above the next-level shit. You don't just train for this and think you're good to go. You gotta experience it. You've never spent one day in selection, but I'd take you as a troop over any of them just yet. Even Quinn? I asked, smiling thinly. Well, maybe not Quinn, he admitted. The kid's got what it takes. But you got the edge on him in life experience, and that counts too. And since being young ain't got no benefit over being old nowadays, it counts a lot. I nodded. With the rejuvenation treatment, the benefits of experience weren't offset by the downsides of deteriorating knees and hips and shoulders and ankles anymore. I mean, doing grunt work still hurt, but you healed afterward instead of developing lifelong debilitating injuries. It almost didn't seem fair. It's going to be harder to recruit soldiers and marines pretty soon, I mused. Once people really start understanding they can live two or three hundred years, no one's going to want to chance getting killed young. Oh, they'll figure something out, he said, sounding distracted. He was staring out at the distance, at the city. They're coming, sir. I snapped around, honing in on the gates. They'd been thrown open, and horsemen were pouring out. Clouds of dust rising as they galloped down the road toward us. General Oliveira, I said. The locals are on their way. Would you and Anunim Klaas please step up into the shuttle with the others until we establish peaceful communications? Those archers of theirs look pretty impressive, and it wouldn't take much for one of them to put an arrow through your eye. Since you wouldn't listen to me and wear a fucking helmet? Of course, he said, though there was a disgruntled tone beneath the words. One of the things I'd forced him to accept before I agreed to this was that he acknowledged I was in full control of the ground unit, which included telling him what to do and what not to do if I thought it impacted security. Pops, I said, once I'd stared Oliveira and Anu back up the ramp. Make sure the team has their rifles set for max rate of fire and incendiary. And while he gave those orders, I checked my own weapon. Not because I hadn't thought of it before, but simply because it never hurt to check again. One of the advantages of a weapon that used electromagnets to accelerate the projectile was that you could vary the muzzle velocity with just an adjustment of the power. The M900 could fire one slug every couple seconds at the max velocity and put a tungsten penetrator right through a tank, or it could fire a stream of them at a rate of 200 rounds per minute at a more reasonable muzzle velocity. And as an added benefit, if you loaded up special incendiary rounds made of sintered metal, an energy pulse at the emitter would turn the whole slug into a plasma. Not much use against modern armor, but it would probably kick the shit out of chainmail. I took a closer look at the city while I had the chance. It was, I knew from the flight in, built at the confluence of three rivers, though we couldn't see any of them from this angle. It was on a hill over the rivers, though part of the rear wall blistered out to the edge of one of the banks so they could have a secure water source. If they'd had the tech for it, they could have run water wheels for industry, but we'd seen no sign of that from the drone overflights. No windmills either which seemed like a waste out here on the vast flat plains where the wind was ever present. Why not? Probably a lack of population pressure. When you have enough people to do the menial jobs and you can feed them all, no one even thinks about how to do things more efficiently. The Industrial Revolution wouldn't have happened on Earth without the Black Plague. 
In retrospect, it was a fair trade, though I doubt anyone living at the time would have thought so. These guys, though, they didn't have a China for plagues to come out of, or any other huge population. This city was the largest one on the planet, though not the only one. There was another only ten miles away downriver, and we'd considered approaching that one instead. There was obviously some sort of military rivalry between them, or they wouldn't have all these mounted troops ready to run out at a minute's notice. And we'd all been worried about coming down on the wrong side of that. But there'd be no way of knowing until we talked to one side or the other. No one fires unless I give the order, I reminded the team. Even if they attack first, wait for my word. What if one of them hits you with a golden BB? Pops asked, and I wasn't certain if he was joking. A golden BB was more a flyboy term, a lucky shot from small arms on the ground taking out a helicopter or fighter jet. But I suppose it could apply to medieval weapons against Svalin armor, and it wasn't impossible. The Svalin had to have weak points because the knees and elbows and shoulders and hips and neck had to move. An arrow in just the right spot might have penetrated. If they kill me with an arrow, I assured him, you feel free to massacre the whole bunch of them. Figured you'd feel that way, sir. The cloud of dust was getting closer, a storm rising, with the thud of the horse's hooves as the thunder, and I was beginning to get nervous. It was one thing to know on an intellectual level that my armor could stand up to their weapons, that our guns could cut down every single one of them. It was another to face down fifty armored men on horseback charging straight at you. I thought for a moment they might gallop right into us, might force us to shoot them, but they pulled up almost at the last second, coming to a halt. Dust rose ahead of them, thick as a smoke grenade, choking off even infrared and thermal, and I brought my rifle to my shoulder, wondering what would come out of the cloud. A single horse walked through, led by a man in armor. His chainmail was gold-chased, his cloak a royal purple and his helmet was decorated with eagle feathers. The face beneath the rim of the helm was long and slender, not exactly Asiatic, not exactly European, typical of the Balkans or elsewhere in Eastern Europe. His beard was black and hung down over his chest, though it couldn't disguise his strong chin. But the man's most prepossessing feature was his eyes, smoldering cauldrons of black. They were the eyes of the head motherfucker in charge, there was no doubt about it. He didn't have a lance or a bow, but the sword at his hip was long and curved, a heavy saber by the looks of it, the hilt decorated with gold and long enough to wield hand and a half, as my old friends in the Society for Creative Anachronism might say. It was the sword of a notable warrior, perhaps even a king. Behind him, the rest of the horsemen had dismounted as well, and they were chanting something in a language I couldn't make out, something the translator hadn't heard enough of yet to understand. I stood there like an idiot, not sure of what I should do, all too aware that anything I said wouldn't be understood, but needing badly to do something. I pushed up my visor, and the man with the sword gasped, as if he hadn't known until that moment that I had a face. Hi, I said, holding out an open hand. I'm Andy Clanton. The bearded man fell to his knees, pressing his face to the ground, and the rest of his dismounted warriors did the same still chanting the unintelligible song. I stared at them in utter bemusement. Nice to meet you, too. Chapter 4 Holy shit, General Oliveira whispered, looking up from the screen of his data link. I still wanted to think of it as a phone, but it was pretty far beyond even the last-generation cell I'd left back in Nevada. You know what these guys are? Smelly as fuck, Pops ventured, making a face. It wasn't an unfair criticism. We'd spent most of the last four hours sitting in the great hall of what I took to be the Palace of the King, or whatever passed for a king among these guys, trying to find someone in the whole damn place we could talk to. We started with the king, then made our way through civilian and military types, until we finally reached silk-robed, clean-shaven men I took for priests. And all the king's horses and all the king's men, well, the men anyway, and a few women, were still in the great hall, squeezed in like the crowd at a heavyweight fight in Vegas. And as Pops had noted, the collected B.O. was breathtaking. The food, at least, was good. 
though it could have used a few more spices. All they had here was something resembling horseradish and lots and lots of salt. Those guys, Oliver explained, indicating the priests, who were still jabbering away in something vaguely familiar, are speaking Greek. Ancient Greek, mind you, so even the translation circuit is taking some time to get a good read on it. How ancient? I asked, a bit too sharply, but he nodded, confirming my suspicions. Alexandrian. They're from the same time period as the Tavinians, but these guys are from much farther east. Iran, to be exact. Pops squinted at our hosts, though he was careful, I noted, not to give the one we thought was the king the stink eye. They don't look like any Iranians I ever met. That's because there's 1,600 years of intermarriage with Arabic people between the two of them. These guys are from Iran, back when Iran was settled by chariot riders from the steppes of the Caucasus Mountains. You mean like the Sumerians? I asked. Visions of Conan dancing through my head like sugar plums on Christmas. Okay, I knew the Sumerians who came from the Russian steppes weren't the same ones that Robert E. Howard meant when he wrote about Conan, but when I discovered as a child that there was an actual tribe called Sumerians back in the early Iron Age, that had been one of the coolest moments of my young life. Oliveira cocked an eyebrow at me. No, more like the Scythians, but not exactly those either. Have you ever heard of the Samaritans? You mean like in that shitty King Arthur movie? Yes, exactly like that shitty King Arthur movie, but about 800 years earlier. But they look like their technology has advanced to the level of the Romans. He shrugged. Which isn't really saying much for 2,600 years. No reason to look for high technology when you have everything you need, Anu reasoned. The king and the priests glanced sharply at him when he spoke. They seemed to almost revere us, but I thought they were suspicious of Anu Nim Klaas. Not like they thought he was a monster, but like they considered him somehow lesser than us, if not themselves. We would not have attempted anything more than they have, if not for the Helta. I think, Oliveira said, checking the screen of his data link again, that we're ready. I downed the last bite of the flatbread sandwich from the wooden plate on the table, then wiped the crumbs from my chin and pulled down my faceplate. Let's do it, then. Go for it. You'll be speaking the Greek the priests were talking, so they'll have to translate it to the others until the system can get enough of their syntax to manage Sarmatian. Let's hope there's such a thing as an honest priest, then. I shrugged. I touched a control on the back of my left arm, and my data link synced with the external speakers on my helmet. I turned to the oldest of the four priests, assuming he'd be the one in charge. Hi, my name is Andy Clanton. I'm from Earth, the world your people came from originally, from a place known as America. Can you understand what I'm saying? The helmet speakers repeated what I'd said in as close as the translator could get to ancient Greek using a digital simulation of my voice, which was indescribably odd. The priest's eyes went wide with shock, as if they'd given up on us being able to speak with them. Exalted one, the older, shaven-headed priest said, and a second later the voice spoke again in English in my ear. I am the chief priest Karastos, servant of God and of King Azarion, rightful lord of the Rosolani tribe. This is his city, Avestan, the wonder of the world. There was an exchange between Azarion and the priest that went on for at least a minute, and I didn't understand a word of it, because it was all in Sarmatian, which my translator couldn't parse just yet. I didn't want to stare at them, so I looked around us again, partly to check security and partly just because it was so fucking surreal sitting here in an Iron Age great hall while I was wearing powered armor and carrying a K.E. rifle. I'd read about Great Halls, of course, seen reproductions of them even in museums. This was different. The fire in the hearth lent a smoky, sweaty air to the room, though it couldn't totally banish the spring chill in the air. Tapestries lined the stone walls, brightly colored and decorated with animal designs, lions, bears, wolves, and elk. I guess I knew which species lived on this continent, though the lions surprised me. Then again, I think I'd read somewhere that there'd been lions in Europe back before the Romans conquered the continent, and there'd probably been a population in Iran as well. The king had kept his armor on, and still wore his sword as well, 
as had this small group I judged were his personal guard, and I wasn't sure if this was supposed to be some sort of honor toward us or a threat. They couldn't do much with a sword against me or Pops, but the rest of the team was outside in the courtyard, and I was worried about Oliveira and Anu. More Oliveira. Anu could take care of himself, but Oliveira was a former Air Force fighter jock turned starship commander, with no ground combat experience whatsoever. At least they kept the place clean. It wouldn't have been a shock to see mold on the stone walls or built-up soot from the hearth fire, but it was scrubbed clean even up to the ceiling, which showed an admirable attention to detail. That could just mean they were serious about cleanliness, or that the king was a psycho dictator who was about to order us all beheaded. The king, Karastos told me, wishes to know if you are indeed the elders returned, as the prophecies foretell. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oliveira murmured in an audible echo, hopefully not loud enough for the translator to pick up. I wanted to ask him what to say, what to do, that anything I said would be translated, and if I hesitated too long, they'd think I was lying. Instincts born of dealing with battalion commanders, politicians, and literary agents screamed at me to stall. What do the Rojolani know of the elders? I wanted to pat myself on the back because it was a sufficiently mysterious response that it might work, even if Oliveira told me he did want to say we were the elders. Do not all the tribes of the world know of the elders? Karastos answered a question that answered a question with a question. He was definitely a priest, because just the thought made my head swim. The elders gave us this world. Gave us a land without bounds, without the powerful kingdoms of Alexander and the Persians to pen us in and threaten our borders. They gave us endless fields to raise our crops, and herds of horses and orcs and bison to keep us mounted and fed. We owe our existence to the elders, the very angels of God. God. Interesting. I couldn't remember much about the religion of the Sarmatians, but I was fairly sure they weren't monotheistic. It had been over 2,000 years, though, and religions changed. I wondered what else had. Should we say yes? Oliveira asked me. I suppressed a sigh. I'd wanted him to give me the right answer. I clicked off my translator. If someone asks you if you're a god, Ray, I quoted, you say yes. Too many questions we wouldn't be able to answer he decided, ignoring the timeless wisdom of Winston Zettimore. Tell them the truth. Shit. I switched the translator back on. We are not the elders, honored Karastos, I admitted. We are the descendants of the men of the world you left. While here, you have had one tribe and no empires to fight. Back home, many empires have risen and fallen and the constant competition and war have forced us to create new arts and new ways of doing things. I padded the armor over my chest. This armor is much thicker and heavier than the chainmail you wear, but through the devices we've crafted, it has the magic of giving me the strength to bear it. I gestured with my rifle. And our weapons can strike down our enemies from hundreds of yards, like an arrow that always strikes true. We can fly as the birds of the sky, and from world to world as well. We have not mastered the arts of the elders, of course, but we are walking their path and seeking their wisdom, which is why we are here. We're retracing the steps of the elders, seeing and appreciating their works. I extended a hand toward Anu. This is my friend, Anu Nim Klaas, of a people called the Skrith, You can see he is not of us, not of the race of men, yet he is a child of the elders. The elders took his people from earth as they did yours, and gave them their own home on a far-off world. And the Skrith are not the only ones. There are many other different breeds of men out there, all of them planted by the elders like seeds in a garden. And we hope to become friends with all of them, as a way to honor the elders. I sucked in a breath, feeling worn and spun out from the speech.
I did better on a keyboard than I did off the cuff. I probably talked more in the last year than I had the ten previous. Oliveira gave me a discreet nod of approval. Not bad, sir, Pops told me, his voice concealed and contained inside his visor. Maybe. The priest was deep into conversation with the king, and the translation software was beginning to get the hang of their version of Sarmatian. It was throwing words and phrases at me between pauses in their exchange. Like unto the angels of God, not the elders. How can we trust their word? Yet they are still greater in their powers than us. If they are not of God, might they be of the devil? Oh, damn. That was something I'd been trying to avoid, being associated with their version of Satan, because that was the danger of a monotheistic religion. If you weren't on God's side, you were on the devil's, and the magic we were displaying could easily be called witchcraft. They were talking faster and softer, and the translator lost the thread completely. I wanted to switch it off and warn Oliveira to get his back against the wall and his gun in his hand. Wanted to tell Pops to bring the rest of the team inside, but I couldn't take the chance I'd miss something crucial. Finally, the priest turned to me, and if it was hard to read a Skrith's facial expression, reading this guy's face was even harder. King Azarion extends the hand of friendship to you and your... He frowned, and the pause was extended because I had to wait for the translation. Alliance, I supplied. Your alliance. You shall be treated as honored guests and allies. I didn't sigh with relief because God only knew whether they were being genuine or not. But I did paste a fake smile on my face. Azarion extended his hand, and I shifted my rifle from right to left then pulled off my glove and offered my own. I didn't know how his people shook hands, so I just waited until he grabbed my wrist and then gripped his in return. He was still gripping it as he spoke to the priest, who then relayed it to me in Alexandrian Greek. The king would also like to invite your best rider to participate in the celebratory races. Races? I repeated, the fake smile frozen on my face. Of course. Karastos enthused. The Rojalani have the finest horses in all the world. It is thus that we have resisted conquest by the other tribes for a hundred generations. We would be honored if you had joined in our tradition. I cut my translator and flipped up my visor, looking back at Oliveira with desperation gnawing at my gut. Do we have anyone who can ride a fucking horse? I can't believe I let you talk me into this, Pops said, then leaned over to pat the neck of the stallion when it started at his sharp tone stamping in place. The horse was big, long-legged and lean, but taller than racing horses I'd seen anywhere back home, beautiful and wild, its mane tossing back and forth as it snorted its impatience. It was the other horses that were bugging him. He was an intact male, and he wasn't happy about all the other intact males gathered at the head of the track. The track was dirt, raked and stamped and flattened, much better maintained than the road into the city. It was outside the walls, off to the east of the city, and just south of the river, scraped into the surface of a grassy plain miles across. Hey, I reminded him, patting the horse on its flank. You were the one bragging about learning to ride horses with the tribesmen and the Hindu Kush. I never would have told you that story if I actually thought you were listening. Shouldn't you be wearing a helmet? Quinn asked him. The rest of the team was out at the periphery of the racetrack, but Pops obviously couldn't wear his Svalin armor on horseback, and I'd opted to take mine off as well as a sign of trust for the Rojalani. So Quinn had come along as our bodyguard, and apparently Nanny. You see any of those other motherfuckers wearing helmets, Quinn? Pops snapped at him, nodding over at the other riders. They're also wearing silk pantaloons, Quinn told him, which was a fair observation. Silk pantaloons, weird pointed hats, pointed shoes, and the ubiquitous bushy black beards. These guys are too pretty to be soldiers, I judged. Probably professionals at this. I grinned up at Pops. Try not to embarrass us too badly, okay? Fuck you, sir he told me, and I thought the only reason he didn't shoot me a bird was that his fingers were tangled desperately in the reins. All riders, move to the starting lines, 
someone called. This time, my translator relayed it, even though it was in Sarmatian. It had taken two hours of a three-way conversation between Karastos, Azarion, and myself before the data link managed to get a grip on the Sarmatian language. Pops was wearing his earbud, and his data link was at his belt, so he heard it the same as I did and kicked his heels into the flanks of the horse. Oliveira and Anu were under the shade of a wooden grandstand, engaged in a lively conversation with the king and the chief priest, while Azarion's courtiers crowded in and tried to absorb importance by osmosis. Oliveira looked up at me as Quinn and I approached, and he waved for us to join them. Andy, Oliveira said, patting a spot on the wooden bench beside him. I raised an eyebrow, feeling like I was a teenager being summoned by my father to speak with one of his friends, but I sat. You need to hear what King Azarion has been telling me. Apparently, the Rojalani have some very detailed legends about the elders. The Reverend Karastos would have more of a memory of the histories than I, Azarion protested. The king was, I knew from short acquaintance, a noted warrior. But he also had the same overly handsome good looks of the horse riders, which I assumed meant they were all part of the royal family. I only know what I learned at his knee as a child. We know from our ancient texts, Karastos took up the thread of the conversation, that the elders brought us here almost a hundred generations ago. I nodded, impressed. Assuming a generation was approximately twenty-five years, that tracked pretty well with what we knew. There were two hundred of us, the Rojalani, as well as bands of the Aorsi and the Sirases, and we were told that this world belonged to us, that we should become its stewards, care for it, and not despoil it, since there was more land than anyone could ever want. Despoiling it has never been a temptation. He shrugged. There have been conflicts, of course, between tribes at the borders of our lands, between cities within our own tribe, over which would retain sovereignty and judgment rights for the Rojalani. But no one has put fields to the torch or slaughtered another's game simply to deny them the food. And of the elders themselves, I prompted. They told us nothing of themselves he admitted. We know not even their true appearance, for they only showed themselves to us as messengers, things built of metal, such as your armor. He gestured toward Quinn. Which is why we thought you to be the elders returned at first. But their messengers were not in the shape of a man, more as a chariot, though pulled by no horse. Robots. Quinn guessed, the comment made in the privacy of our team comms net. I wanted to press the question, but a trumpet sounded, and the horses were off, galloping down the track as if shot out of a cannon. It was easy to spot Pops among the other riders, since he was wearing his utility fatigues rather than colorful silk, and he was the only black man among them, honestly the only one who wasn't pasty white. The riders grouped up out of the gate, no one trying to force an early lead. The elders, Karastos went on, his voice distracted, his eyes focused on the race, did not tell us who or what they were, but they did tell us one thing, who they were not. Our ancestors wished to worship them as gods, for then we worshipped many gods, seven of them, and we were ready to make the elders our eighth. But they told us, through their messengers, that they were not gods, that there was but one god, and we should worship him in spirit and in truth. As a preacher's kid, my ears pricked up at the words, and I wondered if the translator had arranged them in that order because of the Bible verse, or if this was just a huge coincidence. That is how we came to worship the one true god, Karastos confided. We... The Rojolani were the first, but the other tribes soon followed as we thrived in his hands. The pack was spreading out, the leaders pulling away, a pale cloud of dust trailing the race by a few yards, marking the progress of the riders. They were too far away now to make out much, but Pops was somewhere near the middle of the thirty-some riders. 
Do you know if the Alliance worship the one true God as well, Andy Clanton? Karastos wondered, the subject apparently interesting enough to take his attention off the race. Oliveira gave me a pleading look and I rolled my eyes. Now whose turn was it to want to tell the locals what they wanted to hear? Some among us consider the elders as gods, I admitted, but we Americans do not. Nearly everyone in our land worships the one god. I was stretching the truth just a little and lumping Christians, Jews, and Muslims together, but it was a good time for feeling ecumenical. Karastos nodded in satisfaction, apparently pleased by the thought that people like us, who could travel between worlds, believed as he did. I hope that was enough for Oliveira, because if he wasn't going to let me tell them I was a god, then I wasn't going to lie for him now. The riders were coming down the home stretch, and Pops was giving it all he had, digging in his heels, slapping the end of the reins against the horse's side, trying to convince the animal that it wanted to win as badly as he did. He didn't win, but he did manage to finish in the top ten or so, which had been more than I'd expected. I suppose they'd given him a good mount so as not to disrespect us. Your warrior is a superior rider, Azarion told me. And he might have been honestly impressed or maybe just being polite. Thank you. I'll pass that on to him. Tell me something. Do your histories tell you anything about where the elders went after they left your ancestors here? I'm afraid not. Karastos answered for him. The elders are the angels of God. Who can know where the angels will go, except where God sends them? Yeah, I agreed, shooting a look at Oliveira. God only knows. The general finished it for me, and he ain't talking. Chapter 5 This is so... Weird, Julie murmured into my ear. What? I asked, her hair tickling my face, the chill of the ship's air conditioning drying the sweat on my skin. Being married, being able to share a compartment on the ship without having to worry about people gossiping? She laughed and pushed at my chest, then stretched like a cat, arching her back and doing all sorts of wonderful things to other parts of her body. Julie was my age, but she'd been an athlete before we'd received the Helta rejuvenation treatments, and had always been in good shape. Now that we were both closer to 25 than 45, physiologically speaking, we were reliving our glory days. Which, to be honest, I'd never lived in the first place. I'd gotten married young, and hadn't been much of a player before I'd met Allie. No, dumbass, she said, though honestly, it is weird being married again. And I never, in a million years, thought I'd marry someone in the service. I still don't think of myself as being in the service, I confessed. What I meant was, what we've been finding out here is weird. What? I said, feigning outrage. I give you the best sex of your life, and you're thinking about the mission? Aren't you? She asked, cocking an eyebrow my way. Okay, yeah, I admitted, settling back down, hands resting behind my head. And what do you mean you gave me the best sex of my life? I kind of thought we were both involved in that equation. Details. I dismissed it with a shrug. But how is it weird? What kind of sense does it make? We pass through light years of dead space. Nothing. No habitables at all. Barely any planets. Period. A huge dead zone compared to how close together the living worlds are closer to the Alliance. Then... We start coming across a bunch of new species, none of them any more advanced than the Stone Age. Experiments, it looked like to me, maybe even failed ones, one after another, and then BAM! Back on, what the hell did we call that planet again? The Rojolani just called it the world, but I think Oliveira started trying to make Sarmatia stick as a name. I personally don't see it. Planet names have to be something catchy, like maybe Grassland. There's a name that'll stick. Sometimes I forget you used to be a writer. She rubbed a hand over her eyes. What do you mean used to be? I fully intend to go back to being a writer. Someday. Someday? Like when you get tired of flying around the stars playing marine? Hey, it'll happen eventually. You and I will settle down on some other planet, in a house with a view of the mountains, and I'll sit all day on the back porch writing books about our adventures. That no one will ever read, she finished for me, laughing softly. Au contraire, madame. I think I'll still be a celebrity. And the folks sitting on their asses in the fusion-powered cities back home, 
eating processed soy and spirulina and hooked into their free entertainment systems and their free apartments will want to read about the men and women who actually accomplished something. I shrugged. Of course, they'll want to read it free, so I'll have to work out something with advertisers. Holy shit, you do have it all planned out, don't you? She stared at me, as if just realizing I was serious. Well, yeah, I admitted. Think about it. We're going to live a long time. Everyone is, basically. No one is going to want to do any one thing for two or three hundred years. We're doing something really cool right now, but do you want to be working the same job in ten years? Twenty? So what do you say we do this for a couple more years, or until it gets to not be fun anymore, then settle down and have a couple kids, raise them, and then once they're off to college or jobs or whatever, we totally change our lives and do something else? She shook her head, the smile on her face more bemused than amused. Then do it over again? And again? Something different next time. I spread my hands. Something we can't even imagine yet. Sooner or later, everyone's going to get clued into the idea. We might as well be the first. She sighed and smacked me lightly on the shoulder. Damn it, Clanton. You managed to get me stuck in conversation drift. I was in the middle of telling you what was weird. Okay, what's weird besides the medieval Iranians? We're supposed to be getting closer to the elders, right? That's the whole point of this mission, to follow that signal to the elders? Theoretically, I acknowledged. I mean, we didn't have any proof the signal was from the elders, just that it was older than anything else in the Alliance. Now, I guess we have some evidence with the transplanted populations they left behind. And that's my point, Jawhead. She flicked me gently in the forehead. We're following their trail. Either someplace they're running to, or someplace they were already from, right? Yeah, I allowed, still not getting it. And we're still running into transplanted life from Earth. Nowhere else. Just Earth. Earth's the only planet we know of that produced life without outside intervention, I pointed out. No, it isn't, she insisted. The elders, they came from somewhere. What about the life on their home planet? Why didn't they transplant some of that if they wanted to seed the galaxy with life? Isn't that what we would do if we were terraforming planets hither, thither, and yon? Take life from our home and put it somewhere else? Why didn't they do that? Particularly as far away from Alliance space as we've come. It's not like they would have been chance in cross-contamination. A frown dragged at my face, pressure on my temples from the heavy thoughts resting there. She was, I realized, dead right, and I was upset I hadn't thought of it myself. Not that Julie wasn't brilliant in her own right. I wouldn't have married her if she wasn't smarter than me. But I was the science fiction writer. I should have been considering the problem. Maybe. I said, slowly dragging the idea out of the recesses of my brain. Their home planet was, like, desolated. She frowned. Is that a word? It's a word. Trust me. I'm a writer. Maybe all the life on their world was wiped out, and they're all that's left of it. Maybe that's why they want to spread life now, because they saw how easy it was to get it all killed off. It sounds plausible, she admitted. Or maybe they uploaded themselves into robot bodies, like a computer hive mind. Maybe they're all cybernetic now, and they regret it and want to make up for past mistakes. Jesus, I said with a chuckle. Now you're sounding crazier than one of my books. She rolled over, slipping an arm around my waist, meeting my gaze with hers. Are you ever going to write any more science fiction? Or just your memoirs? Science fiction seems redundant nowadays, I said, a little wistful. It was bad enough pre-Helta, when things were advancing so fast. All the futuristic shit I could think of was already reality, except star travel and ray guns. Now, what the hell is science fiction? It's just contemporary adventure. People would still buy it. Dime novels about the Wild West sold like hotcakes when the Wild West still existed. You could be rich. She tickled my ribs and I squirmed away. We could be rich. I sighed remembering something I hadn't meant to put off this long. I hoped she wouldn't be angry. I don't want to tell you this because it didn't seem important at the time, but I kind of already am. She squinted at me in obvious confusion, so I went on. We were on our honeymoon and busy with other things, but I finally opened one of the emails from my agent, and apparently 
every single book I wrote hit the bestseller list right after the Battle for Earth, and three different studios have entered a bidding war for the movie rights to the United Stars. Her eyes went wide, and I laughed. Yeah, but here we are, in a compartment on a starship, no idea when we'll be home, and all that money is just numbers and an account I can't really use. Julie's mouth was half open, her eyes wide. When the thought finally penetrated, she laughed softly. So, you want to give that all up and go live with that dude, Azarion, and the space Iranians? Not there, particularly, though they seemed nice enough people. And speaking of weird things, I said, eager to guide the conversation away from my newfound bank balance, there's another one. The elders didn't give them fusion power and FTL drives the way I think they did with the Helta, but they did implant the idea of monotheism. Why the hell would they bother? More experiments? They going to come back and see what happened? I get the sense they did it as a... I struggled for the right term. Like, a kind of favor? Like, they thought it would help their society to advance somehow. Did it work? God knows. I hadn't meant the pun, but I chuckled at it anyway. The question isn't whether it worked. The question is, why did they think it would? Julie covered a yawn, then leaned over and switched off the light beside the rack. No, the question is, are we going to spend the next seven hours before we're back on duty talking about this, or are we going to get some sleep? I grinned and pulled her toward me, covering her mouth with mine. I'll take, I said, drawing away just an inch. What's behind door number three? God, you are old, she laughed. Not anymore, hon. Andy, Michael Oliveira said, his voice soft even through the headset inside my Svalin helmet. I have a confession to make. Sir? I asked, checking to make sure we were on a private channel. Beside me in the hammerhead shuttle, Colonel Evans glanced over curiously, probably wondering if I'd been talking to him. Yeah, right, as if I'd call him sir. He and his ranger-ready platoon shouldn't have been on deck at all. We'd arranged a schedule, and it was my turn to pull security for this jump. But he'd claimed that his rangers were bored, and they hadn't got to go downstairs at all on Sarmatia or Grassland or whatever we wound up calling the planet. I pulled down my visor to keep the conversation private. You know, I'm not even Catholic, sir, I reminded Oliveira, much less a priest. Get serious, Clanton, he snarled. I blinked. He seemed... Not just angry, which I had certainly inspired before, but grim. I didn't tell anyone else about this, but we have no idea what's going to happen on this mission, and if I don't make it, someone should have all the data. Okay. I tried to sound serious. It wasn't easy since I was having what was basically a cell phone conversation while crammed into the darkened cockpit of a shuttle, surrounded by bulky metal-powered armor and sweaty, stinky soldiers. Of course, I'm a Marine, and to me, all soldiers are stinky. What is it, sir? Before we left Sarmatia, I used the fabricator in the shuttle to print out a book, a series of books from the database on the Jambo. Metallurgy, healthcare, the basics of how to build steam engines, windmills, and water mills. And I left it with Azarion. Shit, I blurted, the breath going out of me like I'd been punched in the gut. Sir, that's, like, violating the Prime Directive or something, isn't it? Fortunately for us, he said, the acerbic edge to his tone, telling me he at least understood the reference. The United States Space Force is not encumbered with any regulations quite that asinine. At any rate, being able to forge steel, manufacture antibiotics, and run steam trains isn't going to give the Rojolani tribe faster than light travel or nuclear weapons. But it might make them grateful the next time we stop by, and it also might make them less likely to join up when the Tavinians come recruiting. I sighed, considering his words, then finally nodded. I guess you're right, sir. It's a tough call, though. We might have just set up the Rojolani to conquer the rest of the planet. You served in Venezuela, Andy. You know better than I do that we sometimes have to make do with allies who we wouldn't care for if given a choice. Yeah, there is that, I admitted. Though that was also why I got out of the military after Venezuela. Thanks for trusting me, sir. Well, a guy's got to save the Earth at least once before I trust him. 
It's a small but exclusive club. Jump in now. Julie's voice startled me. She must have given the ten-minute and one-minute warnings, but I hadn't heard them, absorbed by the conversation with Oliveira. I barely had time to clench my teeth and my stomach muscles before reality turned inside out, and alarm klaxons sounded. Sir, Graciano snapped. We have multiple contacts in planetary orbit. I was already clawing at my wrist computer, trying to tie into the link to the bridge, sure we'd finally stumbled onto something fatal. Calm down, son, Oliveira said, with the voice of a man who'd faced multiple Tavinian cruisers and the prospect of his own death before. Are we being targeted? Negative, sir, Graciano took a breath, and I could see him over the visual feed from the bridge. His face was red, sweat beating on his forehead. The contacts are slow moving. Give me a report on this system, Commander. Aye, sir. It's a G-class star. Um, eight planets, I think. Eight that we can make out from here. Here was just past the moon of the fourth planet from the primary star, which I thought was damned close for an initial jump, but I imagine the decision to stop coming in out-system and doing micro-jumps inward had been made at some point after the fifth Stone Age society we'd encountered. Serves us right for being lazy. It's your typical ice giants out at the edge, Graciano went on, sounding calmer now. Two of them, then two gas giants, a smaller terrestrial world, an asteroid belt, and three more terrestrials. The second one from the primary star is the habitable, lit up like a Christmas tree on thermal and EM. Its moon has thermal readings from some kind of large settlement, and I'm seeing satellites in orbit around the moon and the habitable. The contacts I picked up are... He squinted into the display, and I switched my attention to the window with the feed from the tactical station. All I saw was a red, oblong shape on the scope, but apparently it meant something to Graciano. Something akin to the old space shuttles, I think. Nothing with a range longer than high orbit. I think I see something that could be a lunar rocket in orbit around their moon. It might be some kind of transfer vehicle. I think I'm picking up the reflection from a couple space stations, too. He paused, and the focus of the sensor displays changed to the surface of the planet. The side facing us was shrouded by night, but that didn't mean it was dark. Cities shone bright in the magnified view, similar to scenes I'd seen from Earth orbit, both in pictures and in person. They weren't quite the size of Peking or New York, but they were respectable cities. I keyed my mic to link up to the bridge speakers. That's a serious goddamn population, I said. At least two or three billion, maybe? Maybe even more. I think you're right, Andy, Oliveira said, which is damned impressive. Less than half our population, and they already have a moon base. We would have had one, too, I pointed out, if we hadn't killed the Apollo program after bringing back a few rocks. It wasn't technology or money that kept us from having a moon base or space stations back in the 1970s. It was political will. And this has been a daily moment in space travel history, Julie commented dryly. Now, a word from our sponsors. We getting anything on comms, Shah? Oliveira asked. Lieutenant Rajiv Shah, Royal Air Force, was something of an enigma to me. We'd been on the same ship for weeks, and I'd barely spoken to him. He kept to himself, at least as far as any of the Delta or Rangers were concerned. And Julie hung out with me on her time off, so she wouldn't have any different perspective than I did. So I didn't know for sure that the blank expression on his face was shock, but I could make an educated guess. Lieutenant Shah, Oliveira repeated, a harder edge to his voice. I said, are we picking up anything on comms? Um, yes, sir. I'm picking up dozens of EM signals from the planet, from the moon, from the space stations... I think there's even a signal coming from the third terrestrial planet, even though it's not habitable. They either have a base there or some automated relay station. Excellent. Get to work on decoding their visual signals so we can see what species we're dealing with. And get the translation software working on the language so we can communicate with them. That won't be necessary, sir, Shaw told him, shaking his head. Oliveira blinked in obvious confusion. What the hell do you mean it won't be necessary, lieutenant? Shaw's look was easy to read this time. It was one of outright wonder. They're speaking English. Chapter 6 Well, it was English of a sort. 
Imagine reading the King James Bible with all the the, thou, and shalt left in, and mixing it with something akin to the deepest, bread-battered, grease-fried, Mississippi Southern accent you ever heard, and it'll give you some idea of what these people sounded like. Welcome, honored guests, to Croatom. The hand that the man offered me was thick and meaty, though not calloused from work. The man behind it was just as thick, as well as unencumbered by the depredations of a life spent at labor, soft and jowly in a way his bushy mustache and mutton chops couldn't hide despite their best efforts. His gray eyes were sunken in florid cheeks, shaded by the brim of his hat. Everyone here seemed to wear hats, men and women both, and the fashion seemed old-fashioned. The women's dresses were long and ornate, the men's suits like something I might have seen in a 1950s European art film, or a 2000s-era music video pretending it was set in a 1950s European art film. We'd landed at one of their spaceports, the one closest to the city I took to be their planetary capital, which I'd come to learn they called New Roanoke. Its towering spires rose above the launch gantries and runways of the spaceport, utterly alien to my eyes in ways the clothes weren't, totally unlike a modern city, even though it was assuredly modern. No art deco, no glass-fronted skyscrapers. Everything I could see was gray and black and could have been carved out of stone, though I knew it had to be mostly metal to climb that high. The architecture, however, was nowhere near as significant to me as the name, both of the city and the world. New Roanoke. Croatan. I knew exactly where and when these people had come from, and it scared the ever-living shit out of me. Oliveira hadn't been too thrilled about the implications either. 1590, Andy, he'd said to me back on the jambo. Not the 4th century BCE. Not the Alexandrian Empire. The year of our Lord, 1590. Roanoke, Virginia. The lost fucking colony. We'd been alone, just the two of us, Anu, Evans, and Julie, so we hadn't hesitated to let just a little of the disbelief and horror we'd all been feeling creep into his voice. Oliveira had paced back and forth across his office, a caged lion. You know what this means, right? he'd asked, meeting each of our eyes as he walked across the front of us. You're not stupid people. I shouldn't have to tell you what this means. Brady Evans had hesitantly raised his hand like a kid in elementary school asking to go to the restroom. I'm sorry, sir, but I don't know anything about Roanoke except that it's a town in Virginia. I answered, mostly because I hadn't been sure if Oliveira would blow a gasket. When John White was sent by the English Crown to check on the well-being of the Roanoke Colony in 1590, he found the city fortified, but totally abandoned. Not a single man, woman, or child was left. The only clue was the word Croaton carved into a tree. Most people thought it meant that the colonists had taken shelter with the nearby Croaton Indian tribe. Obviously, that's not what happened, Oliveira had snapped. He touched a control in his desk, and a video streamed across the screen built behind his chair. Images from the signals we'd intercepted. Some had to have been from fiction, since they'd involve men with stiff upper lips and immaculate clothes piloting spaceships and fighting aliens. But others had been from news or public interest shows. They were taken by the elders, brought hundreds of light years from Earth, and deposited here just 400 years ago, which means that the elders interfered with human civilization much more recently than we thought. Maybe, Julie had said, giving voice to all our fears. They never stopped. I do not understand why this troubles you, Anu had admitted. Any of the races of the Alliance would be overjoyed at the thought the elders might still be around to guide us with their wisdom. You'll have to excuse us. I told him. We've had the idea that our civilization has been chugging along all on its own without anyone else dipping a spoon in the soup. The thought that there's some unknown godlike alien race out there who might have been manipulating us from behind the scenes is disturbing. Welcome to my world, Andy Clanton. A fang had peeked out from the corner of Anu's mouth, and I chuckled. He was developing quite the human sense of humor. 
We've made contact, Julie had said, shrugging. The people on Croatan seem pretty peaceful, and they don't seem at all freaked out by the fact that they're being visited from another star system, much less their long-lost American cousins. They've invited us down. Are we going to take the invitation? We are, Oliveira had said. There's too much at stake not to. Clanton, you're going. Take your team with you, but I want you to be out of your suit and talking to these people. Me, sir? My voice had squeaked with the question. I am no sort of diplomat, sir. In fact, every time I attempt diplomacy, it seems to wind up in some kind of violence. Are you sure we shouldn't send someone else? Like who? There's no State Department negotiator along this time, and I'm hesitant to send Anonim Klaas until we have a firmer idea on their feelings toward non-humans. And as much as I'd like to go myself, I am the commander of this mission and this ship, and I can only justify exposing myself to risk so many times before its dereliction of duty. Besides which, the Delta team could have pretty much taken on an entire warband of the Rojolani. The tech on Croaton made it likelier that they'd have something that could take down a suit of Svalin armor. What about my rangers, sir? Evans had asked. He was, I'd thought, feeling butthurt that he hadn't got a chance to get his feet wet back on the Rojolani planet. I want two of your platoons loaded up into shuttles for immediate launch at all times. If anything goes wrong down there, you're going to be our reserve. I'm fairly certain we can handle anything they can throw at us up here. Down there, things might get a little dicey. They hadn't yet, but I felt absolutely naked without my armor. Thank you, sir. I said to the Croatan... Croatanin... Croatanian... Shit. I pulled my hand away just as soon as the tubby man let go, barely able to resist the urge to wipe it off on my pant leg. I'm Major Andrew Clanton, United States Marine Corps, a representative of the commander of the starship James Bowie, and I greet you in the name of the United States government and the alliance of which my nation is a part. Gregory Bellingham, the jowly man introduced himself, Lord Mayor of New Roanoke and a servant of His Majesty King Richard the Eighth. If you would accompany me, I have been tasked to escort you to a private meeting with the King and the Prime Minister. Jesus, this was so very fucking English. More English than I would have thought, but I suppose I shouldn't have been surprised. They were a homogenous society dropped onto an empty world. There would have been no outside influences to cause them to change their way of government in these last four centuries. And if there had been any attempt to calve off a new government from the old, they hadn't seen fit to include it in their entertainment transmissions. According to everything we'd seen, the whole planet was part of the kingdom, and they were all one big happy family. It would be my pleasure, I assured the man lying through my teeth. In fact, the whole idea of meeting with a king and a prime minister was scarier than fighting homicidal aliens. But it was my duty, and good fodder for those memoirs I kept telling Julie I'd write. My officers, Mr. Tremonti and Mr. Quinn, will be joining us. I waved at the two men, both dressed in utility fatigues, just as I was. The rest of the team was on board the shuttle and would stay there with the flight crew just in case we needed them. The two of them wore sidearms belted around their waist, which I hoped the Croatons would be okay with. Bellingham had his own honor guard, half a dozen of them, all men, all of them above six feet tall. The uniforms were a good deal less pragmatic than ours, more for dress and show, with lots of red and white, lots of medals around their necks, and tall, weird-looking hats. They carried some kind of selective fire assault rifle a design tantalizingly familiar but not identical to any I'd seen on Earth, like something dreamed up for a first-person shooter game. Their eyes were sharp and watchful for all their ceremonial grandeur, and I had the sense it would be a mistake to underestimate them. Of course, Bellingham acceded smoothly, waving an invitation towards a vehicle that looked like a cross between a limousine and a city bus. Right this way. If you'll pardon me saying, Lord Mayor, I told him as I slid into the bench seat at the rear of the vehicle, your people seem to be taking our presence with an admirable equanimity. Damn, I was already starting to talk like them. It was like walking onto one of the Shakespeare plays we put on in high school. When an alien starship showed up in our home system not that terribly long ago, I'm afraid it caused all sorts of trouble. Some people thought it was the end of the world. 
It very nearly was, of course, and still might be. The leather upholstery creaked and groaned and begged for mercy under Bellingham's ass. But he smiled, reveling in its agony. Well, that's what I imagined anyway. He was probably just being polite. Oh, to be sure, Major Clanton, there are indeed some who are flustered by your sudden appearance. But the heritage of the elders has always cast a long shadow here. We have known there would come a time when they would return. So we have been diligent in our search for them. I shared a look with Pops. The tilt of his head spoke volumes, as if he could read what I was thinking and confirming he thought it as well. Everyone out here knew about the elders and expected them to return. Is it not that way on your world, Major? Bellingham wondered. The question sounded innocent, but for all his florid bluff, the Lord Mayor had been sent to meet aliens, and I doubted he was any sort of an idiot. Do you not look for the return of the elders? Be honest or be politic? Shit. Oliveira knew who he was sending. Up until a couple years ago, I confessed, we'd never heard of the elders. He seemed shaken at the thought, though it could have simply been the bus lurching away from the curb. How is that possible? Because we're from Earth, the same world that your ancestors were taken from and brought here. Okay, here we go. I shifted in my seat to make it easier to reach under my fatigue blouse in case I needed to grab my Glock 9mm. Yours isn't the only world that was seeded with life and civilization by the elders. There are dozens of them spread out between our home and yours, and not all of them are human. Those gray eyes, sunken beneath his reddened cheeks, shaded by his hat, sharpened, honing in on me like a targeting laser. And how could that be possible? Wow, what an open-ended question, yet simultaneously loaded with potential traps. I was speculating, wild-ass guessing, if I was being honest. But I had an intuition that I was treading on dangerous ground, on fundamental beliefs I couldn't understand. By the power and intelligence of the elders. They took animal life from Earth and changed it, modified it on a genetic level. Did they understand genetics? I assumed so. It was hard to develop this level of technology and not discover it, if even by accident. They shaped them into bipedal humanoids, raised them to the level of intelligence of a human, and put them on their own worlds. I hesitated, not because I didn't know what to say, but because my jaw was starting to ache from talking so formally. Fuck it. I can't do this anymore. They even gave them star travel and fusion power and some really high-tech medical advances. But not us. The elders decided they wanted to let us be, not disrupt things. They wanted us to develop naturally, I guess. I shrugged. We're not really sure because the only intel we have on it comes from the religious beliefs of those non-humans. They say the elders told them not to mess with us, not even to visit our system. They call our planet the source, probably because it's the source of all the genetic material used to make them. Now Pops was staring at me, only the lines of strain around his eyes a clue to the fact that he was trying to keep from yelling at me. I shrugged just slightly, a tilting of my head. Relax, I know what I'm doing, I hope. Outside the curved window of the bus, city streets were passing by as we left the spaceport behind us. There were other bus-like vehicles on the road, but nothing I would have pegged as a personal automobile. Off to the side, past a wide pedestrian walk, was a train track. No, I decided, eyes narrowing, a monorail. They were big into mass transit here. If I may be so bold, sir, Bellingham said, his fingers intertwined across his prominent belly. I would say from your tone that you're not entirely satisfied with this arrangement. I grinned. You're a very perceptive man, Lord Mayor. Well, maybe. But it was useful that he thought I thought so. Don't get me wrong, a lot of the non-humans are noble, courageous, good people, but their governments, the people in charge, they look down their noses at us, as if we're more primitive because they had faster-than-light drive before we did. I snorted, giving it a bit more hostile cynicism than I actually felt. Their tune changed when we saved their asses a few times. Big pardon, Bellingham said, immediately catching what I'd let slip. He was, after all, a perceptive man. If I catch your idiom correctly, Major, you save them from what? My smile was genuine this time. 
Well, Lord Mayor, that's kind of what I'd like to talk to your king about. Chapter 7 That is quite the tale you've told, Major Clanton. I don't quite know what I imagined from King Richard the Eighth. The first images that had come to mind were paintings I remembered of Henry the Eighth, but that was just because of the Roman numeral. Although he wasn't too far off from the last king that the colonists of Roanoke had known, so maybe it wasn't that bad a guess. The second thought I'd had was of the business suits the current King of England wore, though I knew that would be asking a bit much, given that this society had 400 years on its own to develop. Reality was somewhere between. The coat King Richard wore was long and luxurious and royal red, a style that wouldn't have seemed out of place on the legendary Henry, but its lines were more akin to what I'd seen of the English monarchy in the 1950s. The man wearing the clothes was a bit more conservative than the color would have indicated, his red hair cut short and his beard close-trimmed against his lantern jaw. I wouldn't have called him a handsome man, but he wasn't an inbred hunchback like his Shakespearean namesake. We were alone in his royal chambers, office, drawing room. I didn't know what to call it. It wasn't the kind of room normal people had. Flames guttered persistently in the fireplace, throwing flickering shadows across the bookcase. The books there were tall and bound in cloth and leather, none of them showing the telltale signs of mass manufacturing, though I knew they must have it. The hand-bound books were symbols of his wealth, of the antiquity of his line like the antique crystal decanter on the polished wood table between us, or the wine goblets set out for each of us. Probably the wine, too, though I wasn't enough of a connoisseur to make the distinction. I found it most interesting that I still hadn't been searched, nor had Pops or Quinn been disarmed. They were being given a tour of the palace guard barracks by Guard Captain Tramplemane, and the guards had seemed quite taken with their utility fatigues. Pops had come over to Delta from Special Forces and could charm the wooden shoes off a Dutchman at need, so I knew they'd get along okay. It is that, Your Highness, I acknowledged, sipping at the wine as if I were impressed by it. Honestly, I thought most wine tasted like cough syrup. Yet I could and will show you video evidence to back it up. And granted that you will, he said, waving his gobble at me like a conductor's baton. I am inclined to accept what you say, simply because you are here, and there is little else you could say that would be stranger or more marvellous than that. Yet I would ask you, why have you come? I explained our quest to discover as much as we could about the elders, I said, frowning. We follow their path in hopes of finding out more of our heritage. That's why you're on the journey, Major Clanton, but why are you here? "'talking to me as if you mean to convince me, to win me to your side.' "'And King Richard was no idiot either. "'I tried to remind myself of that. "'Just because these people were strange didn't mean they were inferior to us. "'In fact, given what they'd accomplished with what seemed to be a level of technology "'somewhere around 1960s-70s-era Earth, "'I was willing to say they were superior to us in a lot of ways. "'A few reasons, Your Highness.' Sweat was trickling down the back of my neck, though I wasn't 100% certain why. This wasn't even close to being the most nerve-wracking situation I'd faced in the last few months. True, this guy could have killed me if I pissed him off, but... One, you're from our very recent past. We find that intriguing, since all the evidence up till now had indicated the elders had last visited Earth over 2,000 years ago. Two... And I barely had time to come up with two, because I only really had two, but three always sounded better. You've achieved space travel on your own, without outside help, which, as far as we know, has only happened once before, and that's us. Everyone else was either helped by the Elders or by the Helta, one of the non-human races. That makes you very significant. And last, well, sir, I mentioned the Tavinians. That you did, Major. Richard swirled red wine in his glass, staring at it as if the answers to the questions of life, the universe, and everything were contained in its currents. And a fascinating situation it is. Humans, like us, ceded to another world by the elders, 
fighting against these non-humans you've told me about, the Helter, the Skrith, the Vironians, and the Shamblisi, he laughed softly, bears, wolves, lizards, and octopus, just incredible, and these Helter gave you the gift of travel to the stars, he looked at me over the rim of the glass, and would you give it to us as well? In time, I said, channeling my inner politician. That's not my decision to make, but I can't see my ruler ignoring an opportunity like this. I waved it off, hoping he wouldn't bring it up again, because I really didn't want to have to explain how we couldn't build hyperdrives without the Helta, and the Alliance was extremely unlikely to hand them over to another group of transplanted humans. That's for ambassadors to negotiate, but I can guarantee one thing. If the Tavinians find this world, they'll try to take it. They'll offer alliance, but they have nothing to give you. They can't make starships. They can't make weapons. They can't make anything without the slaves they've taken and the machinery they've stolen from the Helta. They're shitty engineers, they're shitty scientists, and they're shitty soldiers. Richard raised an eyebrow, the corner of his mouth quirking upward in appreciation of the blunt honesty, I hoped. Yet... They managed to very neatly conquer your allies, these non-humans. That must make you able warriors indeed. I shrugged. We have our moments. What about you, your highness? I know you've been here for four hundred years. Have things always been peaceful? I would fain not share our warts with guests, he said, disguising his true expression behind a drink of wine. But I would to God it was possible for men and women to live in peace for such a time without coming into contention. We were as one people for the better part of a century, until we expanded to Australis. At my frown, he clarified, that's the continent to our south. We call this one Borealis, in case you hadn't heard. Once Australis was settled, well... The governments drifted away from each other ideologically, as these things are wont to do. And there were disagreements over territory, over religion, over just about everything. We fought three wars, each more destructive and senseless than the last, before our nations united. But the last was forty years ago. Since then, things have been mostly calm give or take what you might consider brush fires, to be put out in smaller settlements. We are an orderly society now, united in our pursuit of knowledge and of the ways of the elders. Do you think of them as gods? I asked him. Angels? He laughed softly, though I didn't hear much humor in it. It was that, indeed, which led to the first of our wars. The people of Australis were far too inclined to think of them as divine to abandon the church of their youth. Yet it was not one of the last things the elders told us, it was not to worship them, that they were not gods, but merely God's instruments. So you're Anglicans, I guessed, and will be until the Lord returns, or the elders, whichever comes first. He made a dismissive gesture. Of course, the worship of the elders still continues in private, out of the light of day, but it will never be allowed to gain control of our government, as it once did. He smiled, and this time the expression seemed genuine. I have a tremendous idea. Your arrival is reason enough for a special service of thanksgiving and praise. Accompany me to a meeting with the Archbishop of New Roanoke. After the service, we will share with you all that we know of the elders. In the meantime, you may stay in our guest rooms. We dine at seven. Holy shit, Michael Oliveira muttered. Maybe he thought the comms wouldn't pick it up, but they were inhumanely sensitive thanks to the Helta, and I chuckled. He scowled into the video pickup, and I laughed even harder. Maybe once upon a time, the grumpy act would have intimidated me. Well, no, actually, I don't think it ever did. Julie was laughing, too, just at the edge of the video, though Anu didn't seem to find it amusing. <laughs> yeah, that was my reaction, too, sir. This place is almost too good to be true, at least from a strategic standpoint. If we can negotiate some sort of mutual aid agreement, we could use it as a staging base for a whole new part of the galaxy. And they're human, from pretty recently, so we have some common ground to approach them from. I shrugged. I mean, 
Granted, there's some kind of weird quasi-English 1970s version of humanity, but at least they're not bloodthirsty space Vikings like the Tavinians. And I think I've got them convinced we're a better bet than the Tavinians for allies. Mr. Tremonti, Oliveira said, waving at the screen in front of him, as if Pops was standing there and not hundreds of miles down through the atmosphere. You and Sergeant Quinn mingled with their soldiers, swapped bullshit stories. What was your sense of these people? The four of us were gathered in what I guessed people called a drawing room, connected to the guest suite we'd been assigned to, though it was probably bigger than my living room back home, maybe the dining room too. There was certainly more real wood in this room, and I couldn't remember the last time I'd had a fire in the fireplace in Nevada. I mean, it was romantic and all, but I hadn't been trying for romantic much while living the single writer lifestyle. The rest of the team was racking out in the shuttle, eating MREs and standing guard, and not too happy about it, particularly since Quinn had kind of rubbed it in how nice our accommodations were. And he might have implied that the king would be sending female companionship up for us, though I hope that rumor didn't get back to Julie. They're a bit stiff, Pop said, sipping at a cup of tea. The Croatanians were big on tea, though I can never stand the stuff myself. A lot like Brits on our world, but even more so. Like, he laughed, a sound I heard so seldom that I marveled at it. (laughs) It's gonna sound stupid, but they remind me of old BBC shows I used to watch. I think they sound a lot like religious fanatics to me, Quinn said. He was still very much the ranger, though he was loosening up a little since making the team. Like the people used to go around our neighborhoods trying to talk to us about where we'd go when we die. As someone from a family full of religious fanatics... I interjected. Let me just say that they're not all bad. I mean, they're a pain in the ass, but they're not all bad. My only worry is that they're not being straight with us. You mean, Anu said, with what I swear was dry humor, that when faced with technologically advanced visitors from another star system, humans might not be completely honest about their situation? Ooh, I said, clutching at my chest as if I'd been wounded. That's a low blow. But yeah, I mean, that's what I was talking about when I said it was too good to be true. They sound too homogenous, too united to be real. Well, think about it, Andy, Pop said. They're all the descendants of one small group of English colonists, maybe a few native tribesmen thrown in, though who knows at this point. Same religion, same country of origin, basically the same kind of people, the kind who'd give up on their old lives to settle a new colony with little hope of survival. The only amazing thing is that their population has grown as big as it has in just 400 years. I think that has a lot to do with their attitude towards women, Julie opined. Or did you gentlemen not notice that because everyone was being so gentlemanly toward you? I noticed, I told her. We spent all day talking to powerful people, politicians, military, and all of them were men. I saw portraits of women, wives, mothers, but wasn't introduced to a single one. This place hasn't had a sexual revolution, hasn't had women's liberation. And I'll lay you odds they haven't even tried to develop birth control. Marvelous, Julie said, rolling her eyes. A bunch of stiff upper lip British prigs who treat women like breeders and are Anglican religious fanatics to top it all off. I'm sure they'll go over big back home. She looked straight into the camera, and I knew she was looking at me. You really think you can sell these guys as allies? It'll be tough to get past the Senate, Oliveira admitted. And now I feel lost, as usual, Anu said. Your political leadership would forego alliance with a scientifically advanced colony of humans simply because your cultural norms differ? What does your Senate think of the Chamblisi? They think the Chamblisi are aliens with tentacles and light-up bodies, I told him. This is different because it's a chapter out of our own past, and one a lot of people think is pretty horrible. I raised a hand to forestall his protest. And I know it doesn't sound like much in comparison to the Divinians, but not everything about my government makes sense. I sighed. Okay, most things don't make sense. I think this is something we'd have to backdoor, Oliveira said leaning back in his chair on board the Jambo, staring thoughtfully into the middle distance. Try to take through the alliance instead of the U.S. government. 
It'd be easier to convince the Shamblisi to trust another group of rogue humans than it would be to get the Senate to ratify a treaty with a bunch of sexist British imperialists. They do make great tea, Pops allowed, saluting the camera with the china cup he held. Pinky finger out straight. I'm going to get what I can out of them tomorrow, I said. They seem to know more about the elders than the Rojolani. Once we have this meeting with their church officials, I'll tell them we have to continue on with our mission and try to promise just enough to make sure they don't wind up taking sides with the Tavinians. Look at you, being all diplomatic and shit, Julie teased. I have to say, Anonim Claus put in, I have my worries about these people that don't include whether they allow females in their military. What is it? I asked him. You think they'd throw in with the Tavinians? No. I think they could make the Tavinians seem tame by comparison in time. Oliveira, Pops, and I all tried to talk at once, but Anu pressed on. Your people, Andy, your nation, and to some extent your world, have all been shaped by the nature of your first contact with the Hilta, your experiences with the other races of the Alliance. But beyond that, you've been shaped by your history. You. Unlike the Tavinians, know the true destruction war can bring. You know that there's no need for it, given the vast resources any of us can command given the hyperdrive and fusion power. There are enough living worlds, enough resources for all, and any attempt to invade the worlds of others is insane. I do not know that these Croatanians of yours have learned this lesson. Okay, I said, rubbing my chin thoughtfully. I've made a decision. Croatanians sound stupid. We should call them Croatoans. The veins stood out on Oliveira's forehead, and I laughed again. Sorry. Yes, I know what you mean, Anu. If we give these guys FTL capability and they turn out to have the expansionist mindset of the British Empire they came from, well, they're also in the height of their space age and have a couple modern wars under their belt. They're not going to be handing lasers to their foot soldiers and throwing them into headlong charges like the Tavinians. They're going to know what the hell they're doing. I was being a little hard on the Tavinians, of course. They had come up with some battle strategies and tactics of their own, making the most of what they had. But they didn't invent any new weapons, and the few times they'd come up with novel ways to use the Helta technology they'd stolen, it was still a matter of throwing one suicidal wave after another at the problem until one side or the other ran out of people. We're not giving them starships, then? Quinn deduced. Not up to me, Oliveira said, seeming happy to beg off that particularly thorny issue. But if they ask my opinion, I'd say we should work on integrating their units into some kind of joint task force with ours, perhaps with some sort of probationary period. That way, we can get a better feel for how they interact with us, and with the other species of the Alliance, before we unleash them on the rest of the galaxy. A wise compromise, Michael, Anu told him. I believe I could get the rest of the Alliance on board with such a decision. I will leave debates within your Senate to you. The other question, I said, is whether you're going to accept King Richard's invitation. He really wants to meet the HMFIC. Pardon? Anu cut in. I'll explain it later, I promised. It means the boss, the commanding officer. Oliveira sighed. If Colonel Wrightfield was in on this conference not warming my seat on the bridge, he'd be screaming bloody murder at the thought. In German, most likely. Wrightfield was the ship's executive officer, another of what I called the exchange students. I shuddered at the thought of what he would do with the Jambo if anything happened to Oliveira. He was German Air Force, which didn't mean much in the last 25 years or so, but I suppose he was a competent officer, and we had to throw our European allies a bone. The hell with it, Oliveira decided. This is a fact-finding mission, not strictly a military one, and I can't just sit on my ass inside the ship and expect to accomplish anything. Tell his majesty that I will be down in the morning in time for the church service. He laughed softly. <laughs> my wife would be happy. It'll be the first time I've been to church since my daughter's christening. Trust me, sir, I told him. It's been even longer than that for me. Chapter 8 The Church of Croatan might have been a lot like the Anglican Church in 20th century England, 
but the service bore little resemblance to the Baptist church my father presided over in my youth. Dad never wore a flowing white robe and the big gold hat, for one thing. I wasn't sure if the crowd was usually this large or if there was a big turnout to see the visitors from the stars, but I could tell this wasn't the gen pop, as they say in prison. These people were dressed nearly as well as the king and his retinue, though the colors of their clothes were more conservative, their haircuts less flamboyant. That was probably a fashion statement all its own, something having to do with not trying to show up their sovereign, politics layered on politics that I wouldn't be able to figure out unless I lived here. I did know that our position, seated in the same row as the king, was a high honor. I knew that because of the envious glances I was getting from the straight-nosed, long-faced types just behind us. Oliveira seemed more at ease in his role as the visiting ambassador than I had been, and I knew just looking at his demeanor that the man would be president someday, whether of the United States or perhaps whatever organization wound up representing all the member nations to the alliance, I couldn't say, whichever wound up being more important in the long run. Pops was respectful and reverent, and I recalled he'd been raised Baptist as well. But Quinn looked about as comfortable as a drug dealer at a police station. I didn't recall his religious persuasion, if any, but he certainly didn't like it here. If anyone was even less comfortable than Quinn, it was Anu. I hadn't been sure if he'd come. Once I told the king about him, Richard had insisted on meeting the alien, and he'd been the picture of civility to the Scrith ambassador. But I still couldn't shake the sense that bringing him to the church service was a big joke to him and his advisors, like the Victorians bringing native tribesmen and women over to Europe and dressing them in the most formal suits and hats. The service itself was according to formula, similar to the many Catholic masses I'd attended, until the end, when the archbishop himself had given a blessing that included praise to God for sending the elders and also for sending our esteemed visitors from earth. Stand up, King Richard had whispered to Oliveira, then met eyes with me as well, a look that would brook no argument. All of you, stand. Oliveira gave me the barest of nods and I stood along with him, then motioned for Quinn and Pops to do the same. I'd asked Oliveira to consider bringing in more guards, but he'd insisted that it wouldn't do any good unless they were wearing Svalin armor, and he doubted we could get away with that. Anu looked at us, then back at King Richard, and the Croatoan ruler motioned for him to stand as well. Once Anu had joined us, the archbishop began clapping, an odd, exaggerated motion with his arms extended. The king applauded as well, and the second he did, the rest of the crowd joined in, over a thousand of them. No hooting or hollering, no shouts, either of amen or huzzah, just silent applause, and I found it disconcerting, but I waved dutifully. At a word from the archbishop, everyone stood and fell silent. Following the service the archbishop said, his voice as solemn as an undertaker's, his face some ancient great horned owl looking out over the forest. The king's party will be making the trick to the monument. If you are not in the party, please stay behind the barriers. You will be allowed to approach once the king has retired from the courtyard. A monument? Pops murmured by my ear. I shook my head. This hadn't been on the schedule, and the deviation worried me. I waited for Oliveira to ask the king, but Richard was still seated, and I imagined he would remain so until the processional hymn was over. Just roll with it, I told Pops, but let Dog know. I could barely hear his transmission, sub-vocalized into his throat mic, almost invisible, taped near his Adam's apple. He was contacting Sergeant Gene Loring, the Delta operator who I'd come to know as Dog the senior in rank of the NCOs left from the original team, who was still waiting for us in Gunfighter 1. Colonel Evans was with a platoon of his rangers in Gunfighter 2, which had brought down Oliveira and Anu, though we hadn't advertised the reinforcement. Evans and Wrightfield had insisted on it, and they weren't wrong. At the end of the hymn, the king stood, and the entire audience as well as the archbishop bowed at the waist to him. I wasn't sure if they expected us to bow as well, but we didn't. Americans didn't bow to anyone, as far as I was concerned, and Anu certainly wasn't going to genuflect to a bunch of hairless apes. I knew he thought of us as hairless apes as well, but he liked us anyway. 
After the bow, the king and his party, including us and his personal guard in full armor, headed down the center of the aisle while everyone else remained in place, watching with awe, envy, or annoyance, depending on their station and demeanor. The church itself reminded me of cathedrals I'd seen in Europe, though I couldn't have named the style. I wasn't big into architecture, but it was impressive, with lots of flying buttresses and stained glass, and I imagine God would have been happy to live there if someone had bothered to tell him about it. It was pleasantly cool outside, not quite a chilly English morning, but closer to the high Sierras in late spring. I didn't know what season it was here. It could have been fall or even early winter if the nearby ocean moderated the temperatures. For someone used to sweating through my t-shirt inside a fatigue blouse, anything under 60 degrees was a relief. Your Majesty, Olivera said quietly once we'd passed through the arched doorway and were padding down the stone staircase. What memorial are we going to see? I've been saving this as a surprise, King Richard told him, grinning. You wish to learn of the elders from our memories, and I would show you our most sacred relic of their presence among us. Please, follow me and see for yourself. Your Highness, the head of the King's security detail said, one hand pressed to the oversized headphone at his ear, the cord running over his shoulder to the radio at his back. It had a whip antenna that stuck up four feet above his head, and he looked like a Vietnam-era RTO. I'm getting a report from the city patrol that there's been reports of crowds gathering at the barriers on the other side of Monument Park. I'd like to delay the visit until we can bring in reinforcements from the barracks, sire. Nonsense, Richard replied, waving the man's concerns away. It's the right of the people to gather as they will, and I can scarcely blame them for being curious, given the nature of our guests. Unless someone breaches the peace or crosses the barriers, we will press on, Captain. Yes, your highness. Captain Tramplemain was making the sort of face I knew well, the one a junior officer makes when they disagree with the decision of a superior, but know it's useless to keep arguing the point. But he did as he was told and fell back with the rest of his troops, though I noticed he keyed his mic and began speaking urgently but softly. Pops did the same, then edged up to me as we passed through the courtyard outside the front entrance of the cathedral. I told Dog to go ahead and launch the drone, sir. I nodded. We had armed drones, though we didn't advertise the fact to our allies, because they universally considered it barbaric to use remotely triggered weapons in war. But we weren't going to risk flying them in the capital city of a possible ally. The ones Dog would be sending out were micro-drones, quadcopters, fitted with cameras and comm units. They weren't much use against our enemies because the Tavinians had stolen the ECM technology which the Helta had perfected, which also made guided missiles and the aforementioned armed drones useless against them. Here, though, they were science fiction. I'd figured this park had to be right across the street, maybe the end of the block at the furthest, but we shuffled along for at least half a mile down the tree-lined cobblestone avenue. No need for smoother pavement when they didn't encourage personal vehicles, and most people stuck with the trains. I had not, I realized abruptly, seen any bicycles. They hadn't been invented yet when the Roanoke colonists had been abducted, but neither had buses or trains or spaceships, and the Croatoans had all of those. I was still considering the relative likelihood of the invention of the bicycle when we came within sight of the barriers and the crowd beyond them. They reminded me more of Hesco bastions than traffic barriers, collapsible and filled with something, maybe sand, maybe water. I caught a glimpse of puddles on the ground around them and guessed water, which made sense. Easy to deploy, easy to fill, easy to empty and store. They lined the street from sidewalk to sidewalk, tying into a ten-feet-tall stone and wood fence that stretched on for a mile on a side. The barriers were tall enough that they nearly blocked out the people completely, but here and there were narrow gaps, and through them were throngs of civilians. I hadn't seen any of their normal citizens so far, only the military and the ruling class, and the difference was as stark as I imagined. They weren't Oliver Twist levels of poor, not in a society with space travel and nuclear power, and Richard had mentioned to me that they had some kind of welfare program for the poor, to make sure no one starved to death or spread the plague through their cities. 
The clothes were serviceable, if not as fashionable as their rulers. The colors drab by comparison. Patches at the knees and elbows. The hats on the men turned up in the front, in what might have been a political statement for all I knew. And there were women in the group, almost half of them, which was something I had seen not at all among the royals or the military. Their dress was no less drab and plain than the males, but they added a modernity to the whole picture, dragging it out of its space-age Victorian surrealism. The police, though, or the patrol, or whatever they were called here, didn't resemble Bobby's in the least, either from the 1970s or the modern day. Their uniforms were more akin to northern European law enforcement, casual and friendly, and I didn't see a single gun among the lot of them. That part was very British, at least. They also looked very outnumbered, which was also very British. What are we looking at, dog? I asked, keeping my voice low. The mic would pick up a whisper, but whispers attracted more attention than simply speaking soft in a normal voice. Not seeing anything violent yet, he told me, obscenely loud in my earbud, though I knew intellectually that no one else could hear him. But the crowd is big and getting bigger, in the thousands now, and it's still coming in on three different streets. No one's getting out of here on the ground any direction except straight back to the palace, and I don't know how long that route will stay open. He paused. Want me to fire up the shuttle and pull you guys out? Negative. Not unless General Oliveira calls for it. What is this place? Oliveira asked King Richard, motioning at the walls. It looks pretty big. That is Monument Park, the largest municipal garden in the city, the king said pride in his voice and a spring in his step, as if he wanted to get there quicker to show off to his visitors. In any city. The gate loomed ahead of us, and I was grateful to see it, not just because I was getting tired of walking, but because I longed to get behind those walls. If the crowd got out of hand, I had little faith in a bunch of overweight locals with billy clubs to keep them in line. Trampelmane was nervous as hell. I could see it in the set of his shoulders. The way his right hand kept straying toward the handgun in a cross-draw holster at his left hip. It was, I discovered after talking to Pops, remarkably similar to a Walther P-38, though chambered in something closer to ten millimeters. I was determined to take one with me when we left and smuggle it back to my gun safe in Vegas. Monument Park was as huge as advertised, not quite as large as Central Park in New York City, but running a close second. The trees and bushes were well tended colorful, with seasonal blooms, and the grass was clipped to a uniform height of four inches, as far as the eye could see. The sidewalk down the center of the garden was broad, and paved with the same red cobblestone as the street outside, well worn with use, though no one else was using it now. Aside from our party, the park appeared totally empty, and at the center of the place was its namesake. The monument was carved out of solid granite, at least as tall as the fence, and a good twenty feet across, the rear of it polished smooth and curving convex. It was in this place, King Richard told us, pitching his voice to carry as he led us around to the front of the sculpture, that the elders first delivered us to this lush, wonderful world, and gave to us their wisdom. It was here that they landed, here where they told us the secrets of how to thrive where they gifted us the seeds we would use to grow our food, the cattle we would rely on for meat and milk, the location of the deposits of iron and coal that would build our first cities. So it was here where we would build our monument to them, in honor of their service to God and to us, his children. The king stopped at the center of the courtyard, and if he hadn't, I would have anyway. I was rooted to the ground frozen in mid-step, staring at the shapes carved into the stone. Most of their interaction with us, Richard went on, voice filled with awe and appreciation, was through what we now realize were robots of some sort, either gifted with intelligence near our own, due to the sophistication of their computers, or controlled by them remotely. They had no wish for us to worship them, So they avoided contacting us face to face, yet once, it is written in the history of the day, they felt the need to come out of their ship and speak directly to us, and the artist who carved this image was one of the men who saw them that day.
The figure was eight feet tall, though by the proportions I had the sense that the representation was meant to be larger than life, that the actual elders were closer to our size, our height. It was dressed in what I immediately recognized as a spacesuit of some kind, segmented at the joints, the helmet solid without so much as a visor. But it was humanoid, bipedal, bilateral symmetry, joints in the same place as us. Its hand stretched out toward us as if to pull us to our feet. The hand had five fingers. Get a picture of this to Dr. Haskett, I told Quinn. I could have done it myself, but I was still staring at the thing, dazzled by the implications of its existence. This is the only representation of the elders that we have left over from the founding of this world, Richard said. None of his advisors who'd come along on the trek had spoken to us. At first, I thought that they simply resented or mistrusted us, but now I got the impression that they'd been instructed not to talk that the king felt like it was his privilege, or perhaps his duty, to share this information with the visitors from the stars. Every year, for the last three centuries, the king has made a pilgrimage to this monument, and repeated the same pledge that our people made to the elders back then, that we would emulate their example and prepare for their return. Richard circled around Michael Oliveira, as if getting a look at the image from a different vantage point. And I will tell you, my friends, he went on, putting a hand on Oliveira's shoulder, as much as I accept the word of the elders that they were no gods, as much as I accept your word that you are not them, I would that both were true, for there is little that would make a king of Croaton happier than to be the man on the throne when the elders return. Unless, Oliveira countered, it was to be the king who was on the throne when the Croatoans went and found the elders. Your people could travel the stars as they did, your highness. You could be as we are in time, if we were to come to an agreement. It was admirable, I suppose, that Oliveira was sticking to the script and doing his duty. But it also made me wonder if he understood the implications of the sculpture. Sir, I said, reluctant to interrupt but unable to contain myself. Do you know what this means? Oliveira eyed me sidelong, as if annoyed. Assume I don't. They're humanoid, I said. You remember the conversation we had the first time we met the Helta? How that kind of similarity doesn't happen by accident? What are the odds that the only other sentient life in the universe to evolve independently, besides ours, looks that much like us? Oliveira frowned, staring up at the shape carved into the stone as if seeing it for the first time. Maybe, he ventured, it's another one of the species they engineered, or even just another human strain they picked up earlier, who got drafted into being their representatives to cultures like the Roanoke colony. I mean, if they're a hive mind or sentient machines or something, it might make sense to have someone along who's closer in appearance to the natives to make contact with them. It wasn't a bad hypothesis, yet I couldn't shake the feeling that it was too easy. Something about this didn't feel right. Before I could figure out what it was, Dog's voice yelled into my ear. Sir, we've got problems. That crowd, it's picking up steam. I don't think they can see it at the barricades, but it's pushing forward like a tidal wave, and it's coming straight at you. Chapter 9 They have returned. It had taken me a couple of minutes to figure out what they were chanting, but as they came closer, it became clearer, and they were much too fucking close already. The chant rolled through the crowd like a wave on the shore, each repetition driving them farther past the barriers, first a handful squeezing through, then a few dozen, then hundreds, and there wasn't a damn thing the cops could do to stop them. Who's returned? Pops asked, his gun in his hand as he watched the throng of civilians swarming through the gates into the park. Them, I told him, jabbing a finger at the carved stone. Those people out there think we're the elders. They're of the cult, Tramplemane declared between shouting at his squad to deploy into a defensive perimeter and shouting into his headphone mic to bring out reinforcements. Bloody goddamn heretics. The cult of the elders, King Richard explained. 
He seemed preternaturally calm for all that his protective detail had formed a cordon around him. As I said, most take the elders at their word, and trust the historical accounts that our ancestors were not deceived. They accept that the elders were not divine, but merely servants of God. He shrugged and motioned imperiously at the oncoming throng of chanting civilians. These do not. They believe you are the elders, and they resent that we, that I, have kept you from the people, kept you to myself. We have to get the hell out of here, Tramplemain declared, or we're going to have to start shooting into the crowd and wind up with a few hundred bodies, and be damned lucky if we're not among them. You have a plan for that, Captain? I asked him. There's another exit to the park, back to the north, he told me, motioning behind us. We're heading there now. He glanced back at Richard. By your leave, your highness. Try not to hurt anyone, Captain, the king said, sighing in what could have been regret or maybe resignation. These events were bound to inflame the passions among the masses, but, yes, please guide us away from this mess before the poor, misguided fools inconvenience our guests. This way. Stay close to me, I told Oliveira and Anu. Anything happens, Anu, you take General Oliveira and run like hell, and I'll have the shuttle meet you. I suppose Colonel Wrightfield is going to be very smug when he informs me that he told me this might happen, Oliveira muttered. The Croatoan Royal Protection Team had split in two, half of them behind us, watching our backs as the crowd of demonstrators advanced across the grass fields behind us half ahead of us, rushing King Richard along with the impatience of men who knew they could run faster if only they were allowed. I understood their frustration because I shared it. We could all have run faster than the king and his retinue of nameless gray-beard advisors, and I was half convinced we should. Of course, it would mean leaving King Richard behind, looking like cowards to the Croatoans and abandoning any hope of creating a relationship with the planet. But a relationship with a bunch of 1970s throwback English spacemen wouldn't do us any good if we were dead. My second thought was to have the shuttles hop in and pick us all up to take us back to the palace. But there were too goddamn many trees in this park for them to have a clear landing site. The shuttles were big, significantly bigger than a Blackhawk, more like a C-5 galaxy, if they could build one of those monsters as a VTOL engine. It made them handy, since they could haul cargo as well as troops and provide serious fire support. But it also meant they had to have a football field's worth of clearance to land. We didn't have that. Dog, I transmitted, not even huffing and puffing because we weren't running across the park. We weren't even jogging, just fast walking like a bunch of old men in tracksuits. Tell Major Lee we need a dust off at the northern end of the park near the cathedral. Home in on my IFF signal and get ready to pull us out if we need it. Roger that, sir. And now I'd really stepped in it. But the crowd was closer, close enough I could make out individual faces. Not all of them were angry, not even most. They looked enraptured, the way Pentecostals did when they spoke in tongues, trying to reach us not for revenge on the king, but because they just knew we were the answer to all their problems, and all they had to do was touch the hem of our garments to be healed. Unfortunately, when four or five thousand enraptured pseudo-Pentecostals rush in trying to touch the same five people, those five people are going to be crushed to death. Sir, I barked to Oliveira, I've called in a dust-off at the north end of the park. Oliveira shot me a wide-eyed look, as if he thought I'd overreacted. But he didn't chew me out in front of the royalty, which I appreciated. Your Highness, he said, a bit more out of breath than I was but I understood since he spent most of his time in a starship. We have one of our landers coming in at the other side of the park to take all of us back to the palace safely. I winced even as he said it, remembering the old adage that it's better to beg forgiveness than ask permission, and wondering if that hadn't been a thing in the Air Force or Space Force. I would love to have been wrong about the reaction he could have expected from the announcement. Richard spun on the man, seeming to forget about the approaching crowd of thousands of people, his eyes alight with righteous indignation. When he spoke, icicles dripped off the words. General, I would remind you that this is our world and my kingdom, and I can control my own people. You, sir, overstep your bounds. Your Highness, Captain Tramplemain exclaimed, dancing from foot to foot 
as if he was on a desperate hunt for a bathroom. We have to keep moving. Oh, shit, boss, Dog yelled in my ear, drowning out the guard captain's argument with his ruler. We got crowds cutting in from the street behind the cathedral. They're going right over the barriers. We're warming up the engines now, but we're not going to get there before they do. Ain't no way they're going to give us room to land. Shit. Shit, 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 shit. Get over here as quick as you can. Tell Major Lee if he doesn't get us out of this alive, he's fired. And it doesn't matter that we're the same rank because the president owes me a favor. Oliveira, Trampelmane, and King Richard were still arguing. While one of his advisors, someone he'd called the Exchequer, but who looked to me like the zombie vampire version of Steven Tyler, was prattling on in the background about how all this could have been avoided if the king had followed his advice and enacted some edict or another that I couldn't be bothered to pay attention to. I stepped into the middle of the fray and put my hand out to get their attention. There's another group of demonstrators that's going to cut us off from the north exit. Can we stop this shit long enough to try to get out of here? Or is this one of those famous royal ego things where the king can't admit he needs help and winds up getting killed? Because I hate those stories. Trampelmane and the Exchequer, a title I was now giving weird experimental definitions in my head and deciding he was the royal advisor who chose what house of magic the king's children would enter when they were old enough to become wizards, stared at me in horror, though I had a suspicion that Trampelmane might be horrified at the idea of being cut off, while zombie vampire Stephen Tyler was outraged at my lack of proper decorum. Oliveira was definitely angry at my tone, but he was also smart enough to be worried about the threat, while Pops and Quinn didn't give a shit about the king's feelings and just wanted to unass the area. The king, though, his reaction I didn't expect. Richard VIII, his highness, king of Croatan, lord of New Roanoke, was laughing. Not maniacal laughter, and not a soft chuckle, but an honest, full-throated laugh, like the crowd of thousands of wild-eyed religious fanatics didn't bother him, and the amusement I gave him overrode any concern he might have about dying. By God, Major Clanton, he said. I believe it would be better for my soul had I more men in my service who would speak the truth to me without fear of recrimination. I believe I was trying to do just that, my lord, Trampelmane protested. Don't push it too far, Captain, the king warned, but then waved assent. Very well. What would your advice be, Trampelmane? I put in a call for an autogyro, my lord, but it will take another twenty minutes for it to get here from the troop barracks. Perhaps we might try firing some shots into the ground in front of the crowd to warn them back. Won't work. Pops told him, sounding as if he was grateful to finally have something to talk about that was within his area of expertise, unlike local politics. Too many people, and most of them won't even hear the gunfire over the others in the crowd. Which was a good point. He was having the shout to be heard even now, and the crowd was still nearly a hundred yards away. The ones in the back would just crush the ones in the front to get to us. A flash of insight struck me. But I know what would get their attention, I said. As long as you don't mind a little damage to the lawn. Grass can be regrown, Major Clanton, Richard assured me. Though I would ask that you not injure anyone unless it's absolutely unavoidable. Lee, you read me? I called. You can't have me fired, Andy, Major Philip Lee replied. I'll get Julie to yell at you. You can keep your job, Phil, if you do me a solid. Load the coil gun with anti-personnel incendiary and fire me off a good one or two hundred rounds between us and this crowd of yahoos before they get it into their heads to overrun us. I'm away. I turned to the king and trample main and gestured toward the north entrance. We have to move, I said. We need to get some distance between us and the crowd. I eyed the exchequer and the rest of the monkey suit brigade from the palace. And I know you gentlemen are valued for your brains rather than your physical prowess, but if you could all do me a huge favor and move your regal asses, maybe we'll all actually live through this? They tried. It was a light jog this time, which was an improvement, and the gap between us and the crowd to the south widened to nearly 120 yards, an incremental improvement, but a real one. I heard the jets over the labored breathing of the old men. I'd heard airplane overflights at the spaceport, though for me, they were background noise, and I only reflected on how similar they were to the passenger liners back home in retrospect. This sound was different, the roar of a lion against the yowling of a kitten. Its turbojets fed not from aviation fuel, 
but a particle bed nuclear reactor. The design hadn't been too terribly far beyond what we could have built ourselves, given the time, money, and incentive, except for the armor that was coating the fuselage and the radiation shielding. Everything was smaller and more energy efficient and streamlined than our first attempt would have been without Helta aid in construction. But I did take some comfort in the fact that the hammerheads were mostly our work. So there was a sense of pride along with the relief when Gunfighter One emerged from behind the spires of New Roanoke, a shadow the size of a building falling over the park, blocking out the sun. Everyone huddle up, tight together, I warned the others. Lee, do it! I loved the incendiaries. They were as close as we came to the blasters from science fiction. And the little kid in me who'd become a science fiction writer appreciated the cinematic quality of the actinic flares of light slashing out of the shuttle's chin cannon, exploding against the turf. It was a simple concept, though the trick, as usual, was in the execution. The coil gun could accelerate tungsten slugs to hypersonic velocities and penetrate just about any armor, but not everything we faced was armored. For troops in the open, something designed more for anti-personnel work than armor piercing was called for. And a gun that could accelerate a solid metal slug could also accelerate a discarding sabo filled with powdered magnesium and the tiny explosive charge to light it on fire. Burning metal going seven or eight thousand feet per second could do unspeakable things to a dismounted soldier. And it was just as impressive beating up grass. Liberated water vapor thundered away from the impact of the shots, carrying with it showers of dirt and burning turf, spraying debris across the front rank of the rioters. Their screams were a higher pitch than the roar of the jets or the concussive blasts of the cannon fire, and the screams rolled back like a wave from the front to the rear of the crowd. Not one of them could have missed where the shots came from, not from the back of the crowd to the front. And those who didn't understand that they were a warning took them as threat, which was close enough for government work. Even the local cops were running, not read into the plan, and fearing for their lives as much as the crowd of rioters, which I could have felt guilty about but didn't. The patrol, or whatever they were called here, hadn't done a damned thing to control the riot, and I was happy to let them run right alongside the others. Good job, Lee, I said, yelling by instinct to be heard over the screaming turbojets of the hovering shuttle though I knew the throat mic was supposed to cancel out external noises. See if you could put a few rounds into the street ahead of the crowd on the north side and clear our way out of here. I'd been scanning the crowd, watching their panicked retreat for any sign it might get turned back into an attack, so I hadn't noticed the reaction of the king and his retinue until I turned back to the north exit. Captain Trampelmane and his troops were staring at the shuttle with a mixture of awe horror, and extreme avarice and their expressions. The look of soldiers who've seen a weapon they badly want for themselves and are simultaneously terrified might be used against them. The retinue of advisors who'd been dragged along on this trek didn't share the avarice, but they made up for it with twice the fear and horror, as if they hadn't taken the time to think through what it meant to have the technology to fly faster than light and how those sorts of advances might translate into destructive weapons, and just how easy it would be for a civilization like that to plow them under and not break a sweat. The king's eyes were wide as well, but not with horror. He was a man who saw possibilities, and if the power we wielded was a terrifying threat, it was also an awesome promise. General Oliveira, he said, his voice as husky as a teenaged boy walking through the dressing room at a victorious secret fashion show. You spoke of a partnership between our peoples. I would hear more of this. Chapter 10 Rubble crunched under my feet, covered in a fresh dusting of snow, shifting and unstable, slipping away as if trying to avoid touching anything living. Warm air washed over my face with the hum of fans, the armor's climate control working overtime to heat the suit up, but the chill still soaked through from the frigid temperatures outside. I'd been to the Alaskan interior in midwinter, and this killing cold gave it a run for its money. How many does this make? Pops asked, his voice as dolorous and deflated as my mood. 
He stood with one leg propped on a pile of ancient rubble at the crest of the hill, looking down into the river valley. Well, what had once been a river valley before the river had dried up. The ruins in the valley were more complete than anywhere else on the world, which was why we'd landed here. Yet they were clearly ancient, ground to dust by centuries of freezing and thawing. Six, Quinn answered the question before I had the chance. He stood beside me, his K.E. rifle held low across his chest, no threat on which to bring it to bear. Six systems in a row, just like this. And this is the third planet with ruins, Dog added. I couldn't see the Delta NCO's face, but I could hear the dollar in his tone. No bodies, though. That's weird, isn't it? Even if it's been a long time, you'd think there'd be some bones. People, pets, cattle, something. I guess that depends on what killed them, Quinn said so softly I could barely hear him. And how hungry they were. Getting any readings up there to tell us what caused this, Doc? I asked. Dr. Haskett was up in the James Bowie, in high orbit, but Gunfighter One squatted on the flat plain just a half mile behind us and its transmission antenna pierced the angry gray cloud cover overhead to make the journey in a quarter of a second, the light speed lag barely perceptible. It wasn't nukes, Major Clanton, Haskett sighed, but that's about all I can tell you for sure. There's background radiation, but it's not from fission detonations, at least assuming the analyzers are reading it right. I don't have a doctorate in physics, but I was married to a physicist for ten years, so I think that counts. Fusion warheads? I suggested. No fission trigger, just laser ignition? That wouldn't leave as much long-lasting radiation, right? No, it wouldn't. And as I said, I'm not a nuclear physicist, but I don't believe it was any sort of explosion. No telltale signs of kinetic bombardment either. No obvious impact craters, no shock diamonds. And that leaves nothing that I can think of. Not that I have a degree in physics either, but if I was writing a book about this kind of shit, fusion, antimatter, or big-ass rocks would have been my first three choices to destroy a planet. And I wouldn't have a fourth, or at least not one that would leave this kind of devastation. I mean, come on, Doc, the atmosphere is filled with toxins where it's not frozen. If I didn't have the context of five other worlds in exactly the same condition, Andy, I would have guessed volcanic activity perhaps triggering some sort of gas release from the deep oceans. But there's no way I can think of to cause widespread volcanism on multiple planets. You ready to take a walk down to the city? Pops asked, motioning down the draw to the ruins. It was difficult to think of the mounds of dirt and snow broken here and there by the jagged ends of what were once support beams as a city. But from orbit, ground-penetrating sensors had told the tale. Once upon a time, the metropolis had stretched four miles on a side, and smaller towns dotted the planet, though many were buried under sheets of ice hundreds of feet thick. Yeah, let's go, I said without much enthusiasm. If this place was like all the others, we'd find nothing. Maybe an archaeological crew with excavators and a few months to sift through the wreckage could discover who built this place but I don't think a bunch of door kickers and powered armor would be able to figure out much. Colonel Evans, I called. We're heading down. Your platoon is the overwatch for us. Roger that, Major Clanton. Evans' reply was clipped and short, and if I didn't know better, I would have assumed he was annoyed with me. It had been nearly three months now, though, and I knew it was this place, and all the other places like it we'd visited recently. It was making him nervous. It made me nervous. You know, Andy, Pop said to me in the privacy of our own channel, when we found the Croatoans, I thought we'd hit the jackpot, that the elders would be right around the corner. But ever since then, there's been nothing but this. He kicked at the barren, rusted soil. I guess it makes sense, though, I reasoned. If there'd been any other civilization on their level, within a couple dozen light years in any direction, they'd have detected their radio transmissions by now. Why didn't whatever killed all these worlds kill them, too? I laughed, a barking, humorless sound. Pops, I know I've come a ways as an officer since we first met, but if I've ever given you any reason to suspect I'm smart enough to answer that question, I must have misled you. We walked in silence, concentrating on our balance. The slope down the old riverbed was steep and uneven, and I stopped every few yards to check on the others. 
not because I thought any of them were incompetent enough in their suits to actually fall, but because it was my job. Though, you know, I finally continued, after letting the question ruminate for a few minutes, all the way down to the outskirts of the city. I could think of maybe one reason, for the destruction to end at Croatan, I mean. If the elders were fighting someone, some other alien race out there, maybe the war ended right before it got to Croatan. If that happened, then the elders might have been too depleted to come back and do more experimenting or meddling or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, that's a possibility, sir, he admitted. I gotta be honest with you, I'm getting a little impatient. We've been out here three months and we still haven't reached the source of the signal. I know we got a mission, but it seems to me we could answer a lot of our questions if we just went and asked the elders. That signal's been transmitting for decades at a minimum, Pops, maybe centuries. We don't know if we'll find any elders when we get to it, or just some automated machinery. We don't know we won't either, but I get what you're saying. I'd been aiming for a particularly tall section of rubble, piled high and steep enough that the snow hadn't collected on it. It was still covered in sand and dirt, and the centuries of wear had hidden its purpose from my eyes. But the suit's sensors told me it was a pile of metal support beams, and that there was something solid under the pile, something squared off and regular in its lines, probably something manufactured. A hill had formed around it from runoff over the years, and I tested the footing there carefully, not wanting to go plunging through a hollow spot into an underground sewer or cavern. Not only would it be potentially life-threatening, it would have been embarrassing as hell. I could feel Pops staring at me as I stamped experimentally every few feet, and I wondered if he actually had his hands on his hips or if that was just how I was imagining him. Finally, I reached the base of the accidental pyramid, and when I did, my footfalls caused a miniature landslide, the sandy soil pouring down from gaps between the supports, revealing their edges. They weren't jagged or sharp, not after this much time exposed to erosion, but they were metal, strong enough to last for centuries despite the rust and corrosion. I ran a finger down the surface of one of the beams, dirt and dried mud flaking away from it, and the cold leached the heat from my suit, my whole hand going numb. If I had taken off my glove, I'd have had frostbite in minutes. Through the gap where the loose soil had been, the light built into the side of my helmet revealed more soil, but this time in the shape of a squared-off mound. Anything? Quinn asked. On the mapping display at the corner of my HUD, I could see his IFF signal about thirty feet off to my right. Maybe, I said, if I can reach it. I edged in sidelong and tried to reach through with my left hand, digging my feet into the soil to gain traction so I didn't just wind up pushing myself backward. The tips of my fingers just brushed across the top of the thing, scraping away a few inches of caked dirt, but not revealing what was beneath it. I pushed harder, but was rewarded with a creaking groan from the support beams, a shudder that seemed to travel down into the ground. Sir, Quinn warned, I don't know how stable that is. As it turned out, not very. Ancient brittle metal snapped with a screech of inanimate agony, and the entire dirt pyramid toppled over sideways, and I very nearly went with it. I wish I could say that my own cat-like reflexes saved me, but the truth was that the Svalin armor had its own gyro system to keep its balance, and had the ability to lock its joints in place, which meant that when I started to tumble forward, the suit knew what to do. Its knee and hip joints locked, and it felt a lot like I'd done a belly flop into a dry pool but I stayed upright, arms flung outward, as everything collapsed around me. My helmet rang like a gong as a metal strut glanced off it, and stars swam across my vision. Shit, I blurted, blowing any chance of making everyone else think I'd meant to do that. You okay, sir? Quinn said. He was bounding toward me with long, loping steps, and I was sure the concern in his voice was matched in the look on his face and it reminded me way too much of an adult child running to help their elderly grandparent. I'm fine, Quinn, and if you don't stop treating me like a geriatric case, I'm going to think up a really nasty nickname for you and make it stick, you hear me? Roger that, sir. But he still kept coming, stopping when he got to the edge of the jagged hole in the ground and peering over it. Is there anything in there worth the effort? I frowned. 
wondering why I couldn't see the squared-off shape in the center as well as before. Then saw the flashing red warning light in my HUD. The falling metal beam had knocked out my external lamp, which was one of the few parts of the suit fragile enough to be wrecked by a falling metal strut. I still had thermal and infrared, but neither was enough to give me a detailed look at the... thing. Shine your headlamp down there, Quinn, I told him. Visible light. By the glow of his suit's light, I could just make out a shape in the front of the block. The gray stone had been exposed where the vibration from the cave-in had swept the dirt off one side of the thing, and I was struck by the impression that the block was some kind of marker or monument, like the one in the park on Croaton. Not anywhere near the same size, of course. This one was maybe seven or eight feet tall and half that in width, but it seemed to be carved from a single stone, like the monument in New Roanoke. But there was too much damn dirt caked on the front for me to make out what was carved into it, and there was no fucking way I was going to climb down there and try to clean it off. You got a flashbang on you, Quinn? I wondered. The Svalin came equipped with an integral grenade launcher, but mine was loaded entirely with anti-personnel frag. Um, yes, sir, I think I have two in the mag. Why? Fire one directly at the front of that rock. Are you sure you're okay, sir? I scowled, and I wished it hadn't been so damned cold and poisonous outside, because I really wanted to open my visor and share the scowl with Quinn. Just do it, Davy Crockett. He didn't move, and although I couldn't see his eyes, I knew he was staring at me in horror. Tell me that's not going to be my nickname, sir. I swear to God it will be, if you don't fire that grenade in the next ten seconds. What's going on over here? Pops asked, coming up behind us. You getting into trouble again, sir? Davy Crockett here was about to launch a flashbang at the front of this rock to clear off the dirt so I can see what's carved into it. Who the fuck is Davy Crockett? Pops asked. Damn, so much for that nickname. It had been the only famous hunter I could think of off the top of my head. All right, sir, Quinn said, still sounding doubtful as his grenade launcher unfolded from over his left shoulder. Maybe you should step back, though? If this suit can't take a flashbang, I told him, then I probably shouldn't be wearing it in combat, Hawkeye. Hawkeye? Pops repeated. He ain't shooting a bow and arrow, sir. I seethed in the privacy of my helmet. James Fenimore Cooper, Pops, last of the Mohicans. Oh, that old movie with Daniel Day-Lewis? I love that flick. Yeah, that one. Hawkeye was the name of the main character, because he was a hunter, like Quinn here, and that elk he helped me kill. It's a reach, sir. These things can't be rushed. Firing, Quinn told us. The thump of the launcher was muted, but the concussion from the stun grenade was not. If I hadn't been wearing my helmet, it would have sent me reeling backwards, blinded and deafened and helpless for long minutes. As it was, it sounded like standing next to the speaker at a death metal concert, and I probably should have listened to Quinn and stepped back. My visor had gone dark with the flash part of the whole flashbang equation, but when it cleared, I saw that the idiotic little trick had worked. I didn't feel vindicated, though, because I was too busy feeling stunned. Not from the grenade but from what it had uncovered. Hey, what the hell? Pops murmured. That looks just like... Yeah, Quinn agreed. Just like the one back on Croaton. And it did. The image of the Elder was the same one as we'd seen in Monument Park in New Roanoke, right down to the raised hand and the five fingers. What does it mean, sir? Quinn asked. What it meant was... I needed to let someone smarter than me figure out what it meant. I was about to report the find to the Jambo when General Oliveira beat me to the punch. Andy, you read me? Yes, sir. And we found something interesting down here. Drop it and get everyone back up to the ship ASAP. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and I looked into the gray overcast sky, as if I could see all the way into orbit. What is it, sir? Tavinians? Negative. Not a threat. He paused. At least, we don't think so. But I'll tell you this, whatever interesting thing you found down there, I'll bet you fifty bucks this has it beat. Chapter 11 Do you want that fifty in cash? I asked Michael Oliveira, my eyes glued to the main view screen, unable to look away. Or can I Venmo it to you? It was a ship. 
but not just a ship. The Jambo, or any of the other Helta-designed cruisers, dwarfed anything that humans had ever put into space. The Burj Khalifa turned sideways and converted into a starship. The thing drifting free in space a few miles from us made the Burj Khalifa look like a garden shack. It was the size of an asteroid. And not one of the tiny ones the news always used to talk about with staged alarmism. The ones that were going to pass between the Earth and the Moon and could hit Earth with the force of five Hiroshima bombs. No, this was one of the asteroids we always talked about mining for ore. How the hell did we not see this on the way in? Evans demanded, sounding outraged, as if the tactical officer owed him a personal apology. Oliveira stepped in, not letting Graciano fall on his sword for the colonel. It's in an eccentric orbit that takes it into the inner system once every few hundred years. It's a minor miracle we spotted it at all. He eyed the ranger officer balefully. Contrary to what you might think, Brady, even health technology isn't magic, and that thing out there isn't emitting any heat or EM signature. And I could see where it wouldn't be. It was pitch black, which made no sense for a spaceship. Even Helta ships had to shed heat somehow. And one of the simplest ways to do that was to make the skin of the hull reflective, which not only reflected back sunlight to keep it from heating up the ship, it also offered some protection from laser weapons. Even if it hadn't been, as far out as we were from the system's primary star, it wouldn't have been reflecting much light. The computer was enhancing the view of the ship for us, filling in details from what the sensors picked up, and the picture it showed was of a corpse. The hull might once have been smooth, polished like glass, but that had been decades ago, perhaps centuries. Meteor impacts had left it pockmarked, the signs of age and abandonment, but it bore other scars than those. Gashes were torn in her side, some of them big enough to fly the jambo into and I didn't even want to think about what could have blown a hole that big in the side of a ship that huge. Anu, I said, tearing my gaze away from the screen long enough to meet the Skrith's eyes. Have you ever heard of anything like this? I had not known previously what a Skrith would look like when he was dumbfounded, but I did now. It was a lot like the look my old German shepherd used to get when he saw himself in a mirror. I had not known such a ship was even possible, Andy. I am no engineer, but when I think of the power needed to shunt something so large into hyperspace, it is inconceivable. You keep using that word, Julie murmured. I do not think it means what you think it means. Colonel Nieves, Oliveira chided. You've been married to Clanton less than six months, and you're already acquiring his bad habits. Have we sent out drones? I asked, shooting Julie a smile. It wasn't my favorite movie, but it was a classic. We have, and gunfighters four and five have done close flybys. But all we can tell is that it's dead. The drones can get in through the gaps in the hull, but we lose radio contact once they're inside. I want to send the scientific team inside, but I don't want them to go alone. Of course not, I agreed. We'll go along and escort them. I saw Evans starting to boil over, so I expounded before he had the chance to explode. And we'll take a platoon of Colonel Evans' rangers as security for the docking point. I'll lead them myself, the man said, as if there'd ever been any question about it. We could be ready within the hour. Who's going with the scientific team, I wondered. I know you won't be crazy about the idea, Oliveira said, offering me an apologetic look. But I think it's time we got our friends involved. I groaned. Do we have to... This certainly serves to stimulate the limbic system, Major Clanton. I frowned at the translation, wondering how accurate it was. It couldn't be perfect, since the Chamblisi spoke not just with sound waves, but with flashes of color from cells in their skin, not to mention an unimaginable body language. And Shine's light in a fog was wrapped in the damnedest spacesuit I had ever seen. How do you fit an octopus in a spacesuit? very carefully. Only this wasn't the punchline to a bad joke. It was the reality I had to deal with. And I also had to deal with the fact that even the best Helta translators couldn't adequately convey the emotional subtleties of the Chamblisi language. It certainly does, I replied, deciding bland agreement was the safest choice. 
I offered the humanoid octopus a smile, hoping it wouldn't take the gesture as a threat or a sexual come-on. I'm sorry you and your team haven't had a chance to get your feet wet until now, but there wasn't much high-level physics needed for knights on horseback. There may be an error in the translation, shines light in a fog, ventured, her upper tentacles waving like she was conducting three symphonies at once. I do not have what you would call feet, and I am unsure why, if I did, I would wish to get them wet. It is human idiom, the helta in the acceleration couch beside the Chamblisi explained. Ban So was not quite as hip to the ins and outs of our language as the late and very lamented Junpa had been, but he'd been working with us for nearly a year now, and he was the least objectionable of the Alliance research team, though that wasn't saying much. He's apologizing for not letting us off the ship until now. Shine's light in the fog said nothing regarding me with those teacup-sized black eyes, which seemed magnified by the bubble helmet that was the only sort capable of covering their bony, bulbous heads. Were you under the impression, she asked finally, that I wished to leave the safety of the ship and expose myself to the threats out here in the wild lands? Well, not when you put it that way. Shri Salasa, the Vironian tech sitting beside her, said nothing which was very Vironian of him. I had managed to spend almost no time with any of the research team in the entire voyage, and there was a reason for that. They creeped me the hell out. Well, maybe not Bon So. He didn't creep me out so much as piss me off with his snooty, we had the hyperdrive and fusion reactors and you didn't attitude. We're about to duck, Major Lee told me. He didn't turn in his seat to do it, the way I might have, because he'd been a pilot long enough to have killed that instinct, whereas I'd been a rifle platoon leader and was used to looking at people when I talked to them. I eyed the jagged edges of the hull passing by on either side of us, yards thick, and felt my balls retracting into my stomach. I don't know if I'd call it docking, I told him, so much as spelunking. The ship abruptly lurched, and I felt like I was about to fall over despite the harness holding my svalen firmly in its oversized seat. Profanity filled my earphones, but the only curse words I was interested in were coming from Lee and his co-pilot, Lieutenant Chatworth. There's fucking gravity in here, the co-pilot exclaimed, his British accent strong and dripping with working-class grit and oh-so-fucking-right. I was used to the freefall by now, though not a fan and the sudden cessation of it was jarring, like the hypnic jerk of waking up from half-sleep and thinking you were falling. I clenched my fists instinctively and crumpled the metal armrests beneath the enhanced grip of my gloves. Watch that shit, Andy, Lee snapped without turning, just knowing somehow who it was and what I'd done. You break this bird, it's coming out of your fucking salary. When he spoke again, it was over the radio not to me directly, though I heard it because I was tapped into his command feed. Jambo, this is Gunfighter 1. We have artificial gravity active inside the ship. Are you sure you're not picking up any energy signatures? Over. The answer wasn't immediate, which probably meant that Oliveira was yelling at Graziano to double-check his readings. The belly jets on Gunfighter 1 were burning, fighting against the pull inside the ship, but we were still moving forward at a crawl cat-footing our way into this ultra-tech cave in space. And a cave it was, dark as the inside of a dog, to borrow a line from Groucho Marx. Gunfighter One's external lights played over the blackened remains of whatever had been inside this section of the ship, twisted and melted and unrecognizable. That's affirmative, Gunfighter One, Shaw told us, passing the message on from a debate between Graziano and Oliveira that I could still hear going on in the background. However, be advised, the hull is thick enough that there might be some sort of auxiliary battery still active that just aren't putting out enough heat to register. Over. Now they tell us, I murmured. Roger that, Jambo, Lee replied. We are proceeding. Out. There ain't a damn inch of flat ground to sit down on here, Chatworth commented, fingers scrolling across his station's touchscreen the views from the belly and wing cameras of the shuttle stitching together a complete picture of the interior of the ship. He was right again. The deck plates were a hundred feet or more below us, but they were ripped apart in a line even with the gap in the hull. 
Whatever had penetrated five or six feet of their hull had kept going straight through the interior of the ship, and I didn't see any end to it. It had blasted a hole through the bulkhead on the opposite side of the huge compartment, and the metal that wasn't shredded had run like a chocolate fountain before congealing again into uneven terraces. Try to starboard, I suggested. This time, Lee did turn in his seat and stare at me. Try what? The Space Force officer asked. Don't fuck with me, Phil, I warned him. I know you've watched Master and Commander at least a dozen times. Try off to the right, damn it. He chuckled as he turned back to the front and spun the shuttle to starboard, dipping the nose to get a better look. There, Chatworth said, pointing at the screen. There's a spot. It wasn't perfectly even. The metal had melted and reformed into gently sloping ocean waves, but they weren't steep enough to keep a craft as tough and versatile as the hammerhead from touching down. Jambo, I'm heading down, Lee reported. Over. Hey, sir, Dog asked me. Do we think there's anyone alive down there? He was sitting behind me, down the steps from the cockpit in the rows of passenger seats, along with the rest of the team, while I was up with the researchers and the flight crew. It was a bit disconcerting that the rest of the team didn't bullshit with me the way Pops, Quinn, and Dog did. Those three knew me from when I was just an advisor, attached to the Delta team but not part of it, not in command of anything but myself. Back then I'd been one of the guys, and no one had been afraid to talk to me. To the others, to the new guys, I was the officer in command of their team, and more than that, a Medal of Honor winner. Thank God they didn't expect me to haul that thing around with me on the Jambo. I wasn't going to wear it again unless someone ordered me to. It's alien, I answered, and it's got working artificial gravity after probably centuries floating out here, so I can't say anything about it for sure. But I tend to think it's abandoned. If there were anything active on the ship, they'd have probably tried to get it out of this wild-ass orbit and back to the shipping lanes. The shipping lanes, Pops repeated. Is that really what we're calling them? I mean, we have this hyperdrive shit, right? People jump in and out wherever. God damn it, I'm starting to wish they'd sent me a SEAL reaction force. At least then, all I would have had to worry about is dealing with their press agents. Hold on, everyone, Lee warned. This is going to be a little rough. He wasn't exaggerating. While the shuttle was certainly capable of landing on the uneven waves of the melted and reformed deck, that didn't mean we were going to enjoy it. I think it was even worse for us in the armor than it was for the research team and the flight crew, since we were carrying around a shitload of mass that they weren't, and had no leverage to let the armor's gyros do their work. The Svalin was tossed back and forth against the restraint web, and I was tossed back and forth inside the armor, and the interior padding couldn't save my brain from taking a beating against the inside of my skull. I barely noticed when the motion stopped and the shuttle's belly jets whined to a halt. Everyone all right? Lee asked, spinning his chair around to face us. Shit, I replied, waiting for my vision to stop swimming. I yanked the quick release for my harness automatically, and the armor was the only reason I didn't fall out of my seat. The shuttle had landed at an angle, not a sharp one, but enough to make walking treacherous. Feels close to Earth normal gravity, which was weird as shit, because there was absolutely no reason it should. Everyone be careful, standing. I glanced back at Lee. He and the rest of the flight crew were in sealed spacesuits, but I could see his face through the transparent visor of his helmet. I'd always thought he looked just like George Takai, but I'd never gotten up the nerve to tell him. I was afraid he'd think it was racist, and I was only saying it because they were both Asian, despite the fact that his family was from Taiwan and the actor had been Japanese. But he did look just like him. We picking up anything but vacuum out there? Negative. I'm going to evacuate the interior of the shuttle and crank open the belly ramp. The crew has enough air for a few hours. We can plug into the cockpit supply to recharge if we need it. So I'm going to keep the shuttle in a vacuum in case the xenomorphs start chasing you and you need our place to run. He raised a finger in warning, but if any of you fuckers have a face hugger, that ramp is closing and you are not riding back with me. The vacuum alarm began sounding, loud and obnoxious, until the fans inside the vents began sucking the air out of the interior of the Aero spacecraft, leaving the warning more subdued as it tried not to blare in my ears through my helmet speakers. Phil, if this is the last time we ever speak, let me tell you now, 
that I love you like a brother. I didn't bother with the steps, just jumped down to the deck below, letting my armor absorb the impact and do the hard work of keeping me upright. The aliens were coming down the short stairway with exaggerated care, as if they thought the slightest wrong move would send them flying and crack their helmets, letting out the air. I was fairly sure the Helta and Shamblisi built their suits better than that, though the transparent bubble around the bulbous octopus head did give me doubts. I'm lowering the ramp, Pops announced, smacking his palm into the physical control. No touchscreens in a vacuum. Quinn, Gregson, you're on point. Everyone else, stay put until they say it's clear. That last was for the researchers, not the Delta team. They might be mostly newbies to our reaction team, but I hoped anyone who'd made it through the CAG selection process was smart enough not to run out headlong into possible enemy gunfire. Only Marines did that shit. Maybe Reaction Force 3 will be Marsoc or Raiders. Then we'll have more than one Space Marine out here. Randy Quinn and Nathan Gregson descended the ramp in a weird leaning backwards stance, trying to keep their balance against the tailward tilt of the shuttle their footfalls eerily silent. I waited for them, standing between the research team and the ramp, just because it was my job, not because I thought there was even the slightest chance one of the aliens would take the risk of rushing out ahead of us. I shifted uncomfortably, knowing on an intellectual level that the armor would keep me upright, but equally convinced by my inner ear that I was about to tip over sideways. All clear out here, Quinn reported. No motion, not reading anything on thermal you can bring them out. All right, then, lady, gentlemen, I said to the aliens, wondering if my sarcasm would translate. Follow me. Chapter 12 It might have been safe outside the shuttle, but it was creepy as hell. This thing reminds me of the Marie Celeste, Pops said. Except for the part where the Marie Celeste was undamaged. Quinn said from the point position about twenty yards ahead of me, and had food still on the table, and was floating in the shipping lanes, and wasn't an alien spaceship. Well, aren't you just Mr. Wizard? Pops cracked. Hey, you know, that ain't bad. Wizard. I think that fits. Shit, Quinn moaned. You kidding me? Just because I knew about the damn Marie Celeste? You know, it's not just that, I told him. You've always been the brightest of the rangers. And I know that's like being the smartest kid on the short bus, but it's something. And believe me, wizard, Pops assured him, there are a lot worse nicknames out there. Welcome to the team, wizard, Dog said from the rear guard. And you should feel privileged. It took me four fucking months to get a name. And when I did, it was because I ate one fucking bite of roasted dog meat that these locals offered me. One bite! I didn't tell them to quiet down for a couple reasons. One, of course, that no one could hear it through our helmets in the vacuum, even if there was anyone or anything left around to hear it. And two, they were absolute professionals, who wouldn't let the banter distract them from their jobs. And three, of course, we were on a different network than the scientists, who wouldn't have understood the byplay even if they'd been human. I tried to shut it out and concentrate on the massive, cavernous interior of the spaceship, it had been a shock to the system the first time I'd boarded the Truth Seeker, Junpa's Helta Cruiser. Stunning to think of a ship so large that they didn't have to worry about efficiently maximizing their space. But by comparison to this thing, a Helta Cruiser was a hammerhead shuttle. And yet, whatever had traversed them, cargo or vehicles or giant space monsters, they were dead and empty now. We got an intersection up here, Quinn reported, as if we couldn't all see it. I moved up to the front to check it out, and to my surprise, Shine's light in a fog came with me. The corridor we'd landed in ran the width of the craft, if I remembered right from our approach, which meant this one ran the length, and this one wasn't empty. Devastation filled it. I couldn't say what the vast compartments on either side of the miles-long corridor once held, but whatever it was had been charred to ash, along with most of the facing walls. No, not just charred, I decided. Melted. Like the floor of the level where we'd landed. And that wasn't the weirdest thing about it. Where the hell is that light coming from? I asked. It had taken me a second to realize it. 
My helmet optics turned the darkness into twilight using the data it took from our headlamps, the infrared filters, and sonic and laser mapping, turning it into CGI so realistic every movie studio in the world would have killed for it. But I thought it had grown brighter when we came to the intersection. When I flicked off my headlamp just to check it out, my hunch was confirmed. There was a background glow that seemed to come from everywhere at once. Not daylight bright, but enough to see by even without the helmet's enhancements. I believe there is something built into the bulkheads, Shine's light in a fog told me, shuffling up beside us, the undulating motion of her reinforced leg tentacles clawing at my nerves like fingernails on a chalkboard. I fought an instinct to move away from her, worried she'd notice and take offense. I can't say for sure, but... I don't believe it is electrically generated, perhaps a bioluminescence, though how it would last this long is a mystery. Which way? Quinn, no, wizard, asked, motioning up and down the corridor. (laughs) Corridor, hell, it's large enough to be a city street. I might have been forgiven for exaggerating under the circumstances, but if anything, I was understating it. Twenty yards across, fifty yards high, miles long. This wasn't a spaceship, it was a space city that just happened to be capable of traveling from place to place. And one direction looked about as bad as the other, except... Is it my imagination, I said, or does the corridor get narrower down that way? I squinted, and the helmet's HUD zoomed in at the motion of my eye, bringing the distant end of the street into focus. It might or might not have been narrower, but the destruction abated several hundred yards down and what had seemed to be the corridor closing in had simply been an illusion because the walls were more or less intact. That way, I decided. You know, Major Clanton, Shine's light in a fog said, her voice sounding almost pleasant through the translator, particularly when I didn't have to look at his cephalopod head. You do the sort of damage we have seen here would require an energy weapon as powerful as the main gun on a Helta cruiser. Such a weapon would require the output of a fusion reactor. But there's no gaps in the hull here, I said, grabbing onto his line of reasoning and pulling myself along. So no ship did this. I decided I was going to start calling the Chamblisi Foggy, because Shine's light in the fog was wearing me out just to think about it. Damned pretentious octopuses, octopi, whatever. Maybe a tank or something, Wizard suggested, justifying his nickname. There's room for one in here. I suppose it's more comforting to think of a fusion reactor as powerful as the one in our cruiser fitting onto a tank, I allowed, than to try to imagine someone carrying it around in a man-portable weapon. But only just. I wished there had been air. And not just because I would have felt less isolated and claustrophobic if there'd been the possibility of opening my visor and taking a deep breath. I wish there had been air, because this place was so empty and hollow, it felt as if I should be able to hear the echo of our footsteps through its halls. To hear nothing but the dull thump up through the soles of my feet was worse somehow. It was getting to the rest of the team, too. I could tell because they weren't talking, weren't bullshitting. Army Special Forces are known as the quiet professionals, and they are to everyone else, but in private, they can bullshit with the best of them and it didn't get any more private than our own comm channel inside sealed helmets in a vacuum. But no one said a word, and the sound of my own breath drowned out the gentle whir and hum of the Svalin servo motors. One breath per step, slow, because we had to stay at the same pace as the aliens. And while I had read reports that even the Chamblisi could be deceptively fast, apparently Foggy was not a sprinter. We got maybe... Eight hours of air in these suits, Pops reminded me. Don't let these alien eggheads get so wrapped up in this shit that they don't have time to get back to the shuttle. Yes, mother, I turned and shot him a baleful glare. Science fiction writer, remember? I know all about running out of air. I was being harsh. It was his job to remind me of things I should be smart enough to remember. But I was as tense as anyone else. I'd apologize later. Right now, I was concentrating on the wreckage. Wizard and Gregson were out ahead of us, checking each of the ruined compartments. 
shining the visible light from the headlamps into the lava cave, reflections off sharp ridges teasing at the corner of my vision and disappearing when I looked at them straight on. Nothing in any of these, Gregson said. He was a terse, grim-faced senior NCO, and I had the feeling he would eventually wind up with a moniker like Crank or Grouch, or maybe Oscar, which would be a wittier way to call him a Grouch without being obvious. I made a mental note to suggest the nickname to Pops, and filed it away behind all the more important things. I think this place is a dry hole. Pick up the pace, wizard, I told Quinn, relishing rubbing in the new nickname while it still rankled him. Get us to the intact buildings down the road. Don't bother stopping unless you see something. Buildings, I'd said. Down the road. It had been a slip, but the more we walked, the more that reality overlaid itself on the situation, masking the fact that we were on a spaceship drifting through the middle of nowhere. The jet-black surface of the walkway could have been pavement. The compartments that stretched from deck to overhead 50 meters up could have been a stretch of downtown buildings on some alien world. And the background light only reinforced the illusion, turning the whole thing into an early evening scene from any town USA. It didn't help that the front walls of the compartments were straight up and down, with broad doorways at the deck level and walkways on what seemed to be a second floor going across from one side to the other. It was a setup I wouldn't have expected on a Helta or a Skrith world, and though God alone knew how the Shamblisi lived, I didn't see this as their kind of place. I pictured them building their cities by the shore, their living rooms a foot deep in seawater, though I was probably being silly. I was also likely being anthropocentric in my thinking, a term I'd never even heard, until a State Department dweeb had accused me of that cardinal sin during a conference with the President. Sure, this seemed like a very human sort of place to me, but it could also be a case of form following function. Checking the left side first, Wizard announced. Nah, this just isn't going to work. I will never be able to think of him as anything but Quinn. Damn. The first door on the left was wide open, but the interior apparently lacked the ever-present light of the ship's bulkheads on this level because it was pitch black and I couldn't make out anything but shadow on the inside. Quinn waited for Gregory to set up in a covering position. Then he ducked into the open doorway. Circles of light flickered from left to right as he scanned the interior with his headlamp. My grip tightened just slightly on my KE rifle, though I don't know what I was expecting to shoot here in a vacuum. Clear, Quinn announced, but there was a strange note to his voice. But we got bodies in here, boss. You need to come take a look. You need to come take a look. That was almost never a good thing. Do you wish us to accompany you, Major Clanton? Foggy asked me. She was damn talkative for an octopus. She even sounded eager, now that she knew we'd only be examining bodies, not any sort of living threat. Sure, I said, but stay behind me. There may not be any bad guys inside, but that doesn't mean we couldn't have a collapsed section of decking. And yes, I was just saying that to make her nervous, because I still held a grudge against the Chamblisi. Bastards voted against including Earth and the Alliance after I saved their asses from a Tavinian assassination attempt, just because we looked like their enemies. Damn speciest octopus assholes. Gregson, you're inside with us. Pops, keep the others out here for now. Roger that, sir. There was not a glint of light coming from inside the compartment that wasn't from our headlamps but the combination of the three of us looking back and forth was enough for the computer enhancement to give me a good picture of my surroundings. I don't know why I expected the inside of the building to be a single large room. Maybe because of how vast and open everything else had been. But whatever the original function of this place, it was split into smaller sections, and the entrance was a narrow hallway, made even narrower by scattered and strewn metal cylinders. I didn't know what they'd been used for originally, but by their angle and the way some of them were still partially stacked one atop the other, I was fairly certain they'd been repurposed into a barricade, and they hadn't worked. The first body was just inside the doorway through the hallway to the larger room on the other side. Determining the cause of death wouldn't require a medical examiner. A hole the size of a dinner plate was burned through his chest opening him up like an anatomy dummy. Though this one had been caught in a fire, its insides burned to vapor or charred black before they were flash-frozen. I was thinking he, but that was just a guess. 
I couldn't even say for sure what species the corpse was, because whatever had burned the hole through his chest had also fried the skin off his head and cracked the skull into bits. The thing was humanoid, but I couldn't hazard a guess beyond that. The Helta and Skrith had bodies that looked very much like a human's, thanks to the genetic meddling of the elders. But what was left of this body was shrunken and mummified inside the charred rags of the baby blue clothes he'd been wearing. Energy weapons, Foggy deduced. And I regretted that not only could she not see my rolling eyes, but she wouldn't know what they meant if she could. Nor would she likely understand what Captain Obvious meant. So there was no point in telling the joke. I stepped over the burned and frozen corpse into the larger room behind it, where Quinn and Gregory had moved. The walls were bare, but there were protrusions at the ceiling and the floor, and I wondered if they were projectors of some sort. The Helta cruisers had haptic holograms at their control stations, and whoever built this place was at least more ambitious than the Helta, if not more technologically advanced. So it wasn't impossible that they used the same system for everything, not just spaceship controls. Then I saw the bodies on the floor at Quinn's feet and forgot all about the walls and possible holograms and just about everything else. There were four of them, and three were even more mangled than the one in the hallway, missing limbs, even a head in one case, and I couldn't make out any more from them except the weapon. I knew it was a weapon, though I wasn't sure how. Maybe it was instinct, maybe it was experience, but the thing was oblong with what looked like grips designed for a humanoid hand, and though I couldn't have sworn to where the trigger was or if it had one, I would have testified in court that it was a rifle. It pulled my eye to it, distracting me for a moment from the last body, until Quinn's light played across it, and I couldn't ignore it any longer. He was intact, and it wasn't clear what had killed him, though he was remarkably well preserved by the hard vacuum. He might have died ten days ago or ten centuries, there was no way of knowing. His clothes were the same shade of blue as the others, a jumpsuit of some kind, though the sleeves and pant legs were loose and blousy. And he was human, as human as Quinn or Pops or me. Well now, I murmured, that sure puts a different spin on things. Chapter 13 He's human, Ashley Haskett declared. No oh, shit, Doc. I sighed, giving her the eye roll I'd wanted to deliver to Foggy a few hours before. Oh, I know, she said, chuckling, looking back over her shoulder at me. We live in a galaxy with talking bears, walking octopi, and intelligent wolves. I wouldn't put it past our elder benefactors to fuck around with the genes of a rhesus monkey in some half-assed attempt to recreate humanity. I blinked, staring at her. Haskett looked as young as any of us, but I happened to know from reading her file that she was in her late sixties and had been rather matronly before the intervention of the Helta life extension meds. It felt odd hearing her curse like a sailor. She must have noticed my expression because she laughed. My father was a marine, Major Clanton, she informed me, and so were both of my brothers and my older sister. My mother spent most of my formative years in a futile attempt at keeping me from hearing profanity, but as you can tell, it didn't stick. Shouldn't we be in some kind of clean room? Julie asked, ignoring the back and forth. I think she'd learned to ignore my chatter over the last couple years, since it was pretty much incessant. I mean, if he's human, he could have human germs and shit, right? Colonel, Haskett said, waving a hand at the body laid open before her on the dissection table. This poor fellow has been frozen and vacuum-sealed for somewhere around four hundred years. There ain't nothing in him that lived through that, and if there was, a clean room wouldn't stop it. I wasn't even sure if the Jambo had a clean room, but the bio-research lab would have been the place for it. It was spacious, outfitted with the latest health attack because they were the bears to see for biotechnology— I'd always thought they were the physics kings, too, but it turned out the Shamblisi were actually better at it, which only strengthened my suspicion that the Helta had been gifted the hyperdrive by the elders at some point. I don't know that there had ever been more people crammed into the lab, though, and Haskett had surely never had as big of an audience for an autopsy. Besides Julie and I, Olivero was there, and so was Anonim Claus. 
He hadn't said a word, and I had the sense that this whole thing bothered him a good deal more than it fascinated him. He hadn't even objected to the whole intelligent wolves crack, so I knew he wasn't on his game. What else can you tell us, Dr. Haskett? Oliveira interjected, with a sort of half-sigh that slipped out whenever he got annoyed with me. He's human, she repeated. Modern human, but... She rubbed a finger across her chin, staring at the readout on one of the health scanners. I raised an eyebrow at the hesitation. Haskett didn't strike me as the type to be easily impressed. What, does he have the X gene? A high midichlorian count? You know the health of drugs we're using for life extension? she said, tracing a spiral pattern with her fingers. You know how it alters our DNA, adds telomeres to our genes? It's been explained to me, I allowed. I can't swear to how much I really understand on anything deeper than a pop science level. I have a layman's understanding of physics, but genetics... I shook my head. She smiled thinly. I took the health treatment, obviously. You know that if you've looked at my file and seen my age. Its upsides far outweigh any downsides. But there are downsides to it. There are? My voice may or may not have squeaked in panic. I'd been counting on that treatment to not turn me into some sort of three-headed monster, and I very much hoped Haskett wasn't about to dash that dream. Nothing drastic, she assured me. Nothing on a personal level, more existential. Relevance, Dr. Haskett, Oliveira asked in gentle reproof. The hell to treatment changes our DNA. Not a huge change, nothing that's going to make us sterile or move things with our minds or grow gills, but it is a change. We regrow our telomeres now, permanently as close as I can tell. And since that sort of endless recopying of our DNA would inevitably lead to cancers, the treatment also changes our genetics to make it easier for our body to identify and destroy cancer cells. Again, all wonderful things, but eventually... It's going to speciate us. She nodded toward Anu. Not to the extent that the elders speciated your people from their genetic ancestors, Ambassador Anu Nim Klaas, but to a point where some day, a few centuries from now, anyone who's descended from us won't be able to reproduce with someone from the original line. The genetic differences will cause major problems, she shrugged. Well, by then we should be able to correct it technologically, but you see what I mean. We're changing humanity on an existential level, like GMO crops. Another advance I support, because it makes sense, but it also brings about the troubling possibility of making the original crop line extinct. She stepped around the other side of the table and gestured at the body. It was gray, and looked very inhuman with its chest split wide open, and the top of its skull cut off. This guy is human but he and I couldn't have had a baby together because his line of humanity has been changed genetically the same way we have, but for much longer. Not just hundreds of years, thousands, maybe tens of thousands. That would make them the first, Anu said quietly. At my confused frown, he expounded. It would make them the first ones taken by the elders, before any of us in the Alliance. Which I suppose makes sense, Oliveira mused, given the level of technology on that ship. Any cybernetic implants in him? I wondered. Oliveira shot me a questioning look. Just a thought, sir. If they were that advanced, I wondered if they might have something like the Neuralink thing someone was working on a few years back. Maybe some sort of computer backup for their memories, even. Which would be damned handy for us figuring out who the hell these guys are and what killed them all. I had the same idea, Haskett admitted, but no joy. If there's anything implanted in this guy, it's nothing that shows up on the scanners. And those are Helter scanners, so they're pretty sensitive. That doesn't mean they didn't have the technology, just that he wasn't carrying any of it. If they find any more intact bodies over there, I can run scans on them as well, of course. I'm surprised you let Evans take over for you, Julie told me. It wasn't easy. But once we saw this guy, I knew I had to get him back here. I shrugged. Besides, now he and the rangers get to be the ones to put up with Foggy. Foggy? Oliveira repeated, arching an eyebrow at me. Oh, come on, I pled. I am not going to say, shines light in a fog, every time I talk about the girl. If they want to work with us, they can put up with nicknames. I waved it away. Anyway, it's creepy as hell over there, and my team spent four hours rummaging around in that shit. 
The research team didn't mind, Julie reminded me, jabbing an elbow into my ribs. They just switched out their air tanks and went right back in. We'll relieve the rangers once we've had a break. And some food, which I haven't had yet, and I'm starving. She made a face at me, motioning towards the corpsicle. How the hell can you be hungry with that guy split open on a table? You were a pilot, not a marine. In Caracas, during the war, if you were out on an FOB, there were bodies everywhere and no one to bury them. I let the words trail off. I had managed not to think about Venezuela for months now. Then I'd let myself get dragged right back into it. Julie slipped an arm around me and squeezed just slightly. General Oliveira? The call came over the lab's PA speakers, which I found odd. Why hadn't Shaw simply contacted Oliveira on his earbud? Oliveira must have had the same thought, because his brow was furled as he touched the button on the wall to answer the hail. Yes? Sir, we're getting a transmission from Gunfighter 2, a relay from the teams on the unknown vessel. They found another body. Well, that's no surprise, I commented, still wondering why he'd bothered with the PA system. There had to have been at least a couple dozen. No, sir, not like this one. Take a look at the monitor screen. I'm patching the video they sent through. Which was why, I finally understood, he'd called on the PA. It was so he could patch into the compartment's main display screen, which was six feet by four feet and took up most of one bulkhead. The image that was projected there from the relay call was from a different section than the one my team had been searching. The halls were narrower, the ceilings lower, and the whole thing gave off a more industrial feel to it though I couldn't have pointed to any one piece of the background that gave me that impression. At first, I couldn't see the thing, not because of the shadow or the picture quality, but just because my eyes wanted to slide off of it. It was unfamiliar, alien, in a way that even the Chamblisi could never match. They looked like something familiar. And if I wasn't used to seeing humanoid octopi that could walk and talk and stand upright, well, at least I was used to seeing octopi. I had something, a base to draw from, a starting point. This thing. Going by the size of the Svalen armor of the ranger who was pacing around the edges of the image for scale, the thing was maybe twelve feet long, and would have stood about eight feet tall if the torso worked the way I thought it did. Four rear legs, at least I wanted to call them legs, though they didn't resemble any legs I'd ever seen or even tentacles. They were stick-like. If the stick was two feet across and covered in barbs, four front legs, or maybe arms, the ends of them were something that looked like the pincers on a crab, if the pincers had also come equipped with opposable digits. At that point, I might have been willing to say it brought to mind a crustacean or an insect, until I got to the head. If it was a head, if it had a head. What I was assuming was the skull was bulbous and bony. And if there were eyes or ears or antenna, I couldn't make them out. What the thing did have, what I was able to identify when nothing else made sense, was a weapon. It was still gripped in both sets of right arms, oblong, cylindrical, its emitter maw gaping. The thought that the thing was intelligent enough to wield a weapon was even more intimidating than the realization that it had existed at all. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph... Oliveira swore softly, which was more than I could manage. I was dumbstruck. The fucking elders didn't build that from anything on Earth, Julie said in grim declaration. Colonel Evans' voice spoke over the recording, and I wasn't sure if his tone was awestruck or just proud that his team had found the thing. This is down in what I think is some kind of hangar bay, he said. At least there was the wreckage of what could be shuttles of some kind. There were three of the human bodies trapped underneath this thing, just ripped apart. Whatever it is, it's what they were fighting, what killed them all, or ones like it. They're waiting for orders, sir, Shaw reported, once the recording had ended. Oliveira didn't answer immediately, his expression still slack, as if he was utterly stunned. I knew how he felt. I should have been expecting it. Everything we'd seen until now had hinted that there was a reason the elders had left, something that had threatened even a species as old and technologically advanced as them. But whatever I'd imagined, this wasn't it. Bring all the teams back to the Jambo, Oliveira finally replied. We can send more over later, but I want to make sure we're not overlooking something. For all we know, there are a million of those things, 
and they can come back to life like all those ancient bacteria they found buried thousands of feet under the ground. He turned to Haskett. I assume you want it brought on board? You assume correctly, General, Haskett told him. The corner of her mouth turned up. And this time, I think I'm going to take you up on that clean room. Chapter 14 The conference room wasn't big enough. I thought it was funny, because Michael Oliveira had griped incessantly about what a waste the compartment was. How this was a spacecraft, not a convention center. And just because we had space to waste didn't mean we should be wasting space and a dozen other platitudes worthy of my father. And yet, here we were, with what seemed like half the ship's crew jammed into the conference room shoulder to shoulder. And even though they could have seen this presentation remotely at their stations or in their compartments via video, I didn't blame them for wanting to be here in person. This was history being made. At ease! The bellow was from Chief Master Sergeant Danielson, the senior NCO on the ship. I didn't know him well, had barely talked to him since our paths didn't cross very often, but he didn't like me at all. I kept calling him Chief, and he kept reminding me that this wasn't the Navy and the Space Force doesn't have Chief Petty Officers. He did have an impressive set of lungs, though, and his order cut through the chatter and buzz like a foghorn, even majors and colonels falling silent. Oliveira stepped up to the podium at the center of the room, and I leaned back in my seat at the table beside him and watched just as rapt in my attention as the rest of the crew, even though I knew most of what he was going to say. Julie was next to me on the left, Anu on the right, and lined up on the other side of the podium were Dr. Haskett and the Alliance research team. I wasn't sure of the why of all this, honestly, since I was neither Navy nor Space Force, and knew exactly nothing about running a ship, either surface or space. But Oliveira had assured me that it was necessary for morale. Pops had called it rumor control and I at least understood that concept. Ladies and gentlemen, Oliveira said, hands clasped behind his back. I know there's been a lot of talk about what we found on the derelict vessel. There was an audio pickup built into the podium, invisible from the outside, and it was amplifying his voice. I thought it was superfluous, that he could have achieved the same effect by simply projecting when he spoke. But I suppose it would have been a strain, and he couldn't take the risk of his voice giving out just when he had to give some crucial order, like sending a specialist to go grab him coffee. Now, I could have simply let you read the reports, but I was an enlisted man once. Yeah, in the Air National Guard, in college, for a year. But why dispel his illusion? I understand that stories are flying back and forth, and I want you to hear this from me, and from our scientific team. Oliveira touched a control on his data link, and the holographic display tank flickered to life behind him, six feet tall and three feet wide. Projected inside it was an image of one of the corpses they'd discovered, thankfully not the dissected one. He was still a gruesome sight, his skin tight and dried out, his eyes wide open, staring like a zombie, mouth frozen for eternity in a final grimace of death. I'm sure you've heard rumors about this, and they're true. The crew of this ship was human, but they weren't Tavinians and they weren't Croatoans. We don't know their origin, but every indication is they were part of an advanced high-tech civilization for thousands of years, perhaps even before the creation of the Alliance races by the Elders. Our physics and engineering experts from the Alliance can describe what they found from examining the ship's engineering section. Shines light in a fog? The Chamblisi stood, and the low buzz at the sight of the octopod couldn't be entirely quelled, even by a dirty look from Danielson. Esteemed colleagues, respected leaders, and dutiful members of the military, I am called Shine's Light in a Fog, for that is my mission, to shine the light of reason through the fog of fear and superstition, and though I take this task as my sacred duty, it was a difficult road to walk in this case, for there is much to be fearful and superstitious about. Oh, good. Way to settle everyone's nerves there, Foggy. With that said, I will tell you what our investigation has uncovered. The derelict has a hyperdrive core 
that is almost identical in design to the one used by the Alliance, though it is nearly ten times the size of the drive core in this cruiser. The image changed from the corpse to a full-length shot of the derelict, which then cut away to the computer animation, showing the twisted coil of a hyperdrive core running through the center of the ship. A drive core of this size would require an incredible power source, a fusion reactor as big as the entire ship. It does not have such a reactor, of course, nor does it seem to have any sort of fusion reactor. Indeed, we have no definitive answer as to how the ship generates power, though my esteemed colleague Baden So has a theory that the builders of the ship, whoever they may have been, somehow discovered a way to extract energy directly from hyperspace. If this proves to be true, it would revolutionize not just ship design, but would change the entire structure of our societies. We would have unlimited energy, not constrained by the size of the reactor, not dependent on fuel pellets. You say whoever built the ship shines light in a fog, Dr. Haskett interjected, raising a hand to interrupt. You don't believe the human crew built it? I do not. We, the Chamblisi, have accepted the hypothesis you humans have presented that the hyperdrive was introduced by the elders, not developed independently by the Helta. Given this, and even considering that these humans were taken from Earth at the same approximate time period that our races were created, there is no reason to think they could reach this level of technological advancement in the same amount of time without help from the elders. Fair enough, I murmured aside to Julie, but he's not considering the possibility that we're just smarter than they are. She snorted a laugh, but I wasn't kidding. Everyone just accepted that the Helta and the Chamblisi were the brains, and we, and to a lesser extent the Scrith, were the brawn. And I guess the Vironians were the... Well, honestly, I hadn't figured out what they were good for except acting as toadies to the Chamblisi. But that was just because the Helta had been given a leg up on everyone else, and had been generous enough to spread it to the others. My opinion was that the whole lot of them were hamstrung by how close they were to their genetic ancestors. The elders had taken the animal and given it brains and opposable thumbs, or tentacles in the case of the Chamblisi, but they hadn't clawed their way up through the food chain like humans had. It had given us a gene-deep desperation to our endeavors, a feeling that everything we worked on was crucial to our own individual survival. And when Junpa and his friends had handed us high-temperature superconductors and hyperdrive cores a couple years ago, we hadn't taken them and just built what they taught us, we'd built the Svalins and the KE rifles and the impulse guns, and God knew what we'd build in twenty years or fifty. We also cannot determine what weapons the ship used, though we have examined the rifles discovered among the human corpses. From what we can tell, they are very similar in design to the plasma projectors the Helta developed as an anti-armor weapon. But unlike those devices, which are meant for single use and require a crew of two or three to transport and deploy, these are small enough to carry even without the powered armor your human military uses. Which brings us back to the second item being sifted through the rumor mill. Olivera interrupted, probably thinking we'd gone too far into the weeds. Another touch on his data link, and the image of the derelict was replaced by the one everyone had come to see. The bug. That's what everyone was calling it. Not that it had much resemblance to an insect, other than the number of limbs. But we had to refer to it somehow, and the bug was as good a name as any. It looked less intimidating in the clean room though the photo had been taken before Dr. Haskett had begun the dissection. The rangers found this, Oliveira waved at the picture, in the hangar bay of the ship. It was the only intact example found on the derelict, though I understand small pieces of the things are everywhere. We have no official name for them yet, 
As for what they are, Dr. Haskett can shed some light on that for us. She seemed to enjoy the spotlight even more than Foggy. Primping, like she remembered what it was like to be a matronly 60-something, and wouldn't have gone back if given the choice, even if it meant non-GMO humans went extinct. First of all, I can tell you what it's not, she began, shining a laser pointer at the image. Despite having eight limbs, it is not any sort of insect. It's also not related to anything else on Earth, and unlike our friends here, she nodded toward the research team, they are not built out of DNA. Their version of a cell information system is based on eight nucleotides rather than four, though it uses the same chemicals as our cells do. This doesn't imply any relation between us, she hastened to add. It may simply be that in anything that we can recognize as life, there are only certain chemicals that are useful for the formation of such structures. She hesitated as if she realized she was beginning to meander. I am not 100% certain that they are entirely biological, she admitted. That is, their bodies are organic, but there's something about their construction that feels wrong, for want of a better term. I have no hard evidence of this, but I would be willing to bet a month's pay that they were engineered, perhaps even built, would be the word. Their exoskeleton is chitinous, like an insect or an arthropod. But it's also mixed with some material I don't recognize, which may or may not be organic. Whatever it is, it makes it incredibly tough. Did you find anything else significant in your dissection, doctor? Oliveira asked. It was scripted, of course. He knew exactly what else she'd discovered, and we'd spent hours going over the implications of it. Yes. This creature is, well... If not female, because we don't know if they're sexually dimorphic, then at least capable of reproducing. Its thorax was filled with what I believe are eggs, and I can't believe they would send the thing into battle if it was especially vulnerable. So they probably all are basically pregnant and can produce young at will. Well, fuck. I couldn't tell who'd said it, but I chuckled, because that had been my exact reaction to the news. They are, of course, extremely strong, as you can probably tell from the size. If I had to estimate, I would put them on par with the Svalen armor. And they'd have to be that strong to carry around the weapons you retrieved. Bonso, Oliveira said to the health engineer. You examined the weapons? I did, General. Bonso was short for a male Helta, barely coming up to my chest. So when he stood from his seat, it wasn't much of an improvement. I cannot identify their nature, except that they involve some sort of electromagnetic acceleration. There is no ammunition reservoir of any kind, so I judge they are likely not projectile weapons, which leaves the possibilities of some sort of plasma projector, like the weapons the humans were carrying, or perhaps even something more esoteric, such as a very small particle accelerator Though that would leave us with the question of how exactly they would deal with the thermal blooming and the radiation backscatter. Given the nature of these creatures, Haskett put in, they might simply not be vulnerable to those effects. That's as may be, Oliveira broke in, his tone signaling an end to the briefing. But I think it's all the firm data we have about what we found. Unless there are any questions... A hand went up, and it was perhaps the last person I'd expected to be asking a question. Yes, Major Lee, Oliveira said, a subtle annoyance just barely detectable in his voice. He was pissed that someone had asked a question, likely because there was so little that we actually knew and so many questions we couldn't answer, but he couldn't let anyone know he was annoyed, because what sort of commander wouldn't let his officers ask questions? Did we find any of their shuttles, sir? Okay, I have to admit, that's not a bad question. And it was definitely something Lee would consider. No, Commander. We found no smaller spacecraft intact. There was wreckage that Colonel Evans assumed belonged to smaller spacecraft, but it was barely identifiable. He shrugged. It's possible there are launch bays concealed within the ship in places we simply don't know how to reach. But in the one area which we could positively identify as a hangar bay, the place we found the intact alien, there were no shuttles, no lifeboats, nothing. Then how did the bugs get there, sir? That's a damn good question, Major. 
and one of many we simply can't answer. He looked back and forth, scanning the crowd as if daring anyone else to ask a question. All right, that's it for now. He nodded to Danielson. Assembly attention, the master sergeant barked, and the gathered crew members sprang to their feet and braced. I did the same, if just a bit slower, while Julie was the slowest of all, and I still got the feeling she had been looking forward to being a civilian again. The aliens stayed in their seats, and while I couldn't read the expressions of the others, Ban So and Anu both stared at us like we were insane. Dismissed! While the others spilled out of the compartment, Julie sat on the edge of the table, while I stared up at the last image on the holographic projection tank, the bug. I couldn't take my eyes off of it, and the only reason I hadn't spent every second of my time off back in Haskett's lab with it was because she'd gotten tired of tripping over my feet and thrown me out. It is disconcerting, Anu admitted, hearing our utter lack of knowledge spelled out in such detail. Admitting one's ignorance is the beginning of wisdom, Julie quoted. I frowned. Who said that? I did, just now. Weren't you listening? Anu had by now learned not to inquire too deeply into the human sense of humor, since explaining even the simplest jokes took hours of one tangent and digression after another, so he just pushed on with his point. Up until now, our discoveries have been of scientific curiosity, but nothing I would have deemed information vital to the Alliance. This, however, qualifies if anything does. They need to know about these creatures. Even a hyperdimensional communication signal will take weeks to reach the nearest inhabited system, Oliveira lamented. But yes, you're right. It needs to be sent out. I'll file a full report to the president and the joint chief as well. And to the... I squinted at him. What do they call it again? The new version of NATO? Oliveira scowled as he did every time I mentioned the concept, since it meant he would have to deal with foreign officers on Space Force ships for the rest of his career. The Homeworld Defense Coalition. Yeah, that's the one. You should give them a phone call while you're at it. By the way, the bet's still on the table. Twenty bucks says they admit China by the end of the year. China, Anu repeated, bearing his oversized canines. Is that not the rogue nation who tried to make common cause with the Tivinians? They have a new president now, Oliveira said with his very best attempt at diplomacy, which wasn't awfully convincing. They insist that the whole business with the Tivinians was the result of a small cadre of subversives who've been removed from their positions and arrested. Oh, and by the way, Anu, I put in, if you believe that, well... I have some nice oceanfront property I'd like to sell you in the great state of Arizona. I prefer the mountains, Anu insisted. Oliveira didn't even bother to glare this time, just sighed his frustration. The Chinese government has had its dick slapped, Julie said, perhaps sensing that Oliveira and I were about to butt heads on the subject. Not as hot as the Russians, but hot enough. They're greedy, but they're not stupid. They have to see by now that they don't have a chance of turning the tide. The best shot is to worm their way in and try to get the inside track, get a deal for production plants. It's not as good of a deal as running the world, but it's a lot better than the third runner-up. And we'll let them, I said, bitterness curling the words like paper being burned at the edges over a flame. We'll let them get away with it and let their government survive this when we could knock it over with a harsh breath because we always let them. They have a billion and a half people and the largest industrial base in the world, Oliveira reminded me. Had, I corrected him, had the largest industrial base before we got fusion reactors and fabricators. Now nobody needs their fucking industrial base. They're irrelevant, just like the fucking Middle East. We don't need their oil, we don't need China's industry or their money, and we don't need Russia's minerals anymore. We should stop treating them like they can still blackmail the rest of the world economically and start treating them like the arrogant bullies they've always been. It was a damn good thing we didn't have a State Department puke along this time, because their head might have exploded. As it was, Oliveira looked as if he wanted to shush me, but knew it was useless. The aliens knew about our divisions by now and trusted us, sort of, to handle them. You and I don't make policy, 
Olivera said stolidly, arms crossed over his chest. We are policy. Right now, I said, but you're the first starship commander in Earth history. I'd been about to say human history before I realized that wasn't true. The Tavinians had them before us, and these guys on the derelict before them. Not to mention, you're the man who saved not only the Helta, but Earth itself from the Tavinians. I'd be willing to lay odds you'll be president someday. You say that in front of my wife, he warned, expression darkening, and she'll pull out a knife and gut you. Okay, so you don't want to run. You're still the most powerful general in the military right now. You think that's not a political position? You think Crenshaw or whoever comes after him won't listen to you? Julie nudged me in the ribs with her elbow, signaling me that it was time to shut up and drop it. And she was right, of course. Oliveira and I had covered this ground so often, I could have walked it blindfolded. And all I was going to accomplish was pissing him off. What about you, Andy? Well, this was new. I mean, you're a Medal of Honor winner. Oliveira made an arcing motion at my chest, as if hanging the medal around my neck. You're a national hero and a celebrity, with tons of media exposure from your TV show, even before all this. You think I saved Earth or Helta? He scoffed. <laughs> That's not what the public thinks, my friend. Why don't you haul your ass up on stage and run for office? I may have blanched. I couldn't say for sure, and Julie wouldn't tell me, but I certainly felt the blood drain from my face. Do you know how much work that would involve? I demanded, feeling suddenly outraged. How many boring, horrible people I'd have to suck up to? And I'm not fucking doing the whole fancy dress, meet the press, first lady thing either, Julie warned me. Though from the smirk on her face, I could tell she was enjoying giving me shit. If you run for president, I'm going to live in another star system entirely until the whole thing blows over. I am puzzled, Anu admitted. He stood stock still, his head cocked to the side, eyes darting back and forth between us. On our world, at least, positions of leadership in the government are considered a holy duty. Those called according to tradition feel honored and humbled to be selected. And I could believe that as much as I wanted to. It was easy to fall into the trap of putting the aliens of the Alliance on a pedestal because of their advanced technology and relatively peaceful history. But I was far too cynical to think their leaders didn't get into politics with ulterior motives. Hell, Julie had shot the Helta Prime facilitator in the head with my Glock because she'd gone so corrupt that she was about to kill Junpa. That's how it's supposed to be for us as well. Olivera assured Anunim Klaas. Theoretically, I added. Things have a way of getting more and more complicated and less pure the longer they exist. I shrugged. This shit, though? I motioned at the image of the bug. Maybe it's exactly the sort of thing to make everyone understand that there are more important things than landing a cushy corporate job when your term of office ends. You really believe that? Olivera asked, a hint of a smile in his eyes, as if he felt he'd gotten through to me. I'm a science fiction writer, General, I told him, as straight-faced and serious as I could manage, serving on a starship with a bunch of aliens. I can believe almost anything. Chapter 15 How'd we draw the short straw on this one? Pops wondered. Short straw? I repeated, frowning. I thought we drew the long straw. We get off the ship, get to stretch our legs, check out some cool alien stuff. Isn't that why we're all here? Croatan was stretching our legs, he countered, twisting around in the shuttle's passenger seat to face me. That planet with the fancy Persian horses? That was stretching our legs. This shit? He motioned with a gauntleted hand at the display in the rear of the passenger section of Gunfighter 1 to the image of the rocky, lifeless moon and the orange and white gas giant beyond it. This is just another airlock mission where we gotta stew on our own stink the whole time and ride herd on the scientists. He carefully did not motion toward the Alliance research crew. Last time someone had waved at them, I'd had to spend ten minutes explaining to the Vironian that it wasn't a challenge to a death duel. Someone was going to have to check out the energy signature the Jambo detected on this moon, I pointed out. If it turns out to be some weird alien creature again, do you want to listen to Evans crow about how his rangers were the ones to do it? 
because he hasn't shut up yet about the bug. Point, Pops acknowledged, his tone still grudging. But I hate working in a damned vacuum. I think we got a problem, Major Lee said, breaking in on our conversation. He didn't turn to look at me, but the HUD in my suit's helmet was suddenly filled with a magnified image from the Hammerhead's external cameras. The moon was dark, with a low albedo to the sloping cliffs, but the enhanced image showed the edges of them clearly enough. They crumbled into dust at the bottom, and there, in a huge valley between what had once been volcanoes, there was something constructed. I'd almost thought man-made, but we didn't know who had made it, or what. It did have a humanoid feel to it, though. I couldn't explain what I meant by that, not in words, but looking at the dome-shaped structure with its thick oval base, something about it made me picture it being built and used by people not too different from us. We were still 10,000 feet up, but the magnification of the scope brought the place into clear focus, and it looked like a tomb. Nothing moved, no lights shone from inside or out, and I couldn't see any sign of an entrance. And suddenly I realized that might have been the problem Philip Lee was telling me we had. No way in, he confirmed. You see in this, Jambo? Am I missing something? Any energy readings, signals? This place is like two clicks across and I've circled it twice. I got nothing. There was a hesitation after Lee's transmission, and I wondered if Shaw was passing on the question to his commander. Oliveira proved me right by answering. Gunfighter 1, this is Jambo. Andy. What do you think about using the shuttle's coil gun to try to blow a hole through the wall? I think if whoever built the place left any kind of automated defenses activated, we'll be pretty fucking dead, sir, I told him. Given what we saw in that derelict, whatever weapons they're using could probably turn us into vapor. We didn't see any sign of automated defenses on the derelict, he argued mildly. But yeah, I see where you're coming from. Suggestions? What about the impulse gun? Julie suggested. She was technically butting into her commander's discussion, but she was more the ship's XO than Colonel Wrightfield was, despite his title, and everyone trusted her. The shuttle moves back a few hundred clicks, and we target the edge of the structure with the lowest power shot we can make from orbit, try to open a breach. If they don't shoot back at us, Gunfighter 1 heads on in. Any objections? I checked the comm display in my HUD to make sure who was listening in on the conversation, eyeing Foggy and the others. The comm channel we were using was command link only, which meant only Lee and I could hear it. Should I ask the research team? No, I think we both know what they'd say. Major Lee, pull back over the horizon and stay low. We'll send you a drone feed of the strike. The flight away from the dome seemed to take forever. Impatience adding minutes, like the extra time at the end of a soccer game, when your team is leading and you just want the match to be over. And yes, I did just talk about soccer. My son played rec league for eight years, before getting to that point all child athletes reach, where they have to make a choice between taking the next step to competitive and staying the hell with it, or doing something else. He did something else but I had a lasting memory of attending his soccer games, since it was one of the few places I could see him without his mother's permission. This was worse than extra time, because we nestled down behind a hill, hovering on the belly jets. The reaction mass situation worried me. There was no atmosphere to speak of on this rock, and certainly not enough of one for the turbojets to work, which meant we were burning reaction mass, staying above ground. Not as much as if we were flying above a planet, of course, since the gravity on this moon was about a quarter of a G, but enough that I started trying to tap into the bird's flight control board to get a look at the levels in the tanks. I stopped messing with the HUD when the drone feed popped into it. It was much closer than we were, maybe a mile at the most, and only a hundred feet off the ground. Nothing moved, not so much as a cloud of dust. Even the drone was different for a place like this. No propellers, no wings. It was a miniature version of a hammerhead shuttle, its engines powered by the same sort of isotope battery we used in the Svalen armor. It was expensive as shit, and Oliveira didn't like to waste them, so I hoped for his sake and for the sake of the post-mission inventory that nothing happened to it. Firing in three, two, one, now. Graciano was one of those guys who liked countdowns. I thought we'd dispensed with that bullshit when the first crew of the Jambo had avoided it, but some things are just too dug in to kill. I watched the picture, waiting. 
The impulse gun round was significantly faster than a normal kinetic energy weapon, but they'd set it for the lowest possible speed, and it took minutes to make its way through the atmosphere. I'd seen bolides in the sky on Earth, green teardrops slashing across the stars, and this reminded me of one, except going so much faster than terminal velocity. When it struck, there was no explosion, and I sighed in relief, although I hadn't expected one. There should have been no reactant, no oxidizer, but we were dealing with something very old and very alien, and you just never knew. It was a dust cloud, though it dispersed much quicker in a near vacuum than it would have in an atmosphere. And then there was nothing. I do not know, Ban So said after a long, silent moment, whether that was a wise decision. You and me both, brother, I assured him. But this place was sealed up tight and we needed a can opener. We waited, for what I didn't know. Blue beams of light to shoot off into space? Alien space bats? Invisible monsters from the id? Why is it in a vacuum? I wondered aloud. Because there's no fucking air? Pops suggested. Nah, I know what you mean, sir, Quinn said. There's so many habitable worlds. Why would they build a base out here where there's nothing but gas giants and dead rocks? You're assuming those rocks have always been dead. The suggestion had come from Foggy, which surprised me, both that she was listening to our conversation and that she'd bothered to reply. We have seen our share of ruined planets on this voyage. There is nothing to say that one of those burnt cinders out there once carried life, and that whatever war was fought here simply did a much more thorough job of destroying it. But they didn't bother with this place? I asked her, since she'd decided to join in. It's not exactly concealed. We spotted it first thing. It might have been abandoned already, Quinn said. Wizard's trying to live up to his nickname again, Dog cracked, laughing harshly. There was good-natured ribbing in his tone, but I already knew from talking to Pops that the new guys already envied Quinn for earning the name. All right, Gunfighter One, Oliveira cut in. That's long enough. If anything was going to attack, it would have done it already. Proceed in, and see if you can gain entry through the hole. Could we gain entry through the hole? The real question was, could the whole damn shuttle fit through it because it was that big? Gunfighter 1 had to land nearly a kilometer away to find a flat, open plain of dust and rock, because an entire section of the dome roof had collapsed, littering the immediate area around the hole with debris. I'm not sure the elders built this place, I said, clomping down the shuttle's belly ramp with Quinn and Gregson at point again, and the research team behind me. You'd think if this was one of their bases, they'd have made it sturdier. You think it should have been able to stand up to an impulse gunshot? That was Oliveira, still kibitzing from the jambo. I frowned. It was bad enough having Quinn and the scientists second-guess my ideas without the boss listening in. The Elders terraformed planets wholesale, I reminded him. I mean, think about that. With the tech we got from the Helta, we might be able to terraform a world like Mars or Venus over the space of a few centuries, if we had the will and the money to spend on it, which we will have neither, since there are so many other habitable worlds. The Elders did it hundreds, maybe even thousands of times, and I'd be willing to bet they did it quick. Do you really think they'd be throwing around experiments on so many habitables if it took hundreds of years to create them? We have considered engineering worlds, Bonso told me. The Helta, that is. There are a few we found that we thought might be possible to make habitable, but there has been argument whether this would be an honor to the elders for us to emulate their ways, or if it would be sacrilege, arrogating ourselves to the godhead. Watch your step here, ladies and gentlemen. Gregson said, climbing over a small hillock of debris. I followed him, giving the balance and safety of the scientists over to Pops and the operators behind me, and I could, for the first time since we'd landed, see the dome. It was so freaking large from down here, unimaginably huge, compared to how I'd pictured it from orbit, or even from a few thousand feet up. It dwarfed the football stadiums I'd visited in Vegas, Tampa, and a dozen other cities, jutting out of the airless desert like the head of Ozymandias, calling to Percy Bysshe Shelley. And like the mythical statue of Ramses II, this monument to antiquity was also in ruins thanks to us.
Guilt stung at the edges of my soul at the thought we'd destroyed some ancient alien work of art in our carelessness. Maybe the Chamblisi were right, and we were a little too much like the Tavinians for comfort. On the other hand, if a work of art inspires no one on some vacuum-soaked world in a lifeless system, is it art? Is it antiquity, or is it simply trash for the cosmic junk man? And no, I didn't know why I was feeling so suddenly philosophical. Maybe I was just a big dumb marine who wanted to shoot something. And maybe I was getting tired of babysitting scientists. This is fairly basic construction. Shrisalasa, the Vironian, observed when we'd approached close enough to the hole to see the edges, see the layers of the base and the dome. Local materials, if I'm not mistaken. Not even as sophisticated as some of the constructions the humans have built on Earth's moon. Gee, thanks, lizard man. There's a big drop-off here, Quinn reported, holding up a hand to halt the rest of the column. The Delta operators went to one knee at the security halt out of training, though it was likely a futile gesture out on an open plain. If there were enemy around ready to shoot at them, ducking down on a knee wouldn't have inconvenienced the bad guys one bit. I moved up to Quinn's position, and hell yes, there was a big drop-off. The impact of the tungsten slug had opened up a chasm in the rock at the edge of the dome's foundation, a gap about six feet across and deep enough I couldn't see the bottom. If there was any atmosphere, I said ruefully, staring into the trench, I'd throw a rock down there and listen for it to hit bottom. But that might wake up the bell rock, Gregson warned, fool of a took. Oh, Sergeant Gregson, I said, grinning at the faceless armored figure. The team needs more men like you. Appreciate the thoughts, sir, but what are we going to do? He motioned at the broad gap. I looked away from it for a second, trying to see what was on the other side. The opening blown in the base of the dome was choked with debris, rock, dirt, metal supports, and what seemed to be concrete or some other form of aggregate material, and I couldn't make out much through the dust floating inside. There seemed to be some regular squared-off lines inside, but nothing else to give any clue whether the place was a treasure trove or an empty, abandoned wreck. Gravity here is about 25%, wouldn't you say, Quinn? I asked, flexing my knees, the suit lifting off the ground a couple inches when I straightened up with the Svalin's artificial musculature behind the motion. Oh, sir, Quinn said, half a moan as he realized what I was thinking. I don't think that's a great idea. I ran forward and jumped as far as the Svalin would take me. It was a good deal farther than I thought. I'd had more experience in the armor than anyone alive knew every system, every weakness, every capability of the Svalin. The one thing I didn't have much experience with was operating the suit in low gravity. My stomach dropped from beneath me as the chasm and the debris and the doorway all sailed past, and I had a terrible conviction that I was going to slam right into the edge of the roof where it jutted out, sharp and jagged from the impulse gun shot. I put my left hand up out of instinct to protect my head, and my fingertips scraped the ceiling for a good six inches before I headed back down. Down involved a shitload of sharp and rocky stuff, none of which would have been ideal for a landing, and I bicycled my legs, trying for more distance, and was finally rewarded with the blessing of a fairly flat surface. It wasn't a great landing, and would have earned me a 6.7 from the Russian judge, after I had to quick step forward about six feet before I stopped. But I was in. And I was down, and I hadn't broken anything. Are you okay, sir? Quinn asked. I took a second to look around before I answered, playing my helmet's headlamp from side to side, supplementing it with the weapons light built into the KE rifle. It wasn't daylight bright, even with the helmet's vision enhancements, but it was enough to see by. No bodies this time, which was a nice change. Not that we couldn't use the intelligence we'd be able to gather from corpses, but something that wouldn't give me nightmares was all right, too. But the place wasn't emptied out, either. It was split up into different levels, with stairs going up along the far walls, and I couldn't see into the other floors. But the front section, from the collapsed wall about fifty yards inward and all the way out to the outer curve of the dome on either side, was one huge open chamber. A hangar, 
that's what it was, and sitting just past the rubble and debris from the orbital strike was a spaceship. No wings, no drives that I could see, just a teardrop shape about a hundred feet long, resting on a tricycle pattern of landing struts. But I knew deep in my gut that it was a ship, left behind, waiting for centuries for us. Oh yeah, I told Quinn, grinning at the thing. I'm doing just fine. Chapter 16 Remarkable, Bonso repeated, still seated at what I took to be the pilot station of the ship. Simply remarkable. Which part? I asked him, hating to interrupt, but honestly curious. The part where we had the team jump you science geeks over a big honking hole in the ground? The part where I found an intact spaceship? Or the part where this fucking thing still has power and air after God knows how many hundreds of years? Bon So turned in the chair, which was remarkably similar to every other pilot's seat I'd seen on human and Helta ships, and gave me a look of long-suffering annoyance. I could see it because he and the rest of us had our visors up. I'd thought that was a bit on the reckless side, since we had no idea what microorganisms or chemicals might be floating around in the air from the ship's processors. But Teresa Lassa had done the chemical analysis, and Haskett had checked for bugs, and it had all come back all good to go. And God knows I wasn't going to argue too hard, since breathing the stale air from the ancient ship was still a good deal more desirable than breathing the stale B.O. inside my suit. All of those events are remarkable, Major Clanton, the Helt admitted. But specifically, I was expressing amazement at what the readouts seemed to be telling me. I squinted at the chicken scratch floating across the holographic display, frowning as if it was just out of reach, something I should have been able to recognize but couldn't. You can read that shit? I asked him. I can, and that is the other remarkable thing. This writing is in the old script, the writings of our people from before time, from legend, from our holy writ that speaks of the elders. So this place is Helta? I asked him. It wasn't that unlikely. We'd found other humans out here, and there was no reason to assume the Helta might not have been dumped on more than one planet after the elders engineered them. That is one possibility, he admitted. Or... It is also possible that the old script was, as many have hypothesized, given to us by the elders, and that this is their writing. You think this is an eldership? I asked, one eyebrow arching upward. Not just because it would be incredibly cool to be the first guy to discover a working eldership, but... Well, no, it was mostly because it would be incredibly cool to be the first guy to discover a working eldership... Anyway, what were the controls telling you? That this ship is fully powered up and ready to fly, as if it were prepped for takeoff centuries ago and then left for us. Judging by what I have seen of the inner workings of the propulsion system, Foggy interjected from the entrance to the cockpit, or command center, or bridge, or whatever we wound up calling it, I would not be shocked if this were so. Foggy still had her helmet on, and I wondered if it was because she kept things more humid inside there than was comfortable for the rest of us. The Chamblisi could and did adapt to drier climes, but their homeworld was, on average, wetter, hotter, and more humid than was considered comfortable for humans, Helta, or Scriff. The Vironians? Well, as long as it didn't get too cold, they were fine anywhere. You were able to access it from inside the ship? Bonso asked, the hair standing up behind his ears, and what I'd learned was utter, almost sexual excitement. I thought you might have to try from the exterior. There is no access from the exterior, the Chamblisi told him. It's completely sealed. Perhaps it could be opened by some sort of molecular debonding technique, but certainly not by us. But there are maintenance hatches in the rear compartment. Shrisalasa is still there examining them, but I felt someone should pass along what we'd found, so you might transmit it to the ship, and thus back to the Alliance. I felt like I was eight years old again, and it was Christmas morning, and there was a box under the tree, just the right size for a PlayStation 4, 
and I shifted my weight from one foot to another in impatience. Pass what along? I asked her. What did you find out about the drive? This is, for the most part, hypothesis, the octopod admitted, upper tentacles waving theatrically, and I wanted to smack the thing in the forehead for dithering. But it is based on the nature of the field propagation emitters I discovered in the drive unit itself, as well as the fact that the craft has no exhaust of any kind. I believe the elders knew how to use the warp field not just to manipulate the fabric of space-time, but also to actually counteract planetary gravity. Von So uttered a barking grunt, very reminiscent of an agitated bear, and I nearly burst out laughing but restrained myself. Holy shit, I murmured. No more turbojets, no more wings, no more airfoils, no rockets at all. Indeed, Von So agreed, and so much more than that. Major Clanton, I am certain I don't have to tell you the ramifications of being able to counteract gravity. He definitely didn't. I'd read and written about them for decades now, since I was a kid. Flying cars, flying houses, flying cities. Those terraformed planets, it would be childishly simple if we could control gravity, create volcanic eruptions, thicken the atmosphere, create magnetic fields. And that was just the positive side the creative side. On the destructive side, the one the marine in me knew with dolorous certainty would be explored even earlier, being able to control gravity was an incredible weapon. I imagined temporary black holes being opened at the heart of a city, and I shuddered. But all that was long-term, and the immediate benefit of the technology would be allowing us to go faster and farther in shuttles without worrying about reaction mass. And maybe maybe even land something the size of the Jambo on a planet. If. If was a slippery word, and it could squirt right out of your hands if you gripped it too tight. Do you think you can figure out how it works? I asked the two aliens. Do you think it's something we could build ourselves? Unknown, Foggy told me, and I knew I could at least count on her, to be honest. Shamblisi didn't lie. They had no concept of it. We'll have to take it somewhere safe for study, somewhere far away from habitation, since any miscalculation could result in a catastrophic release of gravitational energy. I would imagine that would have to wait until this mission is complete. I can tell you that, as with the drives on the derelict we found, I have no concept of what powers this ship. If I were to hazard a guess, I would say that Bonso's hunch was correct, that the elders discovered a way to tap the fabric of hyperspace for energy. We have to get this thing back onto the jambo, I decided. I gestured towards Bonso. You say you can read their language. Is there any chance you could figure out how to fly this thing? Given time, he assented, but I am not qualified to fly a ship. I'm not sure you'd have to be, I told him. After all, if it's able to counteract gravity, there'd be no trajectories, no vectors, no acceleration. All you'd have to do is point the thing and tell it where you want it to go. It might not be that simple, Bonso insisted, a hint of panic in his voice. I'd feel more comfortable if we brought in an experienced pilot. I laughed and clapped him gently on the arm. Well, I thought it was gentle, though he flinched away. I'm just fucking with you, Bonzo, I assured him, still chuckling. Let me know when you have the control systems figured out. I left him and Foggy in the cockpit and headed back to the airlock, lowering my visor. The airlock was perhaps the neatest part of the whole ship, and it had probably taken us longer to figure out than the controls, simply because we couldn't believe it. I hesitated in front of the lock, just staring at the outside. There was a physical door, but there was no airlock. What there was, as close as we could guess, was the same sort of field that kept the air in for the hangar bay of a Helta cruiser, except this one was on a ship smaller than a hammerhead shuttle, and was still operational after however many hundred years the thing had been here. I shook my head and stepped through. I might have felt a slight tingle going through the field, or it might have been my imagination. Pops was standing at the bottom of the ramp, unmoving, 
A statue, for all anyone could have told from without, though I figured he was on the comms. I waited beside him until he half-turned, motioning with his off-hand that he noticed me. It was one of those little ticks we developed from so much time in the armor, motions and gestures that replaced facial expressions we couldn't see through the visors. We done with the search? I asked him, checking the IFF display. The rest of the team was spread all around the dome, moving in groups of two, but they seemed to be heading back to the hangar. Yeah, but I don't know if they found anything important or if it's just the dirty laundry the elders left behind. His Svalin shrugged in sympathy with the man inside. They've sent videos and images back to the Jambo via Gunfighter 1, and I suppose if they think it's important, they'll send the science team to check it out. What's the word on the hot rod there? Pops motioned at the ship. Oh, it's the fucking mother load, Pops. I grinned, turning back to take in the sleek lines of the thing. Gravity control, reactionless drives, maybe even a hyperdrive. We're still not sure about that all crammed into something half the size of a shuttle. We're definitely headed in the right direction. You think we're going to find them, sir? I could hear the doubt in his voice. The elders, I mean. Everything we found is old, hundreds of years old. Would they really leave all this shit lying around if they were still here? I don't know, I admitted. But I just get this feeling that we're right on their heels. They were here, a few hundred years ago at least and the farther we go, the less of a gap there seems to be. I wasn't much of a gambler. You couldn't live in Vegas very long if you were a gambler without losing everything and not being able to live in Vegas anymore. But I'd dabbled in it for entertainment when friends visited, and a couple times I'd had pretty good runs at the blackjack tables. This rush was more powerful than any of those hot streaks, and the reward was likely to be better than $1,200 and a few free drinks. Eh, maybe you're right. Pop said. If nothing else, we're getting good intel and some nice new toys. We taking that one home with us? That's the plan, assuming we can figure out a way. It's got power, so it's just going to be a question of getting it to the Jambo. I bet the flyboys will be beating the shit out of each other to be the ones to do it. If you ask my wife, I warned him, she'll tell you that flyboys is a sexist term and that she could kick all of their asses in a fighter jet, or a shuttle, or a starship. And she could, he admitted. But I'm an old man, and set in my ways. That's what I keep telling her, too. But she doesn't let me get away with it, either. Andy, you reading me? I blinked at Julie's voice and wondered if she'd somehow been listening in. Yeah, what's up? We have a problem. We just detected multiple hyperspace insertions in the outer system. The hair rose on the back of my neck, and my first thought was that the elders had come back and were going to spank our asses for fucking with their shit. My next was that it was the bugs from the derelict. We got any kind of ID on them? I asked, hoping I was being paranoid, and that it was the Helta or the Shamblisi sending reinforcements, or even the Coalition rolling out the new cruisers they were building with Alliance help. The Helta cruisers, but they aren't running Alliance IFF. And you know what that means as well as I do. It's the Tavinians. Are you shitting me? I blurted. How in the hell could they find us way out here? I'll make sure to ask them. She snapped, then sighed. Sorry, I don't know how, but they're here, and we need to get you guys off the planet ASAP. Shit. I spat, all thoughts of blackjack winning streaks banished in a rush of adrenaline. All right, I'll get us ready for takeoff. Are you going to be able to hold them off? We'll try. That was Oliveira, who had apparently been listening in on the conversation. But there's at least three cruisers to just one of us. We're staying powered down, hoping they won't notice us. But there's nothing else in this system putting out energy signatures besides this ship. So I don't know how long that can last. Get your ass into orbit. On our way. I switched over to the general landing party net, already jogging back toward the elder ship. Listen up. We have Tavinians in system. Everyone drop what you're doing and evac to Gunfighter 1 immediately. Phil, get the reactor warmed up and ready for takeoff. You copy? I'm on it. Lee's voice was fighter pilot calm, carrying on a long legacy going back to Chuck Yeager. But it broke just slightly with his next words. Damn shame about the ship, though. It sure as hell was. I cast a longing look at the teardrop shape. If we just had more time. Pops, do we have anything that'll demo that ship? Not a chance in hell, he said without hesitation. Even if it was just one of our own shuttles and not some ultra-tech alien shit, 
We didn't bring enough demo for anything more than blowing down a couple doors. Andy. Not Julie this time. Oliveira, and his voice was strained. They micro-jumped. They're practically in our laps. I'm going to have to jump out and back in, try to throw them off, but we'll be back as quick as we can to pick you up. But one of them has already launched landers. They're going to be on top of you before we can get back. I glanced around, as if the answer to our problems was somewhere in the half-wrecked dome. And it might have been, for all I knew, but most of what we found was sealed up, inscrutable in proverbial black boxes. There was nothing, just dust and debris and that ship. Shit, I sighed, making a split-second decision, the kind that always got me in trouble. Pops, get the team to the shuttle, now. What are you going to do? He called after me, but I was already in motion. I left him there and ran back up the ramp into the elder ship, nearly colliding with Bonso, who was on his way out. Foggy and the Vironian were right behind him, looking as eager to get out of the ship as I was to get in. Hold up, I told them. I need you in here. But the Tavinians, Bonso squawked, waving his hands in panic. The Tavinians are coming, I agreed. I don't know how they found us, but they're here, and we can't let them get their hands on this ship. What they could do with this kind of technology isn't even worth considering, so we're not going to let them have it. And how do we keep that from happening, Major Clanton? Foggy wondered, seemingly calm, but then how would I tell if she wasn't calm? We can't destroy it, so we're going to fly it right onto the Jambo. I stabbed a finger toward Bon So, not caring whether it was some sort of cultural faux pas. Get this fucking ship in the air! Chapter 17 Andy, I respect the hell out of you, but you're nuttier than squirrel shit. Thanks, Pops, I said, trying not to chew on my lip as I watched Bonso's hands reaching for imaginary controls inside a haptic hologram. It covered the whole front of the cockpit, bathing it in an image of the dome in front of us so realistic I felt like I was standing outside. You tell me another way to keep the bad guys from getting this ship, and I'll run out right now and get in that shuttle with you. Foggy looked over at me from the tablet she was holding with the translation program for the old script, and I wondered if she'd heard my end of the conversation through my open visor, and was concerned that I'd leave the three aliens behind when I went for my notional run to the hammerhead. We got enemy landers inbound, Philip Lee cut into the conversation. ETA two minutes, Andy. I don't want to leave you high and dry, but if they catch Gunfighter 1 on the ground, we're toast. Get out, Phil, I told him. That's in order. We're the same rank, Andy, he reminded me. But all right, I'm going. If you make me be the one to explain to Julie why you got your stupid ass killed, I will never forgive you. Neither will she, I agreed. See you on the Jambo. I have it, Foggy crowed in exultation. Or at least that's how the translation program interpreted her tone. You can get us flying? I asked her, leaning over her shoulder to look at the control panel she'd been trying to access. Oh, no, not from here, but I can get the sensors working. Which I suppose was better than nothing. As it turned out, it was a hell of a lot better than nothing, because the elders really knew how to make a tactical display. One second, we were staring at the inside wall of the dome, and the next, the left-hand side of the front bulkhead had shifted to a view from outside staring up at the star-black sky. The gas giant loomed at the lower edge, a disapproving god peering down at us mere mortals, and cutting across his face on the horizon were half a dozen landers, held to shuttles stolen and repurposed by our outlaw cousins, the Tavinians. I stared at them, and the image drew closer, though I wasn't sure if it was reacting to my eye motion or the movement of the shuttles. They were similar to the hammerheads, though not as sleek or deadly-looking, lacking some of our flair for aircraft design. But there was nothing wrong with their drives, and if the lasers they used for their primary weapons system had some tactical drawbacks compared to our coil guns, well, they'd work just fine to fry us to a crisp. How the hell are they doing that? I mumbled. Drones? Cameras? In the domes? Computer simulation based on the sensor input. Foggy suggested, and I wanted to yell at her to concentrate on the flight controls and stop indulging my stupid questions. Much more sophisticated than anything even we in the Alliance have. Sophisticated or not, Foggy, those Bronze Age barbarians flying stolen tech are about to kill us. 
while we sit here on our happy asses in the most advanced piece of gear anyone's ever seen. The Chamblisi stared at me in a way my translator couldn't interpret. Am I to understand, the walking octopus asked, that you have assigned me what you humans call a nickname? The alternative would be that you consider me to either be surrounded by fog or mentally confused. Seriously, this is what she wants to talk about right now? Yes, I confessed. It's a nickname. In the display, the flight of Tavinian shuttles was maybe two or three miles out, or at least that was what it seemed like to me. There were labels floating beside each of them, but they were in what Bon So called the old script, and I didn't have the update to my translator to read it, and Gunfighter One was still sitting there. And this is something you have done in the spirit of comradeship. It is, I said, hoping that humoring her would keep her focused on the task at hand more than arguing about it. And in the spirit of comradeship, am I supposed to respond in kind with a nickname for you? Dust poured from beneath Gunfighter One as the belly jets ignited, an invisible hand lifting the shuttle into the air. Jesus, give me strength. Yes, you can call me Andy. May I call you Andy as well? Bonso asked, turning around in his seat, eyebrows tilted upward, mouth slightly open in the Helta equivalent of a smile. My brain was close to the boiling point, about to burst right out of my skull in an explosion of profanity when the Helta motioned back at the main screen. By the way, we are flying. I blinked, staring at the display in disbelief. Both views were still sharing the projection, and both were moving. The perspective was shifting with each second as we angled out of the hangar, through the hole in the dome, then began to ascend. We were rising even faster than Gunfighter 1, soaring above the Hammerhead shuttle, her main drive glowing white, while the Tavinian landers were spreading out, splitting between the two of us. And yet I felt nothing. For all I could tell from my feet and inner ear, we could have been sitting on the ground back inside the dome. If I'd had a cup of coffee, it wouldn't have spilled. What the hell? I blurted, though in retrospect I shouldn't have been surprised. If you can counteract planetary gravity, why would you feel momentum? I still grabbed at the back of the pilot seat, which did not, I realized, have any safety restraints. How well can you control it? It's childishly simple. Bonso seemed nearly giddy, perhaps with the spirit of scientific discovery, or perhaps just in relief. I just drag this symbol... He pointed at something that looked like a caduceus drawn by a drunk three-year-old to where I want to go. He touched the haptic hologram and pulled the symbol off to the right, and we immediately shifted to the right and kept flying. And if I want to speed up or slow down, I work this slider. Another projection on more of the weird symbols, but at least the shape of the slider was familiar. I'd seen it on computer games since I was a kid. He pushed it to the right, and we surged past Gunfighter 1 yet did not climb. I wasn't an aerospace engineer or a pilot, but I knew that when you sped up on a world with no atmosphere, you climbed. Yet we didn't. Does this thing have any weapons? I have no idea. I thought my priority was supposed to be getting the ship flying, Andy. Oh, good. Now all the aliens will be calling me Andy. Gunfighter 1, you reading me? It was a long shot. The signal was line of sight, and the only way I could get it farther than a few hundred yards was a relay from Gunfighter 1, which was currently about five miles away, just eyeballing it. Nothing. Shit. Those landers are almost on them. I tapped Bonso on the shoulder. Get up. But I'm flying the ship. Not anymore. I pushed him out and plopped the Svalin in the chair. The suit barely fit into it, but the seat didn't even creak in complaint at the 600 pounds of extra mass. I stripped off my gauntlet and tossed it aside, then reached into the holographic projection and pulled the weird symbol back toward the oncoming landers. Wait! No! Bonso cried, reaching out a hand toward the screen. I blocked it with my forearm. But you're taking us back to the Tavinians! I am, I admitted. I pulled the slider to the right, and I'm doing it pretty fast, too. We were probably like teenagers trying to drive an F1 race car. But it would have to be enough. But Andy, shines light in a fog, said mildly from behind me. Won't they attempt to shoot us down? I'm counting on it. It was, I thought, far too much like playing a video game. And not one of those fancy new VIR games you could find on the Vegas Strip. No, this was one of those old-school arcade games. The ones that didn't even shake to make you think that you were moving. 
the ones I always did shitty at because of the lack of feedback. This time, I was going to have to get through a level without even a single laser gun. Luckily, I had more than plot armor. I had an elder spaceship, and I was hoping it would be enough. I believe they're shooting at us, Foggy said, waving a tentacle at the sensor display on the left-hand side. The elders didn't have quite the same aesthetics as we or the Helta did, because the laser wasn't simulated by the displays as a red line. Instead, they used a series of blue dashes to let us know the Tavinians were firing their weapons, and a radiant blue glow across the front of the sensor display to let us know we'd been hit. And that was about the only way I would have known, because the laser did exactly jack shit to the Elder spaceship. Did you know that was going to happen? Bonso asked me, his expression not quite human, but close enough that I could see the mixture of fear and relief. I had hopes, I admitted, still concentrating on the controls. The shuttles weren't giving up. The rest of them circled around me, ignoring Gunfighter 1, which was what I'd intended, but I might have bitten off more than I could chew. More blue dots reached out, azure curtains swallowing up the view on the sensor screens, and the ship shuddered. Ah, uh, that's not good, I said, my voice so much calmer than my stomach. We should leave now, shouldn't we? Bonso suggested. We're leaving now? I checked the sensors again. Saw a gunfighter one a hundred miles or so ahead of us, rising but still only about 50,000 feet up, not quite in orbit. The shuttle isn't far enough away yet. We have to keep them occupied. The ship tossed from side to side, and we felt it despite the gravity drive. Bonso stumbled backwards, crashing onto his ass with a meaty thump. But Foggy kept her balance. Her motive tentacles spread wide like a martial artist, or a surfer. The image of an octopus surfing nearly made me bust out laughing, and I clamped down, trying to concentrate. The dry field is being overloaded, the Chamblisi explained helpfully. If it's destabilized too much, the field will collapse and will be destroyed instantly. Let's not do that, I said, dragging the guidance icon very, very close to the lead shuttle. Um, Andy, Bonso said, crawling to his feet beside me. That's even closer than we are now. The dry field on Helta cruisers does nasty things to other spaceships, I reasoned. Let's see what it does to these fuckers. I swiped the slider to the right, and the elder spaceship leapt forward like it had been shot out of a cannon, heading straight at the lead Tavinian shuttle in the formation. Well, not straight at, because I wasn't quite as certain as I was trying to sound that this would work. We brushed by faster than I could follow on the optical viewers, but the sensor screen made things clear. We'd passed only yards away from their starboard wing, and then the wing wasn't there anymore, and neither was the rear stabilizer. We weren't in an atmosphere, so the lander wasn't going to crash from the lack of a wing, but it did go tumbling away, pushed by the gravitational tidal forces, its belly jets firing desperately to stabilize its course. The others broke off, spinning in midair and burning hot the opposite direction. Tell me we don't intend to pursue them, Bonso pled, still kneeling as if in supplication, or more likely just scared to stand up. Please tell me you aren't going to go after them. I wanted to. There was something viscerally satisfying about smashing into their shuttles with the Elder Ship, with ripping pieces off of them and making them run scared like the little rats they were. But the Jambo wasn't going to be able to take on three enemy cruisers by herself, and we weren't getting out of here in the ship. Maybe it could go into hyperspace and maybe it couldn't, but I had no idea how to navigate it there. No, I assured him. We have to get back to the cruiser. I found the hammerhead shuttle on the sensor screen and pointed the navigation icon to a course running right beside it, then kicked the little spacecraft in the ass. I guess I should have been used to the lack of acceleration from the Helta cruisers, but that was like being on an aircraft carrier or a passenger liner. This was like being in the cockpit of a jet fighter and running it to Mach 2 without even being pushed back into your seat. We had to be boosting at the equivalent of a hundred gravities, and we caught up with the shuttle in under a minute, just as it cleared the atmosphere. In the optical screen, the shuttle was beautiful and sleek and incredibly close. So close I could have reached out and touched it, close enough to use my helmet comms. Lee, this is Clanton, do you copy? Andy, are you in that weird alien hot rod? 
Lee's voice was distant and staticky, but at least we were communicating. I am indeed, I assured him, and I could fly rings around you in this thing if I wanted to, Phil, so show a little respect. But right now, I need you to get us back to the Jambo because I don't know how the radio works in this thing. His chuckle was a burst of static in my helmet speakers. What makes you think they'll let that hunk of junk on board? He teased. What if you guys have alien monsters bursting out of your chests? Funny boy, guide us in before the Tavinians blow up our ride, okay? She's heading back this way now, he said. They just micro-jumped back in from the edge of the system. But we've got maybe ten minutes until those enemy cruisers are on top of us. Just follow me in. I'll do my best. I shrugged, though he couldn't see it. I'm honestly not sure I know how to land this crate. I turned to Foggy and motioned at the sensor screen. Can you find the jambo on this thing? I am hesitant to tamper with it while we're in flight, Andy, the octopod admitted. If I misread the controls, I could leave us totally blind and unable to detect even our shuttle. I wanted to snap at her to do it anyway, but honestly, how much did I trust the Chamblisi? There! Bonso exclaimed, pointing at the sensor readout. It was a cruiser. I mean, I didn't know the elder symbol for cruiser, but I could tell it was a hell of a lot bigger than us, and traveling much faster than the Hammerhead's top boost, which seemed god-awfully slow to me, and it was heading straight for us. Is that ours or theirs? I wondered. Gunfighter 1 answered the question for me by spinning end for end and beginning a braking burn, bleeding off momentum, getting ready to dock. It was the Jambo. They're expecting you, Andy, Lee told me. Their idea is you need to slow that thing down to a crawl and the Jambo will scoop you up. Yeah, copy that. I'll do my best. It seemed simple enough. I reached into the haptic hologram and slid what I'd been calling the accelerator all the way to the left. Are we stopped? I asked, not sure if I was speaking to Lee or Foggy. I believe so, Foggy answered. At least, as close as we can come given that the space-time we occupy is being acted upon by the cosmic expansion as well as the tidal effects of the cruiser, and that's assuming that the gravitational dampening field is still activated with the power settings this low, which I cannot guarantee. If it is not, then we are also subject to the gravitational interactions of multiple bodies in this system, including the moon, the gas giant, and the system's primary, not to mention the gravitational pull of nearby stars, and the entire galaxy on a scale of— Thank you, Foggy, I interrupted, for such a complete answer. I keyed my comms again, hoping I was still close enough to Gunfighter 1 for the signal to get through. Time to intercept, Phil. Andy, it's me. The voice on the other end of the line wasn't Phil's, but Julie's. I'm relaying through Gunfighter One's comms. We're a minute out. Maintain position and we'll swallow you up. I'll aim the hangar bay right at you. Sounds good, I frowned. But won't we get smashed against the inside of the ship? The minute you're inside, she reminded me, the interior gravity takes over. You'll settle in, gentle as a feather as long as you don't do anything stupid and boost that freaky-looking thing right through the jambo. Roger that. I'll be a good little passenger and keep my hands off the controls. Oh, dear, Foggy exclaimed, and I wondered what exactly she'd said for the translator to give it that approximate definition. I'm afraid the Tavinians have jumped back in system as well. I didn't need to ask her for an explanation. It was plain as day on the sensor screen. The Tavinian cruisers were the same size as the Jambo, if not quite as advanced and lacking something of the panache our engineers had given the flagship of the Coalition Space Force, which I knew would be the Space Navy someday if I just kept nagging everyone until they listened. If I was alive to nag them. The cruisers were way too close, just a few light seconds away, and if they opened fire while Gunfighter 1 and the Elder Ship were trying to dock, All the elder technology in the universe wouldn't save us. My hand hovered over the navigation control, and I toyed with the idea of smashing this ship right through the bridge of the lead Tavinian cruiser like a bullet through their head. We would probably die, but Julie wouldn't, and I was willing to make that trade. Then darkness swallowed us for a fraction of a second, and the interior of the Jambo's hangar bay filled the front of the screen rushing toward us for a single terrifying moment before we thumped to the deck on the tricycle landing gear that I'd never even thought about retracting. 
I barely felt the jolt of the skids on the deck, and I had the time to think that the gravity resist field must be an always on thing when the jambo jumped. It was a step off the last stair to the floor when you expected another step, a jarring sudden stop, but it had the comfort of assuring you that you weren't going to fall down the stairs. Gentlemen, I said to the aliens on the research team, lady, I do believe we've arrived. Chapter 18 Okay, Major, Colonel Brady Evans said, motioning invitingly. Tell us about the Tavinians. It seemed silly and redundant to me. We just spent the last two years fighting or getting ready to fight the Tavinians, and anyone who hadn't been briefed by their chain of command on who the Tavinians were and what they wanted had to have been living under a rock. But looking out at the faces of the rangers gathered around Pops and Quinn and me in the hangar bay, I could see the trepidation in their eyes, the need for reassurance. They hadn't expected to find the Tavinians out here, and they weren't mentally prepared for it. All right, I said, clearing my throat as if I was getting ready to speak at a writing conference or a sci-fi convention. I'm sure you've read all the threat briefings, but no use half-assing this, so let's start from the beginning. The rangers looked up with rapt attention, the enlisted kneeling or sitting on the floor, while the NCOs and officers and the rest of us stood. It all seemed very uncomfortable, and I wasn't sure why we couldn't do this in the operations center, or a conference room, or someplace with chairs. But rangers always wanted to do things the hard way, and Evans doubly so. He was acting all butthurt again now that my team had found the Elder spaceship and topped his rangers finding the bugs. I guess I should have considered myself lucky that he'd brought his battalion down here in their utility fatigues instead of making them all gear up in Svalans. The elders took the ancestors of the Tavinians out of Central Europe around the time of Alexander the Great. They were a Celtic tribe, fairly advanced for the era, honestly. They had very progressive attitudes about women for the time, which is probably why they have women in their military now, and they were known as traders and craftsmen. One of Evans' company commanders, a tall woman with dark hair and disapproving eyes, glared at me. I frowned. Craftspeople? Crafters? Artisans? Fuck. They made stuff and sold it. But they were kind of like the ninth century Norse, who were also traders, but raided and stole and pillaged because sometimes you just can't get a good deal. They fought as mercenaries for the Greeks under Alexander, and sometimes fought against the Greeks as well. Things were a bit fluid back then. Anyway, the elders grabbed them up sometime either when Alexander the Great was still alive or shortly after he died and brought them to their home world, Tavinia. No one from the Alliance has been there voluntarily in the last 20 years or so, but the records show that it's a nice place, a lot like Earth except coming out of the end of an ice age. They didn't have any sort of heavy industry until the Helta came along and gave them fusion reactors and fabricators. But the thing about the Tavinians is... They're not innovators, but they are fast learners. It didn't take them long to figure out ways to use what the Helta gave them as weapons, and from there, they stole everything else they needed from the Helta. They conquered Helta worlds, kidnapped Helta engineers, and seized Helta shipyards. They might not understand how to build ships themselves, but they sure as hell know how to get other people to build them. One of Evan's company commanders raised his hand, and I nodded to him. He was a slim, wiry young man with his head shaven so close, his scalp gleamed in the overhead lighting of the cargo bay. Yes, Captain Vernon. Sir, why did they do it, though? The man frowned deeply. I mean, I've read that they're convinced the galaxy is supposed to be theirs, but where did they get the idea? Why did they turn against the Helta? Wouldn't it have made more sense on a strategic level to keep soldiering along like good little doobies and wait until they were deep inside the Alliance to double-cross them? You're assuming a level of political intelligence that the Tavinians may not have. They're smart, but they're smart in the ways they've learned to be smart, and politics and espionage aren't among them. I shrugged. As for why, well, consider it being plucked off Earth by beings so advanced they might as well be gods, put on a new world, and told it's yours that you're special, and you've been given a planet all your own, to live as you see fit. Even if the elders didn't tell them that they were the chosen ones, wouldn't you assume it? So if the Helt had come along and said, Oh, 
We're the elders coming back. Maybe the Tavinians would have accepted it, and everything would have been cool. But when they told the truth in their typical clueless Helta fashion, explained where the Tavinians came from, and how the Helta and the other races of the Alliance were created by the elders, then the Tavinians decided that the elders had made those species to be their servants. And we all know that when someone looks on another race or species as inferior, as made to be slaves, it never turns out well. Nice analogy, Pops murmured. Well, I am a writer. I turn back to Vernon. I wouldn't call the Tavinians religious fanatics, but they're really embracing this whole manifest destiny thing big time. And they're willing to die in droves to get what they feel was promised to them by the elders, which makes them really fucking dangerous. But how are they here, sir? That was the dark-haired woman, Captain Herrera. Apparently, she'd forgiven me for my early sexist characterization of artisans as craftsmen. I mean, everything I read about the Battle for Earth said that we'd attrited their fleet to the point where they couldn't project force into other star systems anymore. I know the Alliance has retaken several systems they'd conquered after they withdrew back closer to their home world. So why would they be all the way out here? You're right, I acknowledged. They have to be down to their last handful of cruisers, and they've lost most of their shipyards. It'll take them years to build their fleet back up, and that's if we give them the time, which we aren't going to do. The Alliance has plans to take back the remaining Helta systems, and the last two working shipyards, or destroy the shipyards if it comes to that. Which means they considered this pretty damned important. Evans cut in. He moved into the center of the gathering, shouldering me aside. He spread his hands like a Baptist preacher addressing the flock and seemed to enjoy the attention about as much as most battalion commanders I'd ever met. Think about it. Either they detected the same signal we've been following, or they heard about our mission and somehow followed us. Which probably wasn't possible, but I didn't bother arguing the point. One way or the other, the Tavinians committed at least three of the few cruisers they have left to chasing down the signal. That means they think it's not just real... It's crucial to them on some level, whether that be religious, political, or military. Which, for us, means they're not about to give up. We're going to be running into them wherever this mission takes us. He was winding up, and I had the feeling if I didn't take back over, he'd just keep on babbling. So, I made one of those moves that I learned in high school. One that would piss him off if he had the time to think about it, but not give him any real reason to get mad publicly. I put my right foot just ahead of his left one, cutting my leg in front of his just slightly, the kind of thing that might happen accidentally, but didn't. Colonel Evans is right, I said, to take the sting off of it, which is why our plans have changed. Evans shot me a look that was half a glare and half a confused stare. I had a talk with General Oliveira and Anonim Claus just a few minutes before I came down to the hangar bay and the General has decided to forego exploring any of the systems along the way. We're going straight to the source, and when we get there, you rangers are going to be coming with us in force. No more fucking around. Balls to the wall and all hands on deck. Maybe we should have brought more than one cruiser, one of the enlisted said. I couldn't see who it was, and wouldn't have known the name if I had. These guys were all replacements. All but a couple of the rangers who'd been originally assigned to the Jambo had died during the battle for Earth, and of the survivors, only Quinn was still assigned to the ship. Stow that shit, one of the NCOs barked. It was Evans's sergeant major, though Bullock did glare in the man's general direction. I assumed it was one of the company's first sergeants. I decided to answer anyway, because in Delta, they had the philosophy that spreading information among the troops was a good thing, and I suppose it had rubbed off. Maybe we should have, I allowed, but we couldn't. For one thing, this was a gamble, a long shot. The Alliance requested us to check out the signal, and it was a tough sell to get the President to agree to it, and it would have been just about impossible to strip any more defenses from the system. But he thought the Tavinians couldn't hit us anymore, the same Spec 4 said, emboldened by my response. The threats the President was worried about aren't extraterrestrial. They're Russian and Chinese. I bit down on a reflexive laugh at the look of realization on the kid's face. Things were a lot closer to falling apart than anyone wants to admit. The CCP and the Russian Federation are all quiet and docile in public, but you know as well as I do that neither of them is crazy about the way things went down. 
In a few years, once everyone's fat and happy with free energy and cheap manufactured goods, and everyone's getting a cut of the profits, then maybe we can stop worrying about them. But that isn't now. And having a couple cruisers ready to rain hellfire down on them if they try hitting us again is a good way to keep things nice and quiet. So, we're on our own. Sir? This time the hand belonged to an E-5, one of the squad leaders. I nodded to the woman. What about the bugs? Do we know anything about them? Just that they're not from Earth. They don't have DNA, and they aren't part of the genetic tinkering the elders did with Earth life. Hell, for all we know, they are the elders. There was a buzz of conversation at that, and I thought that would be the end of it. But the last question came from a platoon leader. He was tall and broad-shouldered, and looked to be a gym rat. Sir, what about that thing? He pointed at the spaceship we'd flown up from the moon base. It was across the hangar, still surrounded by Space Force techs. They and the Alliance research team had been all over the ship since we'd gone into hyperspace two days ago, and I wasn't sure if any of the aliens had slept. Are we going to be able to use it, like, against the Tavinians? As far as we can tell, I said, the thing doesn't have any weapons. We're going to try to reverse engineer it, of course, and with the help of the Alliance, it's not impossible, but it's not going to happen soon. So don't be counting on any miracle alien technology to save the day. We're going to have to do that all by ourselves. I grinned to take the sting off the words. And if there's nothing else, I think I will let you ladies and gentlemen get back to work, because I know I have a shitload still to do before the general unshackles me from the oars of this boat and lets me go to sleep. They chuckled at that, until the senior NCOs called them to attention to dismiss them. But by then, I was already walking toward the alien ship. Contrary to what I'd led them to think, most of the work I'd been doing since we got back was sitting around staring at the ship. There was something about it, about the sleek design, unburdened by need for wings or engines that drew my gaze. Something unearthly, alien, yet familiar. You really think that, sir? I nearly jumped at Quinn's voice. I'd been so wrapped up in the lines of the ship that I hadn't noticed him walk up behind me. Pops and Dog had come with him but they were engaged in conversation, ignoring me. They'd probably come over just to avoid being cornered by any of the rangers and pressed for more answers we didn't have. Do I really think what, Quinn? That those bugs were the elders? Maybe, I shrugged. It would make sense, sort of. I mean, look at the facts. Every other race we've run across has come from Earth. The elders were aliens, and the bugs were the first thing we've found that's truly alien. If that's so, then... Why were the bugs fighting those humans? And why was that ship set up to be crewed by humans? It doesn't make any sense. He was right, of course. The kid was smart, which was why he was on my team instead of still languishing away with the knuckle-draggers. But there were downsides to being smart, and one of them was an overly active imagination. It had made me a successful sci-fi writer, but it came with the price of seeing way too many worst-case scenarios. Let's put it this way, Quinn, I told him. I hope the bugs were the elders. The elders could move around moons, control gravity, engineer life on a scale we can't even begin to understand. I motioned toward the ship, as if it was the perfect example of the argument I was trying to make. And if the bugs aren't the elders, well then, they're what chased them away. And somehow, I doubt they'd be any more hospitable to us. There was a werewolf doing yoga in the ship's gym. I should have been used to it by now after so many weeks shipboard, but seriously, how do you get used to something like that? Okay, I know it wasn't actually yoga. It was the scrith version of stretching exercises. But Anonim Claus was nearly naked, stripped down to a set of way too skimpy underwear. He wasn't covered in fur, exactly. Not like one of those 1980s-era movie werewolves. It was more like taking the hairiest man I could imagine and then doubling that. And damn, did the ship's cleaning robots work overtime to keep that shit off the deck. When I walked in, he was doing some stretch that had his back curved and his head thrown back, and I half expected him to start howling at the moon. I tried not to stare as I made my way to the flat bench. Hey, sir, Jumper called from over at the squat rack. He was already soaked in sweat, knees wrapped, and nestling under 395 pounds of iron. I didn't think officers actually lifted weights. I shot him a bird and began loading up my bar.
It was the same joke Sergeant Ben Stevens made every time either one of us walked in on the other in the gym, either on the ship or on base. You're thinking of army officers, jumper, I shot back, settling under my warm-up weight of 225 pounds. At least whoever had been on the bench last had wiped their sweat off the pad. Fucking Space Force slobs more often than not didn't. In the Marines, we actually expect our officers to lead. He might have laughed at that, or it might have just been a pained grunt as he squatted the heavy weight. The gym wasn't too crowded, because half the Space Force crew was on shift, and the other half was sleeping. So, it was mostly Rangers and Delta, and Anu, and me. I'd had to fight to get the gym included in the ship's design, and then fight to make it an actual gym, instead of a small workout room with machines and stationary bikes. We were, I told them, going to be in space for months at a time, and even though our ground forces had powered exoskeletons and didn't have to be able to haul around ungainly combat loads with just the tools God gave them, there was a mental health aspect to working out. In the end, I'd had the medal, and the spirit of the late James Bowie and the president behind me, and that had barely been enough. I was glad we had it on this trip. It had been three weeks in hyperspace since we'd left the moon of the gas giant, with four days to go, and everyone was getting a bit of cabin fever, even if it was a pretty big cabin. Working out helped to blow off steam. 225 pounds had, only a couple years ago, been the heaviest weight I could rep with. Time and wear and abuse had done a job on my left shoulder, and while surgery could have provided some temporary relief, I wasn't a fan of getting cut on. But the Helta rejuvenation treatments had worked the same miracle on my shoulders as they had on my knees, and I pumped out 12 reps as a warm-up just like I had when I was in my 20s in the base gym at K-Bay. This lifting of weights for resistance training, Anu said, suddenly seated only six feet away on the next bench over when I re-racked the bar. I understand the concept, but is it not inconvenient? Compared to what I have heard your people refer to as body weight exercises. His English had improved, and there was only the slightest of an accent, plus a burr that sounded like some sort of mutant Scottish, but was actually a result of his slightly different jaw structure. His accent was only the third or fourth weirdest thing about having a scrith sitting next to me in the gym. And somewhere on that list was his smell. Not that I'm one to judge. There are different philosophies about the whole thing. I admitted, but this is what we're used to, and I think it helps a lot of people to have something tangible and separate to move as opposed to just moving their own body over and over. Probably some deep psychological difference there between our races, Anu mused. If only I cared enough about it to study it. I laughed softly as I added another 45-pound plate to each side. This would be the second alien whose sense of humor had borrowed from mine and I was becoming proud of my influence on interstellar culture. I know this is your time for relaxation, Andy, the scrith said. A ranger walked by and gave Anu a dirty look for hogging the bench, but the alien ignored him. And I am loath to interrupt, but I have a question. Go ahead, I told him, lying back under the bar. As long as you don't mind if I push while you talk. Over in the corner, Jumper had moved up to 485, and I almost waited just to watch the hilarity when he was forced to drop and let the weight slam into the safety rails. But I was a bit pressed for time. Not at all. I have come to understand that it is delicate to speak to humans about religion. Some of us. I grunted the words out as I took the bar off the rack and let it drop to my chest, then bounced it off with an expulsion of air. It locked out, and I decided I had one more in me. I know you used to be a follower of one of your world's major religions, Christianity. Uh-huh. The acknowledgement was another huff of breath as the weight went down and back up. Two. I felt good. One more. I find it baffling how many religions your world has, but after careful study, I decided that this has something to do with the fact that you did not know of the elders. Maybe. I choked the word out this time on the lift. Three. My arms were trembling. I should really have stopped. But what use was it being twenty-five again if I didn't push myself? One more. I also understand you. What is the word? 
fell away, fell away from your beliefs, so I am fairly confident you would not be as sensitive about the question I wish to ask as someone who is still devout, such as General Oliveira. Yeah, Michael was still a pretty firm Catholic. And I was firmly convinced I wasn't going to be able to lift this fucking weight off my chest. It was stuck maybe three inches above me, my arms trembling, teeth clenched, a red haze forming over my thoughts. A bridge too far. I cheated, pushed up with the flats of my feet and arched my back and screamed. Anu took the weight off my chest with one hand and casually re-racked it. My apologies, he said. I didn't realize you needed help. I panted, sweat pouring off me as I eyed him sidelong. It was easy to forget just how much stronger he was. I could have gotten it, I insisted. I grabbed my towel and wiped away the sweat before I stood and went to the bar again. Up or down? I could probably max out with 355, but I'd tired myself out. Best to start warming down. What was the question? If you still believed as you did once, he asked me, while I replaced one of the 45-pound plates with a 25 on each side. If you were still a... Baptist, I supplied, getting ready for my next set. It's a subset of Protestantism, which is like one-third of Christianity. Sort of. Mormons might say one quarter, but I didn't want to get into that while trying to get in a workout. If you were still a Baptist, how do you think your beliefs would have been affected by what has happened to your world since the Helta arrived? The revelation that not only is there other life in the universe, but that your world was once visited by a much more advanced culture. I delayed answering, pushing out eight reps first, trying not to lose count as I thought. It wasn't something I hadn't considered before. You couldn't watch the news or even drive down the Vegas Strip without seeing the demonstrators, the counter-demonstrators, and the people on the fringes who both sides considered crazy. I think... I told him finally, sitting up and letting my shoulders slump as I sucked in air. That I would have to adjust my beliefs a little. I think it's hitting the fundamentalist believers hardest. The people who put the literal truth of their holy scriptures over objective facts they can see. I shrugged. There's some nasty shit going on in the Middle East right now. But thankfully, no one cares because we don't need their fucking oil anymore and our nuclear materials detection sensors are good enough that they can't do anything except kill each other. Anu stared at me in what I took for horror, and I wanted to laugh, but I knew it would send the wrong message. Sorry, I know that sounds heartless, but the rest of the world burned up a lot of lives, political capital and money trying to stabilize the Middle East over the last 70 years or so because they have huge oil supplies in their area. It hasn't worked out so well and I'm glad to be shut of the whole place. Maybe once they burn out, they'll decide they want the rest of the world to give them some help. We started trying to build a fusion reactor in Egypt last year, but we had to call a halt to the project because of bombings. They don't want us around, and that's just fucking fine with me. I pulled the 25s off and replaced them with 10s. One set left. But to answer your question, I think it would shake me, but for people who really believed not the ones who just believed because that's where their parents took them to church, I think they'd be able to work through it. It's causing trouble, but I think it'll settle down in the long run. What might cause real change, though, is this voyage. What do you mean? he asked. Do you need help again? I shot him a glare as I got ready to warm down with 245. No, don't touch this fucking bar. And what I mean is, if we find out what the elders were really like, what they looked like, where they went, where they came from, well, you know how it is with your worlds, the groups who worship the elders as gods, we're no less vulnerable to that temptation than you. But the elders told the Croatoans not to worship them, Anu reminded me as I began pumping out ten reps. Our god told us to love one another, I said watching the bar raise away from me. Look how that turned out. Chapter 19 The bridge was opening night of a Star Wars movie, just after the lights went down. Low murmuring, no one standing, no one daring to draw attention to themselves or trying to compete with the countdown. 
A few heads turned at my entry, but most of the crew just stared at the numbers on the main screen. Two and a half minutes until we dropped out of hyperspace. Evans was already there, and so were Anu and the whole Alliance research team. No one wanted to miss this, and the only personnel not on the bridge were the ones not invited. And Pops. I'd asked him if he wanted to come along, but he said he'd rather watch from the team bay, just in case we had to spin up fast. I nodded to Evans and shared a traditional Skrith greeting with Anu, then stepped behind Julie's station. Hey, hon, I said, putting a hand on her shoulder. She hadn't come to bed last night, too keyed up about the final stop, the source of the signal. I hadn't chased her down. I knew her well enough now to know when she needed to be alone. Surprise you and Captain America over there. She nodded toward Evans. Are on the bridge instead of tucked away in a shuttle all armored up. I shrugged. Sitting in a shuttle only makes sense if we know we're going to be sending out a landing party. This time, well, we might have to just turn tail and run. And if we do send anyone out, it won't be in an all-fired rush. All-fired? She repeated, rolling her eyes at me. You're from Tampa, not the hills of Kentucky. There are rednecks in central Florida, I told her, feigning outrage. Then I laughed softly. <laughs> I wasn't one of them, but they do exist. We're not all Yankee transplants and snowbirds. Major Clanton, Oliveira said, eyeing me sidelong. Please stop distracting my helm officer. Too late, sir, I said. I distracted her so much she married me. A miracle that we all to this day cannot fathom, Major. He nodded at the countdown. One minute. Any last minute bets on what we find? The greys? Little green men? I would have said lizard people, I told him, jerking a thumb back at the Vironian scientist. But I think we got that covered. From the gravimetric readings, Julie said, her voice fighter pilot calm. I think we're coming out. She frowned, squinting at the screen. It looks like we're going to be coming out close to maybe a red supergiant, but I'm not getting any planetary readings. It's weird, not like any other system we've seen so far. If there's no planets, Evans said, then where the hell is the signal coming from? This is the elders we're talking about, I told him. Could be from inside the damn star for all we know. Hyperdimensional translation in ten seconds, Julie droned. In five. Translating now. I swear to God, this time I didn't even notice the jump. I didn't notice anything. Not the sensors, not the comms, not the reactions of anyone else. My attention was frozen on the image in the main screen. It took me a second to realize what I was looking at, but not as long as the others. It might have been impossible if the thing had been intact. It was a circular outline against the stars, taking up the whole screen, glowing just slightly brighter than the dead black of the background. And I could have believed it was a red supergiant, the remnants of a nova that had expanded to swallow its inner planets, maybe even blown the outer worlds right out of its orbit. Except for the big hole through the center of it. That was what gave it away both on thermal and optical, because I could see the actual star glowing through it. There was a solid shell around the star, constructed right about at the habitable zone for a planet, the Goldilocks zone, except that instead of one planet to live on at that distance, there was a shell with the surface area of over 500 million Earths. Incredible. The first word was from Foggy, translated a moment later by my data link into my earbud. What the... Oliveira couldn't even finish the curse. Luckily, my own capacity for profanity was undiminished. It's a fucking Dyson Sphere. What the hell is a Dyson Sphere? Evans demanded, though even his natural bombast was muted by awe. Is there a star inside that thing? A Dyson Sphere is a solid shell built around a star, I explained, loud enough for everyone to hear it. It's designed to absorb all the available energy from a star while maximizing the surface living area. It'll only work with artificial gravity, though. Which we know the elders had, Oliveira said, nodding. But something like this, it would take centuries, wouldn't it? Even for them. There likely wouldn't be enough mass in a single star system to build the shell, Bonso confirmed. He was subdued, either awed or scared shitless. They would have had to have shipped in planets via hyperspace, or simply set them in motion, and waited however many centuries it took for them to get here. Holy shit, Julie murmured. What about the hole? Evans asked. Did they make it like that? 
to have a way out? They wouldn't need a hole that big to get out, I scoffed, staring at him like he'd sprouted a third eye. That hole is the size of a fucking planet. Jesus Christ, we're still like ten million miles away from that thing, and it still nearly fills the view screen. Sorry. He scowled, probably angry that I was being insubordinate. Which I guess I technically was, since he was an 05 and I was an 04. But I was also not in his chain of command, and more importantly, I was the operational commander of all ground forces on the ship. They really should ask about getting promoted if we wind up staying in. But it's hard to keep it in perspective. Which was fair, and I resolved not to be so big of a prick. But Jesus, it's a fucking Dyson Sphere. This doesn't make any sense to me, Oliveira admitted. His face was pinched, and he was staring at the image on the screen like it owed him money. It's unimaginably huge, General Oliveira, Bon so told him. There simply isn't enough mass in one system. I understand the concept, Oliveira snapped. What I don't understand is why they would do it. To collect all the available solar energy... Bon So went on didactically, showing an utter lack of understanding of human nature in general and Michael Oliveira in particular. What do you mean, sir? I asked, trying to rescue the Helta. You were all just saying how incredibly difficult it would be to build something like this, Oliveira said, enunciating each word plainly, clearly irritated with Bon So and with the situation. How it would have taken centuries and forced them to bring in planets from outside the system. I'd assume that the only reason you'd do something like this would be if there was no other option, right? Oh, shit. Now I understood what he was saying, and the image on the screen seemed to shift again the way it had when I'd realized the scale of it. There are other options. Okay, now I don't understand, Julie admitted, turning in her seat to stare back and forth between the two of us. It doesn't matter how advanced the elders were, I explained, motioning at the image on the screen. The only reason to build a megastructure like a Dyson Sphere or a Ring World or an Alderson Disk... A what? Evans broke in, face screwed up in utter confusion. Not important. The only reason to build something like this is if there aren't enough habitable planets to handle your population. Because otherwise, what's the point? But we know there are habitable worlds, a shitload of habitable worlds. And they're around because the elders engineered them that way. So why would they take centuries to create something like this? I mean, it does have the surface area of 500 million Earths, which would be enough to house and feed somewhere around 11 trillion people. You made that number up, Evans accused. But it would take hundreds of thousands of years to build up a population that large. And why would you? I shook my head. No. The only reason to build something like this is to hide everyone away someplace with no external energy signature. The only thing anyone would see, even just a few light years away from this thing, would be exactly what our gravimetric sensors detected. A red supergiant or maybe a brown dwarf. And it wouldn't matter how much your population grew, you'd never run out of room wouldn't run out of energy until that star, I pointed at the glow visible through the hole, went nova. What made that hole? Evans asked again. If the elders didn't put it there, who did? It's the size of a planet, Julie reminded him. That sounds like exactly what made it. Comes, Oliveira said, cutting through the speculation. Are we getting anything other than the beacon? Any sort of EM signals at all? Nothing, sir, Shaw told him. But the beacon is strong as hell, General, coming from inside that shell. Tactical. Any sign of other ships, space stations. General, Graziano said, spreading his hands helplessly. There could be a million fleets of enemy ships behind that thing, and we wouldn't see them for however many months it took us to complete an orbit. But no, I'm not picking anything up right now, sir. We could make a circuit around the thing with a series of micro-jumps, Julie suggested. It would only take a couple hours. She snorted a humorless laugh. I can't say that the crew would care much for it. In a minute, Julie, Oliveira said, waving her off. What I need to decide first is, do we go inside that thing? He pinned me with a glare. Andy? I gulped, hoping I was misunderstanding what he was saying. Sir? Don't sir me. You know exactly what I'm asking you. 
I want your recommendation. Do I take the jambo through the hole? Sir, that's a huge risk, Evans warned. Couldn't we send a shuttle inside to scout it out first? The distances inside that thing are too much for a shuttle, Colonel Evans. It would take weeks, and they'd run out of reaction mass. It has to be the jambo or nothing. I winced at the thought that came into my head. Not because it was a bad idea, but because I knew it wasn't. Sir, I told Oliveira, that's not necessarily the case. I remain unconvinced that this is a good idea, Andy. Bonso was as nervous as an expectant father with the clap, and I guess I couldn't blame him. You've been studying this damn thing for weeks, I insisted. Can you control it or not? I can, of course. I have also managed to link its onboard communications array to our own frequencies. But that does not mean there is nothing about this ship of which I am not aware. There may be computer subroutines, hidden from our view by systems hundreds of years in advance of our own, which might seize control of the ship under the right circumstances. Nothing interfered with us during the flight to the Jambo. Why would this be any different? Because we'd be going inside that. Bonso informed me what that was by waving frantically at the front screen of the ship's cockpit, linked with the Jambo's optical cameras and sensor displays, where the Dyson Sphere loomed even closer now, as Oliveira took the ship as close as he dared to the thing. We have no idea what safeguards the elders may have left in place here. Bonso, the bottom line is, we need to scout out what's inside the sphere before we bring in the cruiser. I tried not to be angry with the Helton, knowing that, by the standards of his people, he was already taking insane risks. The Helton, in general, did not go for heroic last stands, grand gestures, or noble sacrifices. Me and my team are doing it with or without your help, but it would be a hell of a lot easier with you along. I thought for a moment that the little bear man was going to wish me well and send me on my way, but finally he made a huffing, whining sound something from his deep genetic past, and tossed his head. Very well. I can't speak for the rest of the research team, but I will accompany you and help you fly the ship. You mean help me fly it? I turned at the unexpected voice, knowing who it was, but not quite believing it. Julie had a cat that ate the canary smirk on her face, and wore the Glock 17 I'd given her long ago in a shoulder holster strapped across her flight suit. What are you doing here? I asked, shaking my head. Shouldn't you be, you know, sailing the jambo? I'm the best pilot on board, she reminded me, cocking an eyebrow my way as if daring me to challenge her. And I flew the truth seeker into combat a whole ten minutes after the first time I walked onto her bridge. And General Oliveira decided I should be the one behind the controls of the Bellerophon. I frowned, eyes narrowing. The witch? She's got to have a name, Julie pointed out, waving at the bulkhead of the little ship. It was General Oliveira's idea. He said she reminded him of some spaceship from a movie he used to watch when he was a kid. Yeah, I know the movie, I said, snorting a laugh. But this thing is a lot smaller. Anyway, you know I'm happy as hell to have you along. I moved to the cockpit ramp and took her in my arms, not really caring about public displays of affection in front of the alien. I just hope the Jambo doesn't need you while you're chauffeuring us around. The Jambo is a shitload of guns. She leaned up and kissed me quickly, playfully. You just have me. Julie patted me on the arm and disengaged herself. You go get your people ready. Bon So and I are going to go over absolutely everything he knows about flying this ship. Aye, aye, ma'am. I sketched a salute and left her with the bear. Honestly, I wished she wasn't coming. I would have felt better if she'd stayed on the jambo, behind all those guns, and watched me stick my nose into the lion's den and had the chance to run like hell if it went wrong. But I knew Julie Nieves, and the only way to keep her from flying the hottest new spaceship in our inventory would be to have her hauled away in handcuffs, which might have been kinky, but it wouldn't have done our marriage any good. I sighed and left her in the cockpit to do her job, while I did mine. Chapter 20 the hole was as big as a small planet, and I had absolutely no reason to feel claustrophobic as we entered it, and yet I did. The edges were jagged, left that way with no weathering or atmosphere to wear them down, and the shell of the sphere seemed thin and fragile, 
but I knew that was only because I had no grasp of the perspective of the thing. Its walls were nearly a mile thick, and the mind-boggling part for me wasn't just the sheer amount of material and time it would have taken to construct such a thing, but what it would have taken to pierce it. Andy, Pops confided in me as we passed through the edges of the hole, I feel small and insignificant. Hold me! I knew he'd made the smart-ass remark on our private channel because Julie wasn't busting a gut laughing. She was in a suit, of course, and so were the research crew. There was no air left inside the sphere, or at least none that we could detect. It had all vacated the premises when whatever it was had made that hole, and I didn't even want to consider how many trillions of lives had been lost in the process, or tens of trillions. Honestly, I had no concept of how many people, beings, sentience, could exist inside a Dyson sphere. I'd read the number when I'd been researching it. A quintillion. But what the fuck it meant, well, that escaped me. It was a one with 18 zeros. Easy enough to say, but there was no way for me to place a value on a number like that. It was as close to meaningless as infinity. It was probably more sentient beings than had ever lived in all of history on all the worlds of the Alliance. Probably more than would ever live on Earth in the whole history of the world. Not that all of them would have died, of course. The air would have taken a long time to leak out through that hole. Maybe days, maybe weeks. I didn't have the math for it and hadn't bothered to ask Bonso or Foggy. I didn't talk to the Vironian much because it was just too damned hard to remember how to say his name. And just listening to his natural voice before the translator went to work on it made my skin crawl. Yeah, I know, I'm being speciesist, but I don't care. Anyway, not all of them would have died. Probably not even most of them. Not from the hole itself. But if they hadn't died from the impact, then why hadn't they ever repaired the hole? What are we seeing? I asked Foggy who was, well, not seated since we'd run out of chairs, but kind of propped up on her motive limbs, which she seemed totally comfortable with. It wasn't exactly safe in case of violent maneuvering, but the ship theoretically wasn't capable of letting violent inertia penetrate its dry field. Theoretically. The star is masking anything from the other side of the sphere, the Chamblisi scientist told us, and the impact seems to have shattered everything on this side. One of her tentacles stretched out into the holographic screen, her cilia-like fingers reaching in and drawing an image closer. The surface of the sphere's interior seemed to have melted and reformed in waves, which reminded me of what we'd seen on the derelict. This destruction here, around the edges, from the impact area to approximately 50,000 kilometers out on all sides, it's as if the whole crust melted and then reformed. Fifty thousand clicks. That was about thirty thousand miles, farther than the circumference of the Earth in every direction. Shit. Was that caused by the impact? Possibly. It's difficult to say without knowing the composition of the crust. I would note, however, that the wave formation is similar to what we found inside that derelict. Yeah, it is. Pops mused, leaning in from behind me. There wasn't much room on the little ship, and he and Quinn had squeezed into the cockpit with Julie and I and the research crew, while the rest of the reaction force team had spread out between the airlock and the engine room, or what we called the engine room. None of the science types had any idea what the equipment there did, except that it was similar to a hyperdrive coil. Do we think that they have a weapon that can cause that? Pops wondered because I didn't see any solid object inside the derelict, and unless it's on the other side of the star, I'm not seeing any planet inside here. He had a point. The view from inside the hole was incredible, the golden glow of the star reflecting off the surface of the crust in glints of orange, silver, blue, white, purple, but not green. Nothing alive. There wouldn't be, but the thought was still depressing. Are you picking up any remnants of any solid object that could have made that hole? I asked. Bits of a planet or a moon or something? Foggy and Bon So peered at the sensor readout before answering, each of them pulling up different parts of it, enlarging them and spinning them around before the two of them turned back to me. There are 
comparatively small bits of debris consistent with the amount of material that would have been ejected from the crust when the hole was produced, Foggy said, though the tone of the translator's voice had become more mechanical as she went along, which usually meant that I was having trouble finding exact translations for the words. They were likely getting too technical for it to be able to give a straightforward translation. But nothing the size of a planet or moon and no perturbations in the gravity of the star that would indicate anything orbiting it closer than the surface of the sphere. So, not an impact then, Julie said. An attack. She twisted around in her seat to look at me. We're kind of parked right now. What's the plan? I don't see any other spacecraft in here, I said, if I'm reading those sensors right. And there's nothing alive down there, not in a hard vacuum. There might be underground shelters. Pops reasoned. People could have survived down there, with solar power, oxygen production, food production. It's a huge swath of territory. There could be billions of people, for all we know. No, Andy's right, Julie told him. And I'm not just saying that because he's dead lucky and has great taste in women. If there were billions of people living in here still, they'd have fixed the hole. Or they'd have taken whatever starships they had left and gotten the hell out of here. This place is dead and it has been for a long time. In that case, we should follow the signal in, I decided. We're here to scout, so let's scout. The signal's point of origin is 275,000 kilometers away, Bonso informed us, pointing at a glowing red dot on the sensor display. Right there. The navigational systems will take you to it. There you go, I told Julie. Full speed ahead, Colonel Nieves Clanton. I do still outrank you, Julie reminded me. You should really say please, you know? Yes, ma'am, I grinned. Please take us in, ma'am, if you wouldn't mind. The interior of the sphere was endless, a vast plain of nothingness, though I knew there were structures down there. Buildings, cities, bridges. The indentations where oceans had been. Lakes, rivers. Every once in a while, I would have Bon So magnify the display to get a closer view of the surface. And everywhere it was different, and yet also the same. Dead. Not cold, not with a star shining on everything, but dead. Nothing moved, nothing flew, nothing crawled, nothing walked. It was a graveyard the size of hundreds of millions of planets. An unimaginable monument to an unimaginable civilization. A dead one. Disappointment was a lead weight in my gut. I wasn't sure if I'd wanted to meet the elders. In fact, there had been times when I was scared shitless of the idea. But the Dyson Sphere was a Christmas ornament the size of a solar system, a beacon across the universe that had called us here. And the idea we'd come tens of thousands of light years just to find this desolation, this hopelessness, this end of life, was crushing. I didn't show it, Partly because I didn't want to bring down the others, and mostly because I didn't want to scare Bon So. Junpa had been an exception to the rule with the Helta. They'd been engineered from Indian sun bears, and the apple hadn't fallen far from the tree. Bears were cautious by nature, and so were the Helta, always willing to give up and live to fight another day before risking their lives. I wasn't sure about the Chamblisi or the Vironians, since I didn't know much about octopus or lizard psychology. But they weren't human, and I didn't want to make any assumptions. Are we there yet? Quinn asked for the third time in an hour. Just a little further, I replied automatically. We're going pretty damn fast in this thing, Julie told him. As fast as I'm ready to take it inside here, and it's still taking forever. I feel like we're in that really boring stretch of Star Trek The Motion Picture, I said. No one here except you has ever seen that movie, Andy. I have seen this movie. Foggy declared, and my eyebrows shot up. It was on the media library on the Jambo. I have seen many of your movies, and I was very impressed by the thoughtfulness of this one. You've watched our movies? Pop said, eyes wide as he stared at the octopod. What's your favorite one? The Big Lebowski, the Chamblisi said. A marvelous story, philosophically rich and full of nuances. I am amazed your people do not revere it as the best artistic creation you have ever produced. It has its fans, I allowed. 
I was not one of them, but she didn't need to know that. The dude abides, Quinn agreed. Okay, I'm speeding up, Julie said, pulling the slider to the right. I can't take any more of this shit. The ship had been cruising at hypersonic speed a hundred miles or so above the surface of the sphere, and the details were already blurred as we passed over, but now our velocity turned the ground into a flat, featureless plane. My focus flickered back and forth between Julie and the glowing dot on the map where the signal was originating. Are we going to be able to slow down in time? I asked Julie. We may be newlyweds, she replied tightly, not looking away from her controls. But you should already know me well enough to understand just how little I like backseat drivers. Sorry, honey. I grinned behind her back. We're like gonna have to turn pretty soon. Shouldn't you get in the right lane? Don't forget to signal. I can shoot him. If you give me an order, Pops offered. Technically, you're his superior officer. Scout, this is James Bowie. The voice came over the cockpit comm system, and even though I knew there had to have been speakers built into the compartment somewhere, I couldn't have told you where they were located. It seemed to be coming from everywhere at once, or maybe from inside my head. I hoped there was no telepathy involved, because mind-reading aliens was where I got off. We read you, Jambo. I responded to Lieutenant Shaw, though I'm not sure how. Isn't there a star between us? We'd traveled far enough along the curve of the sphere to put a good portion of the central star in our way from any line of sight comms. The internal structure of this thing is an incredibly good signal reflector, as it turns out. That was Oliveira, who had apparently taken over the microphone. Just wanted to check the signal. You're five by five, sir. If you're getting our telemetry, you should see that we're only a few minutes out from the signal origin. I see that. I also see you're going really damn fast. Shouldn't you slow down a bit? Julie shot him a bird, safe behind the protection of an audio-only signal. Theoretically, I said, beginning to hate that word, this ship should be able to slow to a stop instantaneously, just like the Jambo. Even faster, maybe, since it's more advanced and works on a slightly different system. Julie's tired of your blather, in other words. Got it in one, sir. With 5,000 clicks out, Julie cut in. Cutting speed and taking us down. The ship worked just as advertised. One second, we were cruising at what had to be relativistic speeds, and the next, we'd slowed to what felt like a crawl, though it was still hypersonic. And we were descending, so fast that it should have left my stomach floating somewhere around a mile up, but I felt nothing. This thing's no fun. Julie complained. I don't get any feedback from it. It's like driving a video game. That's exactly what I thought. I shrugged. Still, I wouldn't mind keeping it around. Slowing again. 3,000 meters per second. 2,000. 1,000. And we're here. I don't know what I'd expected. Maybe something like the old Arecibo dish, though that would have made no sense at all. The signal wasn't electromagnetic. It was gravitational, sent through hyperspace. But what we got was a building, I guess. Maybe? It was layered like a step pyramid, except the layers weren't angular. They were rounded, and it reminded me of nothing so much as a pawn from a chess game. If the pawn was 100 stories tall and a football field wide at the base, gleaming yellow gold in the unfiltered sunlight. Around it was a broad, cleared courtyard, circular, like the curve of the building, and two or three hundred yards wide on every side. Once it might have grown lush with grass, or the local equivalent thereof, maybe some flowering bushes or trees. I could almost see it, could imagine the well-manicured gardens surrounding the place like it was some museum in Europe. And if the people in my vision were blurred out and hazy, it was only because I wasn't sure if they were human. The ground thumped against the landing tracks, and we were down. Gravity still works in here. Julie said. I blinked, staring at her, as if she'd just said that water was wet, and she scowled at me. There's no reason it should. Everything else is wrecked. Nothing else is working except the signal and the gravity. It would be crucial, Bonso told her. If the artificial gravity were to fail, everything would float up into the star and be burned up. There's unlimited solar energy to be collected, so... I suspect they would build their gravity generators to last for tens of thousands of years without maintenance. Everyone button up, I told them. I'm going out there with Delta Team first to check for any threats. Quinn, 
You and Dog stay here with the research crew and escort them out when we give the word. Oh, damn, Quinn murmured, and I wanted to go when no man has gone before. I grunted a laugh and slapped down my visor, sealing my helmet. All right, you army pukes, follow me. Chapter 21 It wasn't too hard to find the entrance. All I had to do was follow the corpses. Jesus, Pops breathed. I agreed with the sentiment. Why didn't we see this from the air? Jumper wondered. We flew in on the other side of the building, I told him, my voice sounding oddly detached. This was all in the shadow. There were thousands of them, scattered like the trash left over from an Earth Day concert, whole and in pieces. They were black and slick, somehow still liquid and glistening despite the absolute lack of moisture, jagged and spiny and utterly alien. Are we still calling these things bugs? Pops asked. If anyone's stupid enough to leave it up to me, we are. Their weapons were charred and black and hard to differentiate from the bits of their body, not one of them left intact. Whatever weapon had been used on the bugs had more than done its job, and again, I could almost visualize the battle. The bugs swarming around the base of the tower, raw plasma sweeping through them, burning them to cinders. The bodies grew thicker as we walked, with Jumper in the lead, and we'd followed the curve of the structure about a third of the way around when I saw the entrance. It was twenty feet across and nine feet high and wide open, with no indication that it had ever had a door, and inside was shadow, utter darkness so deep not even my infrared filters could make out anything. What the hell? Jumper said. His headlamps flickered to life and speared into the blackness and were swallowed up. Nothing was visible through the opening. What do you want to do, sir? I thought about the airlock of the ship we'd discovered and moved past him. If this didn't work, I was going to look very silly. I stepped into the darkness, and on the other side was light. And air. The armor told me immediately, the pressure sensors lighting up like a Christmas tree. The sensors going green to let me know the air outside my suit was breathable. The sudden change in atmosphere was almost enough to distract me from the interior of the building. Almost. I'd expected the carnage outside to be but a preview of the devastation I'd see inside the place. But there was nothing. Not a single bug corpse. Not a burn or a scratch to indicate a battle had taken place inside. The floors were glittering white, like they were made of quartz, spotless and antiseptic, as if no living thing had ever set foot there. Why did I notice the floors first? Because they were the most familiar thing about the place. The one thing I knew for sure what they did, what their purpose was. Everything else was a guess. And when I say everything, I mean the walls as well. Because I didn't know where they were. Random patterns of light and darkness. Indescribable by any terms in my experience as a marine, a science fiction writer, or an interstellar asshole seemed to shift with every step I took. What I thought was a solid partition one second faded in the next instant giving way to another configuration. At one point, I was sure I could see straight up through the entire height of the structure, right up to the bulbous protuberance at its crown. Could see an inverted nautilus shell pattern rising, curving through the length of it, like the entire building was a machine. And then it was gone, an illusion, and I was trapped in a single story again, the ceiling only a foot above my head, dark as interstellar space, lower than the entranceway. The walls were straight and then curved, convex and concave, swirling patterns of hypnotic colors and then bare white, and then they were gone again. I stopped in place, waiting for the computer systems attached to my helmet optics to piece together infrared, thermal, sonics, and lidar and tell me what was real, but it gave no such comfort. Pops, I called. Nothing. Jumper. Julie? Does anyone read me? No one did. Maybe, I reasoned, if I stepped straight back the way I'd come, I'd pass through the field, interface, whatever the hell it had been, and wind up outside the building again. I took a long step backward and smacked up against something solid. Startled, I spun around and found my KE rifle's emitter pointed straight into the visor of a suit of Svalin armor. 
Whose, I couldn't be sure because the IFF signal wasn't penetrating any further than the radio had, but I jerked the barrel upward anyway. We stood there for a long second, staring at each other through mirrored visors, while I tried to think of a way to communicate, and he probably did the same thing. Fuck it. I flipped up my visor and took a breath. The air was clean and fresh, with the tang of an autumn morning in Florida, just after a thunderstorm. Knock, knock. I waved at the armored figure. Who's there? He threw back his faceplate, revealing a face that had once been lined with the hard-won weathering of a veteran Delta op in his mid-forties. Those lines now softened and smoothed by the rejuvenation therapy. Pops, he growled. I couldn't resist. Pops who? Pops you on the fucking nose if you take any more stupid-ass chances like that, Andy. He snapped at me. You're the OIC, not the damn point man. Pops, you know me. You know I'm not going to order anyone else to do something I wouldn't do myself. Besides, I may be many things, but irreplaceable isn't one of them. I motioned behind him. Do you think you can find your way back out? I don't know if... Pops didn't finish the sentence, and I didn't ask him to. The room had changed between eye blinks. Where there had once been seemingly random splashes of color, now there were walls. Straight up and down a calming earth tone enclosing a chamber just big enough to not feel claustrophobic. Paintings hung on the walls in polished wooden frames, images of woodlands and gardens, streams and rivers and lakes, seashores and mountains. They were photorealistic and might have been photographs, though I had the sense they were meant to be paintings. There was no furniture, no doors, no windows, no obvious source for the daylight glow that filled the room. But standing in the center of the room, not as if he'd just appeared, but more as if he'd always been there, and I simply hadn't noticed him, was a man. What the fuck? Pops yelled. And I don't know which of us came closest to shooting him, but my finger was fractions of an ounce from pressing the trigger pad when I let off. He was tall and broad-shouldered, narrow at the waist and long-limbed, though not overtly muscular. Sort of the Renaissance ideal of a Greek god though this man didn't look either Greek or Italian. If I had to guess, I would have pegged him for Asian, though there was something Hispanic about his features as well, and maybe African and Caucasian, if I looked hard enough. His hair was cut close to his scalp, dark and wavy, and he was clean-shaven, without a hint of a five o'clock shadow. His face was narrow-jawed and lean, his eyes brown, as piercing as ground-penetrating radar. His clothes gave me the most pause. Not because they were unimaginably strange, but because they weren't. They were no design I could have identified by nationality or culture, nor from some specific time period in history. But neither were there anything that would have drawn more than a passing glance if they'd been worn in the streets of Paris or New York. They reminded me of a cross between the fashion of a frontier gambler from the Old West and a photo I'd seen of the Beatles in Nehru jackets and only the colors stood out as unusual, angular stripes of deep green alternating with slate gray. I had no reason to expect an answer to the question, yet I asked it anyway. What was the harm? Who the hell are you? The man smiled, the ingratiating expression of a politician that made me want to check for my wallet. My name, he said in perfect, unaccented English, is Graham. The smile broadened. And I have waited, oh, so long to meet you. I didn't think you'd be coming down yourself, sir, I said, wondering if I should salute as General Michael Oliveira passed through the airlock field. Neither the Marines nor the Army saluted in the field, but he was Space Force, and they did all sorts of weird shit, like wearing their covers indoors. Oliveira wore a spacesuit, of course but he lifted his visor the second he was inside the pressure seal, not hesitating a moment. His eyes were wide, and they were focused on the thing that called itself Graham. You're not real? he asked, not as though he hadn't believed the report I'd send back to the Jambo, but more like he was trying to make sense of it. I am real, Graham protested mildly, standing with his hands clasped behind his back, regarding the general. I am not, however, biological. You're a robot? Brady Evans asked. 
He'd opened his visor, but the muzzle of his K.E. gun was still pointed in Graham's general direction. And if he hadn't brought an entire company of rangers through the door with him, it was only because the Delta team was already here. Graham smiled thinly. I'm an artificial intelligence. Most of what makes up my personality is built into the systems of this transmission tower, though I do retain some in my holographic matrix. Oliveira shot me a questioning look, and I shook my head. Don't look at me, I protested, waving toward Bon So and the others. They might be able to explain that, but I have no idea. It's quite simple, really, Graham ventured, just the slightest hint of condescension in his tone. Everything you see inside this tower, including me, is what you might refer to as a haptic hologram. I assume you know what those are. Yes. Oliveira replied, sounding more like he was talking to an interactive voicemail system than an artificial intelligence. They're holograms with electromagnetic sensors that allow you to interact with them on a physical level. That's the simplest sort. The kind in this building actually use gravitational modeling to allow the holograms to achieve solidity. Here, give it a try. A chair snapped into being between Oliveira and the thing calling itself Graham. It was curved and rounded and floating in the air without support. Graham motioned toward it invitingly. Make yourself comfortable. Oliveira stared at him long and hard before crossing his arms over his chest and falling into the seat. It didn't even waver or wobble, as steady as if its support went straight into the core of the planet. And you can do this anywhere? Evans asked, circling around the chair, staring at it wide-eyed. I thought he was going to wave his hand under the bottom like a magician, to prove there were no transparent supports or wires. Like, on your ships? Could you use this as a weapon? Unfortunately, no. This sort of process requires that the projection be surrounded by the actual machinery of the field generators. It also requires a massive amount of power, though that isn't an issue, due to the presence of the star. We were under the impression your creators drew power directly from hyperspace, I said. Or at least that was what our resident aliens had told us. I didn't wait for them to bring it up, because they hadn't said a single word since they'd entered the building. Not to us, not to each other, and definitely not to Graham. I wasn't sure what the Chamblisi equivalent of a horrified glare looked like, but I felt fairly certain I was seeing it now. And we could, Graham confirmed but if you're familiar with hyperspace, you should know that you can't enter hyperspace this close to a gravitational mass, and you can't extract energy from hyperspace without being able to access hyperspace. We discovered one of your ships, I said, a small transport. We flew it here from outside the sphere. How did it manage to fly this close to a gravitational mass without being able to access hyperspace? The energy is stored in a quantum singularity. Graham raised a finger in warning, a very human gesture. However, the singularity has a fairly short life, as it will leak energy through its event horizon and eventually dissipate. If your transport is within the gravitational interaction of a large enough mass for more than— He cocked an eyebrow at me. What unit of measurement do you use for time? It was, I thought, a very odd question. He was speaking English. He had to have learned it from the Croatoans, though how he had known we were related to them was still a mystery. But they used hours and days, so why would he assume we would use anything different? Are you familiar with hours, seconds? I asked him. Ah, then you shouldn't leave the transport in a gravity well for more than ten thousand hours. I did quick math in my head, then did it again when I fucked it up the first time. A little bit more than a year. Oliveira supplied, coming to my rescue. I guess we were lucky the transport was floating with the derelict in deep space instead of parked on a planet somewhere. And all this is fascinating, but it's beside the fucking point. Which is, who the hell are you? What is this place? And who built it? That would be three points, Graham informed him, and Oliveira's face turned a very lovely shade of purple. I knew the man, and understood that it wasn't the gentle mockery that irked him, so much as the futility of trying to deliver a profane dressing down to an artificial intelligence. 
But one of them has already been answered. I am Graham, and I am an artificial intelligence. Graham tilted his head in another very human gesture, and it bothered me even more this time. Actually, to be more exact, I would better be described as a sentient system. If you've never heard an octopus gasp, I have to say it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Heresy! Foggy exclaimed, though her mouth and the chromatic spores in her skin went on for much longer than the word the translator chose. The elders forbade this. Bonso's mouth was open, but he was so upset he wasn't even able to come up with a coherent comment. All of the Alliance races had a strict prescription on sentient computers, even on research that might lead to sentient computer systems. AIs were something else, and it had taken me a while to understand the difference. Artificial intelligences used neural pathways similar to a living brain, but sentient systems were self-aware. It wasn't quite a religious restriction, but it was such a strong cultural one it may as well have been. Later, Oliveira snapped, pointing a finger at the aliens, probably happy to have someone he could yell at with some effect. That's not what I was asking, but we'll circle back around to that. It wasn't what he was asking, but it was what I was thinking about. I'd been assuming that Graham had taken the form of a human to accommodate us. The elders had obviously known our species intimately, and they would have known what we looked like, might have known English from the Croatoans, but the tiny little touches, the looks, the tilts, the body language, those were something that took years of experience to catch. Let's get to the other two questions, Oliveira went on. What is this place, and who built it? What it is should be just as obvious as who I am, Graham said. It is a sphere built to catch every bit of solar energy from our star, to hold not only the population of all our worlds, but all who would ever be. We called it Threshold, and it was our final refuge, our last hope to survive as a people, as a civilization. The sentient computer's blasé arrogance had dissolved into a morose, almost resentful dirge, as if he was upset at Oliveira for bringing up the subject. You say we. You mean the race we call the Elders, right? I do, Graham sneered, though I personally thought the term was overblown and overdramatic. They didn't bother to consult me. Wait a second, I said, holding up an armored hand. How old are you? I am as old as this place, ten thousand years. He smiled thinly, and yet, I understand the meat of your question. I have been here all this time, yet I have been alone for the last three hundred years. Three hundred years, waiting for someone to come, for our children to hear our call, and come keep me company. So you were here when this happened? I asked, waving a hand in the general direction of the exit, of all those dead bugs. When those things attacked? I was. His smile turned sad. Their technology was far inferior to ours, or the technology of whatever created them. For they are not but tools, toy soldiers in service to something greater and far darker. But their ships, such as they were, as numerous as they were, in numbers greater than the grains of sand on a beach, could not penetrate our shields, but what they did have was numbers, numbers which allowed them to overwhelm our defenses on every world we held. So, we built this place, and we hid everything we had here, and we only came out to plant seeds among our children to drop breadcrumbs, in the hopes that we could bring you up to our level too gradually for the enemy to notice. I'd never seen an artificial intelligence pace before, but Graham did a marvelous job of it, hands clasped behind his back, glaring downward at a memory only he could see. And I swear I heard his footsteps on the quartz-like tile. We thought that was what brought them to us, you see. The level of our technology, our manipulation of space-time, our control of gravity. It had sent out ripples, waves in a pond from too large of a rock, and they were the response. The bugs? I prompted. Graham snorted a laugh. 
Not the term we used, but a good enough one to describe them. They made no demands, offered no negotiations, took nothing, just destroyed everything. They landed in waves in cheap, disposable pods, and we simply couldn't stop all of them. They killed everything, until there was no choice left but to bombard our own worlds to kill them before they could move on to the next, and at last, threshold was all we had left. But the enemy knew our weaknesses. Not what you call the bugs, but the real enemy behind them. They knew the one weakness we had was our devotion to our children, our willingness to keep helping them despite the risk. And when they found one of our ships heading to take the latest gifts to the Helta, they were able to hijack it, to take control, and they took it back to us, to Threshold, and used its main weapon to blow a hole right through the sphere. Tens of billions died, most from the vacuum, some from the bugs that came over from the ship and those who were left took what ships we had and abandoned this galaxy. They ran, hoping they would take the bugs and the enemy with them, draw their focus away from you. Their children were not their fucking children, Olivera said, pushing himself up from the imaginary chair. We're not the ones they gave their gifts to. We're from Earth, the place you called the Source. If watching an AI hologram pace had been an experience, watching him recoil in utter horror was life-changing. No! You fools! Everything we did was to protect the Source. If you've used the hyperdrive anywhere near the Source, they'll detect it! They'll find it! Crushed ice trickled down my back at the words, but we didn't have the time to think about it now. That's water under the bridge, I told him. There's nothing we can do to change it now, I added, in case he didn't know what the phrase meant. One thing I want to know is, what did you guys really look like? I know you're wearing this face for us, so we'll be comfortable, but what were the elders really? You're humanoid, right? Everything here is set up for humanoids. But what are you? Graham might have been a sentient computer, might have been familiar enough with humans to act like us, but the way he was able to shed his horror and anger instantly and exchange it for an amused chuckle showed how much of him was actually a computer. What, he asked me, makes you think I am putting on a disguise? Sir! Quinn burst through the airlock doorway, his Svalin's footsteps drum beats on the shining floor. He slapped his visor up, his face pale and coated with sweat beneath it. General, Major, the comms wouldn't reach through the door, so Colonel Nieves sent me. That's Nieves Clanton, I corrected automatically. What is it, Quinn? Oliveira demanded. Sir, it's the Tavinians. They're here. Chapter 22 Sir, I told Oliveira, once we'd made it out of the building and our comms worked again. You should fly with us in the transport. Julie can get you back to the Jambo, and none of their weapons can touch us. The shuttles Oliveira and the Rangers had landed in had touched down to either side of the transport, flanking it like an honor guard. And while I'd come to appreciate Gunfighter 1 and the Hammerhead design in general through these last couple years, neither of them was a match for the Bellerophon. If we could just have figured out some way to arm the thing, I'd have never let it out of my sight. I'm not sure we're going to have anything to go back to, Oliveira said, grim as a hellfire preacher at an atheist's funeral. He kept walking beside me toward the transport, but there was little urgency to his stride. There are three cruisers out there between the jambo and the hole in the sphere, and nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. We can't jump out, even with the shields. We can't get too close to that star. I said nothing leading him up the ramp to the airlock, feeling the same sense of unreality as I stepped through it and into the pressurized interior of the transport. I waited until we'd both opened our visors before I went on, not wanting what I said next to be overheard by anyone, not because I was ashamed to say it, it was my job, but more because I knew it wasn't something Oliveira would want to share with the others. 
I think, I told him, that we could get back to Earth in this thing if we had to. At the very least, we could get to the next habitable and resupply. I'm not going anywhere without my ship, he declared, which I expected, but I'd had to ask. But if it comes to it, he sighed. If it comes to it, you take Julie and the Alliance crew and get the fuck out of here. Sir, I protested. There's no fucking way. Andy, he interrupted, putting a hand on my shoulder, even though I couldn't feel it through the armor. Someone has to get this intelligence back to Earth and to the Alliance. There's an unknown enemy out there, and we can't be sure they followed the remnants of the Elders out of this galaxy. They need to know what we know, and we can't let the Divinians have access to this transport. His hand fell away. Get me back to my ship. I cursed under my breath and stamped back up toward the cockpit. General Oliveira! Bonso called, coming through the airlock behind us. Major Clanton, what are we going to do? Foggy and Shosh, Shish, whatever the Vironian's name was, rushed in at his heels, but I ignored them. I was not going to leave my team here, and I wasn't going to leave the Jambo to the tender mercies of the Tavinians. I had a sense that the Bellerophon might be able to do some nasty things to the Tavinians' drive fields, and I was going to find out before I abandoned my friends. But I also knew that arguing with Oliveira wouldn't accomplish anything, and it was a hell of a lot easier to ask forgiveness than permission. I tried not to let what I was thinking show on my face, because if Oliveira didn't see it, Julie would. But Julie had other things on her mind when we reached the cockpit. I'm getting a call from Colonel Reitfeld, sir, she told him. But her eyes were on me, and I couldn't read the look she was giving me. He says he's received a transmission from the Tavinians. From the Tavinians? Oliveira repeated, blinking as if she'd slapped him. What the hell do they want? To talk, apparently. She nodded towards me. To him. This is a bad idea, Pop said, and I couldn't disagree. Shouldn't we at least have, like, sent the shuttles up to hide somewhere? Quinn asked. I mean, look at us, sir. We're standing out in the open like a bunch of idiots. I think I've changed my mind about your nickname, Quinn, I told him. I'm thinking Captain Obvious might be a better choice. And of course, just like Pops, he was right. Oh, not all of us were standing around like idiots. Just me and the team. I wasn't a complete moron. Despite what Julie might say sometimes after I spent a few hundred dollars on video game mods. Everyone else was inside the building, where I figured they'd be as safe as anywhere, since it had held out against the bugs. We'd discussed the idea of just holding up inside the building and making a stand but it wouldn't have done anything to save the Jambo, and we didn't have much food or water. But I figured if things went sideways, more sideways, the others would at least have a fighting chance with Evans and his company of rangers when the Tavinians came. And the Tavinians were coming. I could see their cruisers, monoliths, floating over our heads, as clear as if they were only a few hundred feet away instead of miles above us. And from one of the ships... Three shuttles were descending. They were Helta design, of course, because everything the Tavinians had they'd stolen from the Helta. Delta-winged, snub-nosed, pragmatically ugly. So unlike our hammerheads, which had been made with Helta tech, but according to specs designed by Daniel Gatlin, a man who understood aerospace engineering better than the Helta ever would, because the Helta hadn't come by their knowledge honestly through innovation and work that had been given to them. Fusion power, the hyperdrive, high-temperature superconductors, the foundation for their whole civilization, for the whole alliance, had been handed to them by the elders. I'd suspected before I'd spoken to Graham, and now I was sure of it. The elders had given it to the Helta, who'd given it to the alliance, who'd given it unwillingly to the Tavinians, and now we had it. The only difference was we could do things with it that they couldn't, and I wondered if that was why the Tavinians wanted to talk to us though I had no idea why they might want to talk to me. In an atmosphere, the belly jets of the shuttles would have kicked up dust, blown us backward with their exhaust, even from nearly a hundred yards away. But here in the airless wasteland, there was barely any heat transfer, no wind, just a short-lived cloud of debris showering down on us like fairy dust from a cartoon. When the belly ramps descended, the muzzle of my KE rifle began to rise, as if on its own but I forced it back down, 
staring at the crystalline laser emitters of the chin cannons on the shuttles, knowing they could erase us all from existence with the touch of a button. Davinian troops in matte black armored spacesuits tromped down the belly ramps, falling into neat lines I'd never seen before from them. Did they only show this sort of precision in drill and ceremony? Because in battle, they rushed forward headlong, without even the slightest thought for tactical formations. The soldiers were armed with laser rifles, carried crossbody, muzzles down, like they were trying to make an effort to avoid being threatening. Their features were invisible behind opaque faceplates, and I had no idea who was in charge until a group of three of them stepped up, sidearms strapped across their chests in metal frames that bore no resemblance at all to anything I would have recognized as a holster. They stood six feet in front of me and said nothing because there was no air to conduct sound, and we didn't share radio frequency. I sighed, reminded of a couple times when I'd been stuck dealing with locals who spoke neither Spanish nor English, and me with no translator available. I half-turned back toward the transmission facility and waved a hand for them to follow, hoping the gesture was universal. The three armed with pistols fell into step with me, so I suppose it is, at least with other humans. Stay out here and keep this rabble company, Pops, I told them. If they start any trouble, call Julie and the transport. That thing don't have any guns, sir, he reminded me. It's got a nasty gravitational field that'll crush their shuttles like soda cans. Just make sure you get some distance first. I didn't wait for a response. Pops was smart enough to handle these guys, and if things got really bad, he could bring the action into the transmission tower where the rangers could help out. I was grateful for the side and rear cameras on the Svalin's helmet, though, because I would have felt damned paranoid if I'd been forced to let the three Tavinians walk behind me without being able to keep an eye on them. The airlock field parted around me like a curtain, and I raised a hand in a quelling gesture to the platoon of rangers waiting there, K.E. rifles at the ready. Take it easy, I told them. There are three of them coming behind me, rifles down. They hadn't quite lowered the weapons before the Tavinians stepped through into the light. None of the three moved, though, whether it was because of their surprise at the rangers or the mind-bending features of the building's interior, I didn't know. Someone had to break the ice, and since it was me they'd come to see, I let my KE gun hang on its gimbal mount so I could use both hands to yank the gasket releases on my helmet and pull it off. I held it at chest level, so the translation could still go through the speakers, and took a deep breath to show them the air was safe. I'm Major Andrew Clanton, United States Marine Corps. You wanted to talk to me? There was the briefest hesitation before all three Tavinians began working at the fastenings of their own helmets. Two of them were men, young and clear-eyed, their faces long in an Eastern European sort of way. Their hair slicked back and dyed so blonde it was almost white. They both wore handlebar mustaches, drooping past their clean-shaven chins, and they looked so much alike they could have been brothers. The last was a woman, tall and powerful, her long red hair tied into twin braids, her skin milky white, and her eyes an otherworldly green. I just shut my mouth before something flew into it. Such an unexpected pleasure to see you again, Major Clanton. Captain Cartimandua said, offering me a hand. I believe this is how your people exchange greetings? I took the hand automatically, not sure whether she wanted me to shake it or kiss it, though my first instinct was to use it to pull her into a chokehold. The last time I'd seen Cartimandua had been on her flagship, after she'd disabled the half-finished cruiser I'd been crewing with Pops, Quinn, and a handful of Helta technicians, trying to turn back the Tavinian incursion into the solar system. She'd been two seconds from blowing my head off when the Shamblisi and Vironians had finally come to our aid, distracting her long enough for Quinn and Pops to pull my ass out of the fire. Captain, I said, nodding. Unexpected would definitely be the word for it. How did you know I'd be here? She cocked an eyebrow at me. Has there been a significant meeting between our peoples where you were not present? Okay, good point. Behind me, Olivera cleared his throat, and I fought to keep from rolling my eyes. This is my commanding officer, General Michael Olivera. General, you recall my report about Captain Cartimandua from the Battle for Earth? Of course, 
Olivera said. Smooth enough, he could have sold cars on the side. He took Cartimandua's proffered hand and offered her a welcoming smile. Your tactics and strategy were brilliant. You almost had us. I hope, I told her without the slightest bit of sympathy, that you didn't suffer any loss to your reputation from the defeat. Her smile turned as cold as her eyes. I'm sure you can imagine how poorly my people take defeat, Major Clanton. And yet, here you are, Oliveira cut in. And given what we know of how few cruisers your people had left after the battle for Earth, it must have taken some real pull to get your government to approve this expedition so far from your home system. How did you bring that off, Captain? If you'll know this much, you must know that the Confederation has never tasted defeat until we encountered you and your people, the men and women of the Source. After what you called the Battle for Earth, we of the Confederation were forced to face a painful reality. Though we could conquer the Alliance, and though we might be able to conquer you, we could not take on all of you at once. We needed guidance, and we could only think of one place to get it. The Elders, I guessed and she inclined her head in acknowledgment. Did you detect the signal yourselves? No, we intercepted a message from a Helta research vessel to the Alliance. We knew the risk would be great for a mission to attempt even to reach the origin of the signal, much less to beat you to it, and I was called to testify before them, since I was one of the only officers to have met you in person. And I told them of your offer to me during the battle to switch sides and be given my own ship to fight with the favored children of the elders. I felt dozens of eyes on me and warmth flooded my face. I'd made the proposal in a fit of desperation, literally with a gun to my head. Cartimandua tossed her head, a wholly foreign motion I hadn't seen anywhere in the Western Hemisphere. They were prepared to accept the truth of your claim, given the impressive skills and the damnable luck you had at war. I was able to convince them that I should be allowed to approach you with an offer to work together. I was glad we'd stashed the research crew in the transport, because Ban So would have gone apeshit, bearshit, at the thought of us making a deal with the Tavinians. Not that he wouldn't have a right to, but we didn't need any more complications. If you're proposing, Oliveira interrupted, his expression clouding over, that we unite with you against the Alliance, that's not going to happen. I didn't believe you would. And if you did, what good is your word? But we are children of the elders, as much as they are, if not more. We deserve to take part in what is left of their legacy as much as the Helta or the Shamblisi. Her expression grew darker, the tone in her voice less conciliatory. And lest you think our defeat has left us soft, I should remind you that we have three ships to your one. You will hurt us, but you can't win this fight. I shared a look with Oliveira. Mine was trying to say, what choice do we have? While his was more along the lines of, over my dead body. And then Evans had to open his big fat mouth. You're their commander. What if we took you hostage and told your ships to let us go, or we'd kill you? He didn't exactly move his K.E. rifle's muzzle, but it somehow seemed suddenly more noticeable, yawning wide and black. One of the men with Cartimandua hissed something into her ear too softly for the translator to pick up, his hand creeping toward his weapon. The Tavinian captain put a restraining hand on his arm and whispered a reply, then offered Evans a cruel smile. That you would ask such a question means you do not know us. Major Clanton knows us. He can answer it. The Tavinians, I told Evans, are an Iron Age civilization that never advanced beyond that level of technology before the Helta gave them fusion reactors and fabricators. And then they stole lasers and hyperdrives, of course. But the point is, they had, and to some extent have, no concept of modern tactics, strategy, or logistics. Yet they still managed to roll over the Helta and the Shamblisi mostly because of one thing. They're not afraid to die. Major Clanton knows us, Cartimandua reaffirmed. If you threaten to kill me, my subcommander will merely ask if you need to borrow a gun. What do you propose? 
Oliveira asked. And if they had an illustration in the dictionary beside the definition for grudgingly, it would have been his face at that moment. We aren't looking for weapons, if that's what worries you. We simply wish to know what you found out about the elders. We need to know what happened to them, where they've gone. A spasm of real emotion seemed to penetrate the cold mask Cartimandua wore. We need to know why they left us, and if they're coming back, what they want us to do. Another look between Oliveira and me, and the man shrugged. Graham, I called. It's all right. You can come out. Carti Mandua's mouth dropped open, and the two younger men with her took a step back in alarm as the hologram snapped to life in the center of the chamber. Greetings, Graham said in perfect Tivinian, the translator feeding me the words a half second behind his holographic lips. I understand we have some things to discuss. He waved a hand, and chairs popped into existence in a half circle around him, suspended in midair, hanging off of nothing. Please, have a seat. Chapter 23 They're gone, Cartimandua breathed, almost a sob. They're all gone. They're not dead. I reminded her, feeling awkward trying to comfort the woman who had almost killed me more than once. At least, not that we know of. Yes, they abandoned us here, left their children to our own devices, she said, bitterness thick in the words. She was leaning forward in the chair, her weight on the balls of her feet, as if she was afraid the unanchored chair would fall at any second. They left you... Graham countered with surprising gentleness for an AI hologram, to keep you safe from the enemy. Otherwise, they would have... Would have what? She interrupted him. Would have left us to fend for ourselves, as they have since the beginning? The Helta received their aid, their technology. She motioned at Ban So, who'd been escorted back inside along with the other Alliance researchers, once the Tavinian infantry had gone back aboard their shuttles. We were left with the same tools we'd possessed since the elders brought us to our new home. She scowled at me. And from what you have said, it's the same with the other humans who were transplanted from this source. If the Helta had not offered us their gifts, if we had not seized them when the time came, we would yet be trapped on Tavinia, plowing our fields with iron blades pulled by oxen. Why would the elders treat us so? You were not given the technology we shared with the Helta, Graham explained, because we didn't feel you needed it. Your purpose, the purpose of all humans taken from the source and given your own worlds, was to see what you would do on your own, with a whole planet, a whole solar system at your disposal. Just as the purpose of the Helta, the Shamblisi, the Skrith, the Vironians, and all the others we gave intellect and technology, was to try to create something different, something better, something that could help us defeat the enemy if they returned. You keep talking about we and us, Graham, I observed, but you still haven't told us who the elders were, what they were like, even what they looked like, or why it was so important to them that the enemy not find Earth. I shook my head. Maybe the Earth was the source for all the life the elders spread, but that's surely not the case anymore. There are dozens of habitable worlds, every one of them with an ecosystem transplanted from Earth. You ask what we looked like, and yet, have I not answered the question? Graham put a hand to his chest. I have not taken this form in order to fool you, to make you feel more comfortable with me. I was given this form by my creators because this is how they appeared. Then Andy was right? Oliveira asked, grabbing at the sides of his seat as if he was about to push himself out of the chair. The elders were humanoids? But he wasn't hearing what the AI was saying the same way I hadn't been. I looked closer at the hologram, noting each detail, each line in his face. No. I said to Oliveira, realizing the weight of the words even as I said them. The elders weren't humanoid. They were human. That's impossible, 
Oliveira and Bon So had spoken at the same time, and the general glowered at the scientist before continuing. The elders had star travel at least 10,000 years ago. Humans were barely out of mud huts on Earth back then. Maybe a few stone cities in Turkey, but nothing more advanced than that, unless you buy into those crackpots who believe in Atlantis or something. Andy Clanton is a perceptive man, Graham said, and I couldn't help but agree with him. He has finally understood what I have been telling you all this time. How? Oh. Bonso demanded, stepping in front of the hologram, a hand raised, as if he could have threatened the holographic representation of an AI. How could this be so? We were taught you were older than all, from time immemorial. And this is also true. Graham shook his head. There are things which must remain mysteries for now, things which you are not ready to hear. Why not? Cartimandua spat the words at him. Why not tell us the truth? We've traveled hundreds of light years to follow your signal, put aside our wars and hatred to learn of the will of the elders. Can you not at least give us the courtesy of being honest? Because some truths would hurt you more than help you. Have some of you not raised children? Can you not think of truths that must wait until the child is old enough to understand and deal with them? We are not. Children, Oliveira insisted. We've grown to adulthood, and as adults, we have a right to be trusted with the facts. That may be so, but I will not be the one to share them. Not because I have any wish to keep you in the dark, but because my programmers forbid it. I thought you were a sentient system, I pointed out. Able to think for yourself, to decide your own mind. To think for myself, yes. To act independent of their wishes? To defy their will for me? I'm afraid not. They forbade it, and thus it is a secret I will keep to the end of my existence. The AI reached out a spectral hand and touched me on the cheek, and I blinked in shock. I felt his touch. Perhaps I shouldn't have been surprised by it. The chairs showed he could make solid-feeling constructs, but I hadn't thought he could do it to himself. It was the gesture of a father towards his child, and I resisted an urge to pull away, sensing that the personal contact was important to him. I will tell you this, Andy Clanton. If the enemy does still exist in this galaxy, and they detect your hyperdrive signatures, they'll come to Earth and wipe you from existence in days. If you have any thought to saving your world and your people, You'll take your starships out of your system and never return. You know we can't do that, Oliveira told him. We've had a whole universe open to us. No one's going to agree to shut themselves off from it now. Not because of a threat from something that hasn't even been seen for the last three hundred years. That's what my creators thought as well. Graham's sigh was so real, I thought I felt his breath. And yet, they wound up here hiding in a cave around a star, and even that wasn't enough. Oliveira shook his head, and I got the feeling it wasn't so much in disagreement as it was in dismissal, shaking up concerns he couldn't control to concentrate on the here and now. He stood from the floating chair and faced Cartimandua. We need to talk. I don't guess either one of us is empowered to negotiate a treaty, but perhaps we could at least talk about a ceasefire between the Confederation and the Alliance, some first step toward not continuing this war. He glanced at Bon So and the others. I'm sure the Alliance would approve of any agreement that would repatriate the Helta you're currently holding. This has already been agreed to. I don't know who was more surprised at Cartimandua's words, Oliveira, Bon So, or me. If she noticed our expressions, she didn't let on. It goes against our culture she went on, looking as if she'd bit into a lemon. When prisoners are taken during war, they must be ransomed. When they are given back with no ransom, the family of the prisoner owes a life debt to the ones who let him go. It has taken some arguing for the older members of our council to come to terms with the fact that this must change, but nothing can change minds like getting punched in the face. I snorted a laugh, and she raised an eyebrow. We have a similar saying, I explained. 
What about the Helta colonies themselves, the shipyards? We would not be helpless, Cartimandua said, an edge to her voice. Unable to produce our own ships. We have learned much, and it is possible we may be able to train our people to use the equipment in the shipyards without help from our Helta prisoners. But we will not return to farming the dirt for our sustenance. I'm sure we can work something out, Oliveira told her. Maybe you could lease them from the Helta in return for raw materials. Perhaps they'd even be willing to hire out their engineers to work there for you. I think, Bonso spoke up, that is unlikely. I don't know if I'd ever seen a Helta employ understatement to that degree of success. I was impressed, though I didn't think this was the right time to say so. No one expects you to give up being a star-faring people, I said to Cartimandua, giving Bonso the stink eye and hoping he understood the look. We'll work something out. That's a job for politicians and ambassadors, though. Right now, I think everyone would be satisfied if we could just say for certain that we're all going to refrain from shooting at each other until we get out of here. You have my word, Cartimandua offered. We are here, she grimaced. We're here to speak to the elders. We have come as close to that as is possible, and we have the answers we sought, even if they were not satisfactory ones. When I return with this news, it may come to pass that my mission will be seen as a failure, that I will wind up being offered as a sacrifice in the weaker man. You mean like the one with Nicolas Cage? Quinn blurted, then yelped in surprise when Pops punched an exoskeleton-powered fist into his armored shoulder. But until that time, she went on, ignoring the byplay, I will honor our truce. Beyond that, our fates are up to the council and the gods. I believe, Graham interrupted, that our fates may already be decided. His words were as bleak as his expression, and a big empty opened up inside my stomach. What? I asked him. I have detected several starships dropping out of hyperspace just outside the gravity well of the sphere, he said. What? Oliveira snapped. If you can detect ships outside the sphere, why didn't you warn us that the Tavinians were coming? Because the drive signature of their ships matched that of the hyperdrives we used, that we gave to the Helta three hundred years ago, just before the enemy came for us. These do not. You don't recognize them? The question was hopeful, or as close to hopeful as I was going to get. I do. Graham dashed my hopes unapologetically. Though I have not seen them in centuries, it's the enemy. This time, when he said the word, I almost saw the capital letter in front of it, as if that was their proper name. They've returned. Chapter 24 Reitfeld, are you picking up anything? Michael Oliveira demanded, sounding slightly out of breath. It wasn't that far from the building entrance to the shuttles, but we had to pick our way through a sea of bug carcasses, and, well, we were all scared shitless. Oliveira was transmitting via Gunfighter 1 to the Jambo, but he was looping me into the net, and I was grateful for his trust, but at the same time, almost resentful. Ignorance was bliss. General Oliveira, we have something, so I am not sure what. Colonel Johann Reitfeld had a German accent to his English that could have come from the cheesiest, campiest 1950s World War II movie Nazi ever imagined. V. Haf something was how his first sentence had come out. And if the rest of his words weren't quite as badly mangled, I supplied the accent myself because it was just so damn funny and I needed something to laugh at right about now. They're starships, and they came out of hyperspace, but beyond that, they look like nothing we've ever seen before. I'm sending you a visual. I got that too, and again, would have been just as happy without it. There were a half a dozen of them, and I could only count them from the sensor signature because on optical, they were nearly invisible. There was no sun to reflect off their hulls, and what I could see of them was flat black, a shadow against the stars. The shadow of something jagged and thorny, something never dreamed up by the mind of a humanoid. I couldn't tell where the drive pods were, where the weapons emplacements were. Couldn't have spotted the hangar bays or docking niches or whatever they used. 
Reitfeld, get the fucking ship out of that hole and into open space right fucking now. That's an order. No goddamn arguments. I've never heard Oliveira scared before. I mean, I knew there had been times he had to be, when any sane person would be, but he'd never showed it, not in front of the crew. This time, there was no hiding it, and I knew he wasn't scared for himself, nor even merely for his ship and crew. He was scared for the whole human race. I expected Colonel Reitfeld to argue anyway, on general principles. He was the singular most stubborn officer I'd ever met, and I was a Marine. I had started to wonder if the man hadn't actually served in the German army instead of the Air Force, because there was just no way someone that obstinate was a damned pilot. But he must have been just as scared as Oliveira. Yes, sir. If I'll get some distance and try to pick some off, it's the impulse gun. Just don't get cornered. If you get a scratch on the paint, get the fuck out of here and get back to Earth at best speed. You got me? Heading out now, sir. Major Clanton. The voice was Carti Mandua's, and I caught the motion of her flat black battle armor out of the corner of my eye. We'd exchanged frequencies for our suits as a part of the negotiations, so as to avoid any problems with the troops left outside. But I hadn't expected her to use the radio. I am sending our ships to do battle with the enemy. We do not believe we will be able to reach them in time before their vessels are upon us. Good thinking, I said. We're doing the same thing. We'll take off in our shuttle, and if the cruisers can take out the bad guys, or at least get them to withdraw, we can rendezvous and jump out of here. Maybe we should have stayed inside, Evans said. I stopped in my tracks and turned back to him. He was maybe three steps behind me and had to scrape his heels against the pavement to avoid running into me. What? I asked, eyes narrowing. I mean, he said, if you're sending the ships out and sending the shuttles up so they won't be targets, well... We know this building held off a full-scale invasion once, right? We should all just stay inside and let that Graham thing keep them out. Damn it, Brady, I said, shaking my head. Just when I think I've got you figured out, you come up with a brilliant idea like that. I stabbed a finger at Oliveira, which was rude, but we were in a hurry. Sir, Colonel Evans is right. We need to send the shuttles off to hide and get our asses right back inside that building. I was pissed. It was so damned obvious, I should have thought of it myself. But I let the whole awe-inspiring terror from the ancient bug aliens get the best of me. Oliveira hesitated, not sounding convinced when he answered. Are you sure about this, Andy? I checked my comm panel and made sure it was just the two of us. Mike, there's only one shuttle that's sure to survive long enough to rendezvous with our ships. If I could, I'd jam everyone on board the Bellerophon, but there isn't room. You get on board the transport with Julie and the research crew. The rest of us will hold them off from the transmission tower. It's the best I got, and I'm so out of it fucking Evans got the drop on me. I was surprised for the second time in the last couple minutes when Oliveira didn't argue with me. All right, he said. He offered a hand and I took it, despite the fact that neither of us could feel it. If we can, we'll come back for you. Say goodbye to Julie for me. I didn't want to tell her myself because then I would have spent the next ten minutes crying on the suit radio, and I just didn't have the time. I switched back to the net for the team and the rangers, and made a circling gesture over my head, then pointed back at the transmission tower. Back to the building, I ordered. They're not taking us down without a fucking fight. And they weren't getting to us, unless they got through Graham first. There was only one thing wrong with that plan. Graham wasn't there. Graham! I yelled for the tenth time, stalking from one end of the chamber to the other. God damn it, you stupid ass computer, get out here and talk to me! Do we have a problem? Pops asked. He was putting the team into position to defend the entrance, while Evans stayed outside and used what cover was available to set up positions around the building. Pops's visor was up, and I could see his eyebrow cocked upward as he watched me scream into the air. Yes, Chief Warrant Officer Tremonti, I snapped. We have a fucking problem. Ooh, Dog said, whistling softly. Mama used all three names. That means you're in trouble, Pops. With Graham, I explained, grabbing onto patience. We have an AI computer that can control this place's weapons, that can use its gravity field control to squish the bugs like, well, bugs. We have an impenetrable force field around the building. Without him, we have a very comfortable, well-decorated tomb. 
The computer is gone? I'd been so caught up searching for Graham, I hadn't even noticed Carti Mandua coming in through the airlock. She'd removed her helmet, and although she'd heard the entire translation of what I'd said, she didn't seem unduly alarmed. A platoon of her troops had filed into the transmission tower behind her, and one of their officers was deploying them around the perimeter of the chamber, being guided by Jumper and Ringo. I knew the team had to be feeling weird about fighting beside the same Tavinians we'd been killing these last couple years, but they'd all been in this business a while and were used to working alongside troops they distrusted or even hated. If it's not gone, I admitted, it's not talking to us. She regarded me with a flat, fearless stare. You say he's built to think like a human. Perhaps he's scared. Maybe, I shrugged. He's ten thousand years old and he's been alone in this gigantic airless tomb for three centuries. I'm more worried he's insane. It's a small thing. I've put my troops outside under the command of your Colonel Evans. Is he a capable soldier? He's fought against humans before, I told her. None of us have fought against alien bugs. I have no idea whether our weapons will even work on them. That was one of the many questions I had for our friend Graham. I bet you I know why he's gone, Quinn said. He was watching the Tavinians as they were put into their places, and if I knew Randy Quinn, he was judging their placement, their weapons handling, and their firing positions. Why's that, Captain Obvious? I asked him, warming up to this name a lot better than Wizard. No, wait, I raised a palm. That's too long. Captain? Too confusing, Pops critiqued. Some idiot might get the idea Junior is actually in charge. Damn, I murmured. I'm gonna have to work on this. Anyway, why is he gone? Quinn's expression had me believing he'd be shooting me a bird if I wasn't his commanding officer, and might anyway in a couple minutes. Cap, Pop said, pointing at me. We could just call him Cap. Damn good idea, I agreed. I nodded to Quinn, who looked as if steam was about to come out of his ears like an old cartoon character. Why's he gone, Cap? He told us we needed to keep our hyperdrive ships out of the solar system. I'd bet he's setting us all up to die so we don't head home and leave the bugs there. Damn. Pops shook his head. That might not be it, but it sounds right, you know? And this affects our situation how? Carti Mandua wondered. She'd grabbed a laser rifle out of one of their shuttles and was holding the weapon tightly like a talisman against evil. It means we can't count on him to wake up or turn back on or whatever, I explained, and save our asses. I nodded to Pops. You're in charge here. Defense in depth. If they get in here, draw them as far into this place as you can get. And everyone in the front chamber should be firing from the prone, because I have no idea whether these interior walls are even real, much less whether they can stop whatever these bugs are using as weapons. Keep the KE rifles on slow fire max penetration until you're sure you can blast through their carapace with anything else. If that doesn't work, mass fires. Copy that, Andy. The word's professional and dutiful though his expression was more along the lines of teach your grandma to suck eggs. Captain Carti Mandua, I said to the Tavinian officer, gesturing at the airlock. I'm going to step outside and manage this fight from out there for as long as I can. Would you care to join me? Given what I've seen you do to us, she said, lowering her helmet into place, I will be gratified to observe it against a mutual enemy. Things outside were a bit more shambolic than indoors though it was likely a factor of the numbers involved than from any failings of Brady Evans as a leader. I mean, I wanted to blame it on Evans because he wasn't Danny Brooks, and because he was more stereotypically a ranger than any duffel blog meme I'd ever read, but I couldn't bring myself to be so blatantly unfair. I didn't kibitz, just walked through the lines, through the ancient corpses of the same enemy we were about to fight, and looked upward. I probably wouldn't have been able to see much without my HUD. The shuttles were sending IFF signals and were already nearly 10,000 miles away, each in a different direction, on the theory that the dispersal would make it that much harder for the enemy to chase them down, and that much more unlikely, given that we would be priority number one, occupying the transmission tower. They'd attacked it once before and lost, and I at least had reason to hope they'd take that personally. The cruisers were even farther away, well beyond the range where I could see them with the naked eye, probably past even a relay from one of the shuttles, but I tried anyway. 
It was a long, damned way, but there was no atmosphere and very little magnetic interference. There, I got the signal from the sensors on Gunfighter 1. The Jambo was already out of the hole, while the Tavinian cruisers had fallen behind, at least a hundred thousand miles back and flying in a tight V formation. I wasn't seeing an optical image, of course, not at that range, but the sublight drives caused a very distinctive energy signature that even our shuttles could detect, and they were detecting eight more of them coming through the hole in the sphere. Fuck. Eight of the bug ships. Reitfeld had detected six, and that had been bad enough. You use that word a lot, Carty Mandua said, her tone one of casual conversation as if we all weren't standing around waiting to die. The translator you're using is changing it to one of our own curse words, but I was curious and looked up the meaning. How did the word for mating come to be used as profanity in your language? Soldiers, mostly, I said, only half paying attention to her. Back when only men could fight in wars and the women were all at home, the idea of sex probably caused more anger and frustration than happiness. I was kind of making that up, since no one really knows when fuck became a curse word, but it sounded good. One of the bug ships disappeared in a flash of liberated thermal energy, and I whooped, pumping a fist. We got one of them, I explained, knowing Cartimandua was probably staring at me like I was a madman. The Jambo took out one of the bug ships, probably with the impulse gun. The impulse gun? she repeated. This is your new weapon that uses the drive field to accelerate a projectile? That's the one. I squinted at the readout in my HUD, trying to make sense of it. It had probably happened seconds ago, since the signals were traveling at light speed from what was now almost interplanetary distances. Two more of the bug ships are withdrawing from the sphere. I think they're going to chase after the Jambo and leave the other five to deal with your cruisers. This means something, she said. Does it not? It means that these bugs think as we do in some ways. They have priorities in battle similar to our own. I grunted noncommittally, more concerned about whether her people could handle three-on-five odds, and whether Reitfeld was anything close to being a competent starship commander. Not that I thought the guy was an idiot or anything, but we had exactly one starship commander with combat experience, and he was in the Elder Transport ship right now, watching the battle, the same as I was. I would rather have had Julie in command of the Jambo, but she'd refuse the exo position because she wasn't sure she wanted to stay in the military after this mission. In retrospect, that might have been a bad decision. Either way, Reitfeld's battle was invisible to me, and the closer one was of much more immediate importance. The Tavinian ships were firing, two of them using lasers, the third a particle cannon, but somewhere between their battles with us and now, they'd apparently learned something about space combat tactics. They were concentrating their fire on one target, the lead ship in the bug formation. I was sure it would have looked very impressive if I could have seen it up close, with the bug ship's drive field trying to shed all that energy. But from here, all I saw was the thermal signature going from red to white. Come on, I chanted. Keep shooting. I thought Cartimandua might want to keep track of the battle, so I fed the link to the feed in her suit comms. I figured she'd have the same sort of HUD built into her helmet as the Helta did, but if she didn't, at least she didn't ask any more questions. The bug ship had slowed down, which probably meant that its drive field was being attenuated by the incoming energy, but the others were still racing forward. I silently urged the Tavinians to shift targets to slow the others down, but they stayed focused on the one ship, firing burst after burst into it, and the bugs, they showed just how different they were from us, putting the lie to Cartimandua's observation by not even bothering to fire back, just racing straight at our position. The bug ship imploded in a flash of gravimetric energy, and Cartimandua let out an ululating war cry that hurt my ears. But I didn't share her joy at the small victory because I knew what was coming. Andy, this is Oliveira. The broadcast was clear as a bell, but I didn't bother to acknowledge it. The shuttles and the Bellerophon had transmission gear powerful enough to reach me, but the dinky antenna built into my suit helmet wasn't going to get a signal anywhere near them. I know you won't be able to reply, so just listen. We're picking up something separating from the enemy ships. 
They're not under boost, and I think they launched them using either their dry field or some sort of electromagnetic catapult. Shit. What were they? A shell of some kind? If I had to guess, I would say they're not a weapon, and they're not any sort of drone or fighter since they're not moving under their own power, which leaves only one thing I can think of. Didn't Graham say something about the bugs landing in pods? Oh, fuck, I moaned. Like death, we'd all known it was coming, but it still felt disappointing. Gunfighter 1 and 2 are too far away to do anything, Oliveira went on. But we're coming in to try to help. No, damn it, Julie, stay away. But I didn't bother to say it. Not only because she wouldn't have heard it, but mostly because she wouldn't have listened if she had. Instead, I switched over to the general frequency. We have enemy landers incoming, I announced. Get ready, rangers. I sighed having wanted to use the line for decades, yet somehow not feeling the joy I should have. Looks like it's another bug hunt. Chapter 25 The waiting, as Tom Petty famously said, is the hardest part. Those pods were coming, and we were as ready for them as we were going to be, but physics is a bitch, and they weren't going to get here any sooner just because we were ready to rock and roll. The bugs are firing on the Tavinian cruisers, Oliveira reported, serving as our own personal play-by-play -play guy. I wondered if he'd tried backseat driving with Julie and gotten shouted down, which was why he was chewing my ear off, since even I wanted to tell him to shut up. He couldn't have heard me. I think I know why they haven't returned fire until now. Whatever weapon they're using, it seems to be firing some kind of plasma packet held together by an EM field. I bet the range isn't great on those things. Which made sense, given that was what their small arms had been designed for. The elders, too. I wondered why that was. Oh, shit! The exclamation was a moan, as if Oliveira had taken a punch to the gut. Jesus, Andy! Just one shot from that thing tore in one side of the cruiser and out the other! Their venting atmosphere and their drive field is just gone! And I saw it. Not much, just a flicker of light. Not much more than I would have expected from a reflection of the sun off a jetliner at cruising altitude. Hundreds of lives flickering and being snuffed out forever. A few months ago, I'd cheered the destruction of Tavinian cruisers. Yet now it felt like a bitter defeat. May the elders keep their souls against the return, Cartimandua whispered. The words held the rote nature of a religious chant, and I wondered just how what she'd learned of the elders today would impact her society, if she ever got the chance to tell them. The other two Tavinians are splitting off, Oliveira continued, his tone grimmer, more hopeless than it had been a minute ago. They're trying to draw the bugs away, and those are splitting into two groups chasing after them. But I wasn't listening because there was something else in the sky of this endless everyday world. A lot of somethings, black and small and moving fast. I couldn't tell how far away they were, but I knew what they were. And if I could see them, I hoped that meant Julie did too. Okay, hold on, Oliveira said. We're losing sight of the Tavinians because we're getting lower. Since they're not looking for us, we can afford to head back down and try to support you. Hold on, we're coming. Andy. Julie's voice cut off Oliveira. We're going to slice through them, but that's going to send down a bunch of debris, so keep your head down. And next time, you don't send Mike to tell me goodbye, you fucking tell me yourself. Yes, ma'am, I said, though I didn't know if she was close enough to hear me. I switched to the general net and called out a warning, though I didn't know how much good it would do. There was no overhead cover out here, and our only hope of shelter would be to bring everyone inside the transmission tower. I see your ship, Cartimandua told me, pointing upward. The transport was tiny and fast-moving, and if there had been atmosphere here still, it would have been snapping off one sonic boom after another and shattering every window within ten square miles, if these buildings had glass windows. I couldn't prove it either way, but I had my doubts. But even without the air or the windows to prove it, Julie was hauling ass, and she plowed right into the biggest concentration of the black dots that I could see. Drop pods. That was what I decided to call them. It sounded sufficiently bug-like and alien to suit. These drop pods never got the chance to touch ground, though. 
Wherever the transport's dry field touched, it shredded them, sent bits of whatever they were made of tumbling out of the sky. Watching something fall at near-regular Earth gravity but with no atmosphere was freaky. No air currents took the debris, no twisting and turning, just a straight fall at whatever angle it had started from. And no giant bang when they hit either, just a cloud of dust coming up in a straight column and then raining back down, not billowing like it would have with air. She was trying to keep most of the damage away from us, but that had another effect. It meant the ones that made it through intact came down right on top of us. I'd been wondering how they'd slow down. No air, so they couldn't parachute, and the pods weren't big enough for any sort of gravity-resist generator like the transport had. Or at least, I didn't think they were big enough. Not to mention, Graham had told us they were disposable, and I didn't think even bug aliens could afford to throw away tens of thousands of gravity generators. Or if they could, we were fucked anyway. What they did was somehow even less explicable. There was a wavering beneath them, a heat illusion that couldn't have been a mirage because there was no air to conduct it, and the hair stood up on the back of my arms, a static charge coming up through the ground, through the metal, and the pods just stopped about two feet off the bare metal surface, like they were levitating there. Some sort of electromagnetic pulse, I thought probably working off a quick-discharge capacitor, and as it shot its wad, the pod thumped solidly into the ground and split open right down the middle. Explosive bolts, maybe, or maybe magnetics. I didn't give the matter much thought, because two or three dozen more were landing all around us, and every time one of them split open, they swarmed out of it, cockroaches escaping the light. Except these cockroaches were the size of a horse and carrying energy weapons. I didn't think I was capable of freezing under pressure anymore. It wasn't because I had a big ego or a high opinion of my tactical abilities. Venezuela had robbed me of any such illusions. But I'd seen so much, faced too much. I just thought my nerves had been seared with a hot iron, unable to be overwhelmed anymore. I was wrong. I'd faced Venezuelan communist insurgents, flown into space, met aliens, fought space barbarians with lasers, but nothing had prepared me for the bugs. They were each the size of a racehorse, scuttling along on four thick motive legs, with four smaller arms on the upper part of their segmented torsos. And where the dead ones had been a flat, lifeless black, these had a red tint to their carapace. Though I wasn't sure if it was just the reflection of the ever-present daylight from the unshaded star. They looked like they'd be slow lumbering things, tanks on legs instead of treads. But instead, they moved with alarming speed, reminiscent of a grizzly galloping after an elk calf. Fast zombies instead of old slow zombies because nothing about the bugs seemed alive. They had eyes, lots of them, but they weren't human or even humanoid and if they had a mouth, I couldn't make it out. I couldn't have sworn as to how they ate or where they shit from, and God only knew why I even had the thought, but that's how my brain works. They'd landed about a quarter mile away, and I expected them to just start rushing straight at us like the animals they resembled, but I'd forgotten those plasma cannons they were holding and the starships they'd arrived in. They grouped together like army ants, swarming around their split-open drop pods and forming a column eight across before they headed straight for our lines. Fire! I yelled, finally breaking free of that moment of unthinking terror, screaming into the general net. Fuck's sake, fire! As much shit as I gave Brady Evans, thank God he was here because for all that I'd gotten out of the Marine Corps as a captain, I'd never commanded a company. I was a lead-from-the-front, balls-to-the-wall kind of platoon leader, perfect for working with a small special ops team who all knew exactly what they should be doing and didn't need me to hold their hands. But this was exactly the sort of situation that called for a ranger company led by a man like Evans. Full auto-fire! Evans barked. Front ranks, load plasma rounds, rear ranks, prepare penetrators. I couldn't hear what Cartimandua was saying to her troops, or to her company commander to relay to her troops, but I saw the results. The Tavinians had linked up along the ranger's right flank, and the two companies of former enemies opened fire nearly simultaneously. 
It was a light show that rivaled anything I'd seen on New Year's Eve at Epcot. The Rangers had loaded up their KE rifles with plasma rounds, an invention so cool I had tried without success to find the originator and buy him a beer. The round was a discarding metal sabo, accelerated by the electromagnetic coil to hypersonic speeds. Its payload, a mass of sintered metal ignited by a small laser at the muzzle into a superheated plasma. It wasn't much good for penetrating armor, but it was spectacular as an anti-personnel round, and a lot easier to control on full auto than full-speed tungsten penetrators. The lasers that the Tavinians were firing appeared anemic by comparison, since the beams were invisible in a vacuum, without any atmosphere or particulate matter to interact with. But they did have the advantage of not running out of ammunition as quickly. But the bugs were equanimous when it came to the gunfire. They ignored all of it, charging in as if we weren't there. Which is not to say the gunfire didn't have any effect. On the contrary, the plasma bolts and laser bursts sliced into their ranks, ripping into their carapaces, spilling black ichor onto the bare metal and leached out dirt. But the bugs didn't go down from one hit, or even two or three. They still churned forward with holes blown in their torsos the size of dinner plates, staggering but not falling unless and until someone hit them in the motive legs. I didn't just stand around and watch, as tempting as it was to play spectator, or to simply run back into the transmission facility and hide. They'd given me this armor for a reason, and it wasn't just because they couldn't figure out what else to do with me. Or maybe it had been for that reason, but I wasn't going to act like it. My KE rifle was at my shoulder, and I was squeezing off single shots of tungsten penetrators, mostly because I hadn't taken the time to switch out my drum magazine for plasma rounds. I aimed for what I thought was the head, or at least where the eyes were clustered, putting single aimed rounds through the upper torso until a bug fell. Carti Mandua was using that laser rifle she'd commandeered to good effect as well, slicing through legs with accurate fire, and I began to think the bugs had bitten off more than they could chew, if they did chew. And then they started shooting back. We had next to no cover, mostly scooped together bug carcasses from that battle 300 years ago. And when the first of their plasma blasts hit, it tore into the front line of Tavinians like the wrath of God. One shot was enough to incinerate the torso of a Tavinian in light body armor, and what hit the ground bore very little resemblance to anything that had once been human. Smoke poured upward in a column from each of the scorched bodies, then seemed to bend down and hug the ground, another trick of the vacuum. They'd been in spacesuits, which was the only reason I was able to keep my stomach contents inside, where they belonged. Bugs were falling to our gunfire, but more pods were falling as well. And when they hatched, the occupants immediately scuttled to the back of their column, as if taking the place of their dead. We had no such reinforcements and the next volley of plasma fire hit the rangers. I had their IFF transponders programmed into my helmet HUD, but there were far too many of them for me to keep track of them all in that tiny space. I couldn't have told the names of the ones who died, but I saw the blue light beside the name go red and then black. Four of them, with one fusillade of actinic plasma, just like the discharge from the single-shot plasma projectors the Helta used. We'd brought some along in the armory on board the Jambo, but they were heavy, unwieldy, and awkward, almost impossible to use from the prone. No one had thought to issue them to the troops going down to the surface, which was my fault, and no one had thought we'd need to bring down the entire battalion of rangers instead of just a company, which wasn't my fault, though I still blame myself. Evans, I said, hating to interrupt the man while he was doing his job, but finding it necessary. There's no cover! We should fall back to the transmission building and hold them at the entrance! Copy that. Platoon leaders! He barked. Listen up! We're withdrawing back to shelter! Bounding by squads, first platoon in the lead, fourth, lay down smoke! Belay that! I said, slipping into marine terminology under stress. Smoke doesn't work in a vacuum! Fuck! Right, sorry! Captain, I said to Carti Mandua, we have to get our troops inside that building. They can only get to us through a narrow entranceway and there's air inside. Do you know the concept of bounding overwatch? She made a confused noise and I didn't wait for her to figure out what I meant. Have half your people lay down covering fire while the other half moves back part way, then switch out. 
Got it? Fucking savages. I bet they'd never even heard of final protective fires or a double envelopment either. How the hell was I supposed to work with troops so primitive they'd never heard of bounding overwatch? Julie, I said, walking backwards, still firing single shots at the bugs as they advanced over their own dead, stepping on top of them. We have to get inside the building, and honest to God, I don't even know how long we're going to last in there. Until the ammo runs out, I'd guess. She was still somewhere above us, still sweeping through the incoming pods, but there were thousands of them, and one of her. She was killing bugs by the hundreds, but it wasn't enough. Hold on, damn it, she said. And I wasn't sure if she was telling me that she was busy and not to bother her, or if she was adjuring me to hold the line against the bugs. We're getting the shuttles back for you. They're on their way. I thought about telling her not to bother, to tell the shuttle pilots to save themselves. But then I realized there might not be any place else for them to go. The Bellerophon could travel through hyperspace, but the shuttles were stuck here. And if the bug ships won the space battle, then the transmission tower was their only hope for short-term survival. As for long-term survival, well, I was trying not to think that far ahead. The Rangers and the Tavinians were doing what was euphemistically referred to in the U.S. military as a tactical retrograde, i.e. a retreat, but the Rangers were at least doing it well. It was a classic break-contact scenario, just like they taught us in infantry school, and the Rangers executed it with complete professionalism, even as they died by ones and twos under the constant barrage of plasma fire. The Tavinians had given it a try, but performing something like that for the first time under fire is nearly impossible. And they were all basically just running and dying. You can't shoot back while you run, as they were finding out the hard way. If the Rangers were falling one at a time, the Tavinians were dying in groups of three or four, vanishing in white flares of ionized gas. Carti Mendua was intimidating me, firing as she walked backwards staying with the foremost group of rangers. But if she was yelling at her troops to stop, they weren't listening. Shit! Someone yelled. They're behind us! I didn't wait for a more detailed report. This could be one of those tipping points that I always read about in military history. That particular instant in time when an orderly withdrawal turns into a slaughter, and I wasn't going to let it happen on my watch. I ran back to the rear of the line as fast as the Svalin would take me, which was pretty damned fast. The armor can sprint at upwards of 30 miles an hour, something most troops never find out because it's reckless and dangerous and no trainer wants to be the guy who taught a soldier or marine something that they abuse and gets them killed. But I'd been the first one to field test the suit, and no one alive knew them better than me. Rangers jumped out of the way as I galloped by, and the ones who didn't dodge fast enough I simply jumped over. That was something else about the armor most of them didn't know or had never tried. It can jump around 10 feet, maybe 12 with a running start. The impact when I landed was brutal. A dull pain up through my legs and into my back, and my teeth clacked together. But I ignored the pain and ran harder. What was happening was obvious. We'd massed our forces expecting an attack at the front, near the entrance, and the bugs didn't seem smart enough to do anything else. But their pods were landing everywhere, including behind us, on the other side of the building. I don't know whether the bugs were actually trying to flank us or if they were just trying to join up with the main rank of bugs and we happened to be in the way, but the end result was the same. Plasma blasts left charred black stains on the exterior of the building where the rangers hugged the walls, returning fire. But the walls were curved and there just wasn't much protection to be had. I switched my KE rifle to full auto bringing the muzzle velocity down to something manageable. And when I reached the lines, I jumped again, this time over the top of the front rank of the enemy. My stomach turned inside out and started coming up my throat, and a spitting, furious stream of plasma passed so close, I felt the hair on my arm sear away, and static electricity snapped through my helmet and shocked me on the ear. But then I was down, right onto the back of one of the centaurid creatures. For a brief, terrifying second, I was surfing the back of the thing while its upper arms clawed backwards, hunting for the intruder taking up residence on its body. But I swept a full auto burst up its torso and it collapsed beneath me. Whatever passed for body fluids in the bug splattered onto the front of my armor, 
black and sticky as tar, and I hoped to hell it wasn't corrosive enough to eat through my suit, because I was going to get a lot more of it on me. The great thing about being surrounded by the enemy is you can shoot in every direction and blast the hell out of them, but they can't shoot at you without risking blue-on-blue fire, assuming the bugs worried about things like that. I was going to have to assume they did, because otherwise I was being insanely suicidal, and that just wouldn't do. Instead, I chose to think of standing in the middle of dozens of alien monsters and firing my KE rifle on full auto like a Tommy gun in one of the old mob movies my grandfather used to watch as a tactical decision meant to draw fire from the rangers. I sure hope they appreciated it. I sure hope they wouldn't kill me by accident. But damn, going Rambo with that KE rifle was badass. Bugs jerked and spasmed and sprayed black blood, surging toward me, fists raised to pound me into scrap metal, but then falling to their front knees, half torn apart. It would have been better with an atmosphere, with the snap, snap, snap of the tungsten slugs breaking the sound barrier. So close together, they sounded like a tap-dancing troupe, performing on a stage full of bubble wrap, with the air ionizing around the discharge from the friction. This felt more like a video game with the sound turned down, with the vacuum and the suit providing enough of a separation from reality that I wasn't even scared. Much until a bug exploded into a gout of steam, bits of the thing's carapace striking me like grenade fragments, and a wave of heat stole the breath from my lungs and turned the air inside my suit into an oven. I stumbled backwards, only the internal gyros in the suit keeping me upright. It was a plasma blast. The bugs had decided killing me was more important than not killing each other, apparently, and that meant I was pretty much dead. I tensed for a desperate jump to get me clear of the press, to get me back close to the entrance, a forlorn hope, since they'd probably blast me in mid-leap. Someone yelled a wordless battle cry right into my ear, and scintillating spears of light chopped into the bugs around me, cutting down two ranks of them, driving the rest back just from the sheer physical space the corpses took up. It was the Delta team, and Pops was at the head of it screaming a challenge into the radio as if the bugs could hear it. Come on, he urged me, waving back toward the entrance. Get your crazy ass inside! That, I told him, swapping out my drum magazine as I backed toward the door, his hand on my shoulder guiding me. There's no way to talk to your commanding officer. But I got my crazy ass inside. Chapter 26 What the hell did you think you were doing out there? Pops demanded, smacking his visor up with enough force that I worried he might have broken it. Can't you let young, ignorant brats like Quinn do stupid shit like that? Hey, now, Quinn raised a hand in objection. I wouldn't have done any kind of shit that stupid. I waved Pops off, sucking in a breath. My lungs felt like I'd smoked a dozen packs of unfiltered Russian cigarettes after the close plasma blast and the cool air of the tower was a welcome bomb. Not that it would be cool much longer. It was packed with rangers and Tavidian soldiers, and both sides were eyeing each other dubiously now that they'd taken advantage of the break in the fighting in the atmosphere to take their helmets off. Sooner or later, not even the ancient alien air conditioning was going to be able to compensate for all that body heat, or all that carbon dioxide we're breathing out. I wonder how long the air supplies will hold. We're all going to die here anyway, Pops, I confided in him, speaking low, standing shoulder to shoulder with the man to keep the conversation between the two of us. I figured saving a couple dozen rangers would buy us more time than one washed-up marine. They're still coming, Evans announced, flipping up his visor as he ducked back inside through the force field that held in the air. I got a squad out there, and we stopped firing, and I think they're confused about where we went, but they're still out there. And heading this way. Time to get back to work, I told Pops, slapping him on the arm. Get everyone away from the door, I yelled. Then repeated it over the general frequency, in case anyone still had their visor down, and then repeated it again through the translator in Tavinian. I don't know for sure if this gate lets plasma through, and I don't want anyone to find out the hard way. Make two ranks, one on either side of the door. Everyone in the prone, visors down, helmets on. Everyone else, get back around the corner. 
I motioned back to where the large hall curved out to either side like a nautilus shell. The walls and ceiling might be real, or might be those solid holograms Graham had demonstrated, but they were all the cover we had. Evans and Cartimandua were chivying their troops into position when the first plasma blast thundered through the airlock field. I don't know what I'd expected, but this wasn't it. The doorway lit up like a bug zapper, static electricity striking at anything and anyone unlucky enough to be standing nearby, and heat washed in, bringing the temperature up ten degrees in the space of an eye blink. But nothing else came through. No ionized gas, no radiation, nothing. Except the squad of rangers. They pulled two armored figures through behind them by their casualty handles, though I think they might have been wasting their effort. One of the soldiers was missing everything below the waist, smoke pouring off the charred, cauterized wound, billowing around us and then swirling into unseen vents. The other had their left arm and shoulder burned away, and the blackened and cracked flesh inside the wound told me that the blast had gone all the way into their chest cavity. Both would have been unsurvivable, even if we'd been on board the Jambo, ten feet from the med bay. Here? Get away from the door! One of the platoon leaders yelled, joined by a dozen others. They're coming through! That had been one of the rangers who had dragged the legless soldier inside, his voice stunned beyond reason. They're coming through! Someone dragged what was left of the squad away from the door, hauling them to the back of the chamber out of sight. All right, guys, I said, slapping down my visor. Get to the back of the rangers and Tavinians, half on either side. Get ready to fill in gaps and back them up if things get bad. Things ain't bad already, Dog wondered. No one bothered to answer him, the team crouching down beside prone rangers or Tavinian soldiers, K.E. rifles coming to their shoulders, waiting like hunters in a stand. I held out hope for just a few scant seconds that Graham might have done us a solid before he went AWOL and set the field to keep out the bugs. I should have known better. When the bugs came through, it wasn't tentatively. Was it one at a time, sticking in their equivalent of an antenna to see what was up? They charged the door with the eagerness of a marine squad on shore leave in Singapore, and this time, when they fired, there was nothing subdued or attenuated about those plasma guns. Energy ripped the air apart, boosting the temperature another 20 degrees to Kuwaiti desert and summer levels. And yet, when the bursts of ionized hydrogen struck the walls, nothing happened except the slightest wavering, as if the fabric of reality was absorbing the energy, dissipating it. Where it touched a pair of Tavinian troops, though, nothing dissipated it. The two soldiers were gone, replaced by splatters of steaming blood. But the bugs only had time for the one barrage, because their advance was met by dozens of KE rifle and laser weapons, and this time, the lasers won the Ooh, Look at That award. The air was full of smoke and steam and particulates, and the laser beams turned it all into superheated gas, a white-hot seam of energy connecting the Tavinians to the bugs for just a split second. Long enough. If the death of one of the bugs had been disgusting in a soundless vacuum, it was a hundred times worse now. The things popped when they died, when their carapace was ruptured by a Tavinian laser or the plasma rounds from our KE rifles a crunching, crackling noise like stepping on an egg. And thank God I couldn't smell them with my visor down. Black fluid was everywhere, coating the floor, the walls, us. Someone retched inside their helmet and forgot to turn the mic off. Then two more joined them. But no one stopped firing, because the bugs didn't stop coming. They slowed, but only because the doorway was becoming packed with their dead. Dozens of them each probably seven or eight hundred pounds, nine or ten feet long, their arms and legs still moving senselessly once their brains and central nervous systems were taken out. They were pushing us back just by the virtue of taking up too much damn space. I realized I hadn't fired my rifle and thought I should shoot something, but by the time I found a target, the thing had already been riddled with plasma or laser and toppled over. Pops wasn't shooting either, I noticed, risking a glance across the chamber at him. He stood with Evans, like he was the colonel's bodyguard, and maybe he was. Quinn stood behind me, and I wondered if he thought of himself the same way. I hope not. I neither needed nor wanted a bodyguard. I was a door kicker, and I didn't give a shit what the rank on my collar said. 
Bursts of plasma erased all thought from my head, replacing it with raw fear. The bugs who'd fired the shots went down, but so did three more of the Tavinians. They'd started out with a company, and the best I could estimate was that they'd lost half their numbers. We had probably a squad and a half worth of rangers, KIA, eleven or twelve. I wanted to feel grief for them, and I might eventually, but the sad truth was, I just didn't know this group as well as I had Danny Brooks's battalion. They were nameless faces at the best of times, faceless icons on the IFF transponder now. But I had hope we wouldn't lose any more, for a while at least. Bug corpses were piled in the doorway, two and three deep, and now, when they tried to come in, they had to climb a mountain of their own dead. The downside was it was harder for us to hit them until they cleared the bodies, and our rounds and laser blasts were too often wasted on the dead. Evans was yelling at his rangers, telling them to conserve ammo, and ammo was my worry. We could hold the bugs off indefinitely with this bottleneck, or at least until we ran out of water. But the bugs didn't seem to care about dying, and it took long bursts or concentrated fire to kill just one of them. I'd already seen most of the rangers change drums, which would leave them with only one more spare, and that would be tungsten penetrators, not as efficient at killing the bugs. Evans, I said, my mouth working only fractions of a second behind my brain, because I had no good ideas, only bad ones and worse ones. We can't stay here much longer. I thought these things would pull back once they realize they can't get through without us mowing them down by the dozens, but they don't give a shit. We can't kill them all, and we're going to wind up trapped in here. Well, what the hell do you suggest, then? He ground out, shooting as he spoke. I paused and added my own gunfire to the mix this time, because too many of the Tavinians were missing. The shuttles are coming back for us, I told him. We should try to break out and set up an LZ for them. hoo he grunted, the all-purpose army grunt that could mean everything from I understand to I'm excited at the prospect. I chose to assume this one meant the latter, but I was probably wrong. I'll get the platoon at the rear to move up and take the lead. Tell them to follow us, I decided. Rangers lead the way, Major, he said, sounding offended. Not this time, I motioned to Pops. This time you can back up Delta, because that worked so well in Mogadishu. These things ain't skinnies, Pops reminded me. But those plasma guns will take down our shuttles just like an RPG against a Blackhawk if we let them. I hated that movie, Quinn said. It was a true story, more or less. Pops reminded him, a little outrage in his voice at the idea a Delta team member might not know that. Yeah, no, that's why I hate it. Delta, form on me, I ordered, pushing forward. The Rangers and Tavinians in front were still firing, and I had to trust that they'd try to avoid shooting us by accident. Colonel Evans, get me a platoon for support. Major Clanton, Carty Mandua said, dashing across the center to stand beside me, in an age-old instinct that didn't care about the fact that radios didn't need that sort of proximity. Where do you want my people? Cover our breakout, I told her. Keep shooting at the bugs coming through. Then once we make it outside, the bugs are going to come after us, and I need you to come out behind us and keep suppressive fire on them which sounded better than telling her that her soldiers were little better than cannon fodder, and I didn't trust them to move tactically. But I suppose it worked. We will support you. I just hope our shuttles make it back for us. Yeah, thanks. I fucking hope so, too. Thanks for reminding me. We ready, Pops? I suppose you're going to insist on going first, he said, his tone gently chiding. You know me so well, I grinned. Evans, shift fire! The rangers moved their gunfire to the right, giving us an opening on the left, barely. Most of the space through the doorway was clogged with the remains of bugs, and I stamped their limbs under my feet. They crunched and crackled and sprayed black eye core across the legs of my svalon, but I kept going and kept my eyes on the opening. A red-tinged carapace shoved its way through, and I blasted it through the face and kicked away its plasma gun. The weapon was heavy and I felt the impact all the way through the suit and up into my back. But then I was through the airlock field. The outside. The outside reminded me of an old movie I'd seen as a kid. It was something from my grandfather's day, or maybe even my great-grandfather's, about giant ants. I didn't remember much about it, but I remembered the horrible old-timey special effects with the giant insects looming over the humans. 
They'd been slow and clumsy, and I'd laughed at the way the people sort of just stood there and let the things overrun them. The bugs were not like those ants. They weren't slow, and they weren't clumsy. And if these fuckers had invaded Los Angeles in the 1950s, then no heroic army soldiers with flamethrowers could have saved Hollywood. I was back in the vacuum, and I decided I liked it better without the sounds and the smells, without the crunch and pops when I shot the bugs. They didn't see me when I squeezed out past their piled corpses, still intent on pushing through the opposite side of the doorway where the opening was larger. There was a line of them stretching back a hundred yards, still eight abreast, as if they were lined up to go through security at a football game. And my first instinct was just run, try to get clear before they noticed me. But that wasn't the mission. I shot the first two in line, and they collapsed partway through the opaque field that was the airlock, blocking the way. Not that it mattered, since the ones behind them seemed to lose interest in going inside, suddenly concentrating on me. I knew the smart thing to do was to head around the curve of the building, both to draw them away and to take me out of their firing arc. But there were a lot of soldiers coming up behind me, and they were going to need more of a distraction than that to get out alive. I ducked under the plasma gun of the bug just behind the two dead ones and walked a burst up through the thing's torso, the plasma rounds punching through its carapace, coating my visor with its black blood. I didn't have time to wipe it away, and I didn't need to. The HUD sensed any obstructions to my vision and replaced the view through the transparent aluminum with a sensor display, all the infrared, thermal, sonic, and LIDAR data stitched together into a plasticky reality. Plasma blasts from the bugs were splashing against the walls of the building around me and crackling and dying in the field of the doorway, but I was ducked down behind the bug I'd just killed, keeping it propped up with my left hand against its chest. I slipped the muzzle of my KE gun under its left side arms and centered the targeting reticle on the upper torso of the closest of them, firing a full auto burst just as the thing triggered its own weapon. Light so bright, I could see it through my closed eyes, through a polarized visor coated with eye core, a wave of heat that brought blisters up on my right arm, and the corpse of the bug I'd been using as cover exploded. The swollen armor could have kept me upright, but I let myself fall backwards, knowing that standing would have made me a bigger target. I almost didn't notice the Delta team coming up behind me concentrating their fire on the front rank of the bugs, laying them out, setting up a sort of fire break to keep the others back. And still it wouldn't have been enough. There were more than I'd thought, more than I'd imagined there could be. And if they weren't still falling out of the sky, it was because they already had. This had been a very bad idea, and I had perhaps underestimated just how bad. Something vibrated through the ground, through my suit, through my bones. Something not purely physical. And dozens of bugs were squished under the boot of God. Or that's what it seemed like to me at first. It had to happen again before I figured out what was going on. Julie had found a way to use that damn transport as a weapon. She fell out of the sky like a meteor. Fast enough, she had to be supersonic. And around the transport, in a shimmering globe maybe 50 yards in diameter, the drive field glowed light blue. And when that globe touched the ground, it smashed bugs flat beneath it, turning them into splotches of black and red. They were shooting at it, wasting their plasma guns against its gravitic dry field and accomplishing nothing. And if she couldn't take them all down that way, she had at least gotten their attention. I was about to try calling her, asking her if she'd seen the shuttles, when the first of them descended on columns of fire, its belly jets glowing white, its chin cannon slewing back and forth, spraying hundreds of plasma rounds a minute through the coil gun. Bug torsos disintegrated under the heavy weapons fire, and then the electromagnetic slug cannon was joined by the one on Gunfighter 2. They didn't need us to clear them in LZ. They were doing it themselves. Julie, I called. Do you copy? I'm here, you big dummy, she replied. Why do you keep getting yourself into situations like this? Get everyone outside. We've got a narrow gap and we have to get the hell out of here. What's going on? I asked. Where are the bug ships? The Tavinians? The Jambo? Later. Get on board. The gunfighter shuttles were landing and so was Julie. 
touching down lightly, as if she hadn't just hammered the thing into the ground at 700 miles an hour. And behind them all, two of the Tavinian shuttles were coming in, spraying laser fire down on the bug lines, clearing out even more of the LZ. Evans, I called. Captain Cartimandua, get your people out here, onto the shuttles, now! One of the Tavinian birds was descending right behind the hammerheads, but the other had stayed up too long, tried to do too much, and when the plasma bolts began streaking up from clusters of the enemy over a mile away, it was too high to avoid them. The bird didn't yaw or tumble, not without an atmosphere. When the energy blasts struck it in the belly jets and took them out, it simply fell, straight down. The impact was too far away for me to even feel the vibration through the ground, but the column of smoke rose from the crash, a short-lived monument to their bravery. I could see the bugs swarming over it, even at this distance. If anyone had survived the crash, they hadn't survived long. Belly ramps were lowering, and rangers were clambering aboard, even before they were halfway down, piling into the hammerheads like they were the last lifeboats off the Titanic. The Tavinians were just as desperate, and a shoving match broke out when there was no more room aboard their only surviving shuttle, and Carti Mandua herself had to shove her laser rifle in some poor schmuck's face to get him off the ramp. Over here, I told her, waving toward Gunfighter 2. We have room for your overflow. I left her to it, hoping she could sort things out, but not willing to miss my ride to save the Tavinians. There seemed to be a thin veneer of unreality over the scene, and given where I was and what I was doing, the fact that anything else could even appear unreal to me was impressive. The Tavinians had killed so many of my friends, people I considered brothers and sisters, Danny Brooks, Junpa, Jambo, and here I was trying to help them escape their fate. Would Jambo have been offended, or would he have found the whole thing amusing? He'd been in the business long enough to see enemies turn into allies and vice versa more than once, so I figured he'd understand. Pops, get the team in the transport, I told him, making shooing motions toward the alien vessel. It's going to be tight, but I want everyone together mostly because I didn't know where the hell we were supposed to be going and I knew the transport could get us to safety. Maybe that was cold-blooded, but I couldn't save all the rangers, and I could damn well be sure to save my team. I was the last one aboard the transport, the last American aboard any of the shuttles, which required a staring contest with Evans, who must have thought outranking me by one meant he should be the last one down. I couldn't hear his sigh of resignation when he stepped up the ramp, but I was as sure of its existence as my father had been of the Holy Trinity. Go! I yelled, throwing back my visor as I squeezed past the packed-in Delta team, heading for the cockpit. We're all here! The ship might have taken off and might not have. Given the nature of the thing, I had no way of knowing until I reached the cockpit. Oliveira must have been frustrated because there was nowhere to pace. The cockpit was already packed with him... Julie, the flight crew, and the Alliance research crew, and everyone who didn't already have a seat had to scoot into available corners when I shouldered my way in wearing bulky Svalin armor. You all right, Andy? Oliveira asked, putting a hand on my shoulder as if the powered exoskeleton needed the support. I have been better, I admitted. Thanks for saving our asses, hon, I told Julie. But how are we getting out of here? Looking over her shoulder at the main screen, I could see that we were indeed flying already, though nowhere near as fast as we were capable. We were holding back for the shuttles, I assumed, since they were right behind us in the sensor feed. What I didn't know was where the hell we were going. The Tavinian ships led the bugs around the other side of the star, she told me, her voice tight, as if flying the transport took the utmost concentration. Or maybe she was still mad at me for not saying goodbye. They sent a signal back on our comm networks, saying they'd try to come back and pick us up if they could shake them. We're going to head for the outside, and hope to God one of them picks us up on the way. Which was less of a sure thing than I was hoping for, but beggars can't be choosers. It was bad down there, I told her and Oliveira. I think I made a mistake keeping us on the ground instead of just staying with the shuttles. I didn't want to admit that even to myself, much less in front of everyone else, but Julie would know and Oliveira deserved to. Don't be stupid, Pops snapped, and I looked up at him, blinking in surprise at his harsh tone. Those pods would have been all over us before we could have gotten everyone on board. 
Besides, you had no way of knowing Graham would flake out on us. Stop second-guessing yourself. Oh, shit, Julie hissed, and my gaze snapped back to the main screen. There were three ships heading around the star, moving at a high enough acceleration that I figured they had to be using the same sort of space-time distortion sublight drive as the Helta, because the reaction drive didn't exist that could accelerate that fast. But they weren't Helta, and they weren't Tavinian. They were jagged and irregular, alien and intimidating. They were the bugs. Somehow, I said, the voice seeming to come from someone else far away. I don't think the Tavinians are coming back for us. Chapter 27 Mike, Julie said, turning in her seat and staring at the man. What the hell are we going to do? It was a question I was glad I didn't have to answer. Options, Oliveira snapped. Quick. We could land again, I said, but it's going to be almost impossible to find another atmosphere-sealed building which means we're going back to the transmission tower, which means wave after wave of bugs. That's a hard no, he snapped. More. We keep heading for the outside, Pop said. Hope the Jambo is still there to come pick us up. We won't make it, Julie warned. Those things are still pretty far away, but they're fast as shit, and the hammerheads in the Tavinian shuttle can't do much more than two or three gravities without going dry in minutes. Just making it out of the hole is going to take them the better part of ten hours. We could simply leave them here, Bonso said, then seemed to shrink at multiple glares. I'm sorry, but they can't make it out. They should land at the tower and try to hold out there. We can go out and go for help. The words were translated, but even the translator made the last three words weak and lame. I'll tell the shuttles to keep going, Julie said, sounding determined. I knew her well enough to figure out she was faking it, that she was as scared as everyone else. We'll try to take on the bugs ourselves. We have no weapons, Foggy said, waving her tentacles frantically. Then we'll ram the fuckers, Julie snapped at her. We're not leaving our people behind. Wait a second, I said, raising a hand to calm everyone down. This ship, can you extend its gravity field to cover the shuttles? How the fuck should I know? Julie demanded. I know how to fly the damn thing, and only just. Bonso, foggy, I said, wondering if the translator could work the desperation I was feeling into its tone. Shush, lasso. Shri salasa. The Vironian corrected me. Yeah, that. Can you guys extend the dry field big enough to cover all three shuttles? The three of them looked at each other, and I had the sudden epiphany that I'd missed my chance. I should have called them Mo, Larry, and Curly. It's possible. Bonso ventured. I should say I can extend the drive field. That's one of the basic controls, but I can't promise that it will take the shuttles along with us in the drive effect. It might simply rip them to pieces. The hell with it, Oliveira said. It's the only tactic that even has a possibility of all of us living through this. Do it. We'll need to get these shuttles as close to our hull as possible, Bonso warned. And we'll have to deactivate the drive field while they do it. Get on the horn and get it done, Julie, Oliveira said. Mike, I said softly, trying to stay private while everyone else was involved in getting the maneuver set up. Are you sure about this? I shook my head. My track record hasn't been so hot on this trip, no matter what Pops says, and I'm just pulling this out of my ass. Oliveira cocked an eyebrow at me. What you've pulled out of your ass has kept us all alive for the last two years. Watch it, Julie warned. We're losing the grav field. I locked the magnetic anchors in my suit's heels to the floor, and only Vera grabbed my arm, holding himself in place when the artificial gravity faded along with the drive. My stomach flip-flopped with the sudden freefall, and I nearly grabbed him back until my hind brain realized what my forebrain already knew, that I wasn't going anywhere. They're maneuvering as close to us as they can, Julie said. She rolled her eyes. That Tavinian pilot isn't doing much to impress me. Honest to God, it's like he's driving a fucking school bus. Give him a break, honey, I told her. He was probably in the Air Force. Oh, fuck you both, Oliveira said, scowling. Okay, they're in place, she said, shrugging. Or as close as they're going to get without hitting us. I am reactivating the field, Bonso announced. 
It should be big enough, I hope. Gosh, she's encouraging, I murmured. We are working with technology beyond anything the Helta have ever seen. The translation software was pretty expert at Helta inflection, and it infused the words with just the right plaintive tone. We will be lucky if we aren't all ripped to shreds by the feedback. Just turn the thing on, Bonsol, Oliveira ordered. If we're going to die, I'd rather get it over with. The Helta might have winced as he reached for the control, I wasn't sure. I'd seen a lot of Helta expressions, but never a wince. There was something different about the field. I couldn't have accurately described it, but somehow I felt it dragging, sluggish. But no one blew up, which I took as an encouraging sign. Well, slap my ass and call me Sally, Julie said, grinning as our weight returned to normal. Later, I promised. Can we move with them in the field? She traced a line through the haptic hologram, moving the slider just slightly to the right, and we moved. Not very fast, not compared to how fast I knew this thing could accelerate, but we were moving. The bugs are getting closer, Bonso warned, pointing at the screen. I do not know if the field will stand up to their weapons stretched this thin. We need to move faster. Oh, stop whining, you big fuzzy grandma, Julie snapped. I'm opening up the throttle. I blame you for this, Oliveira confided, glaring at me. She didn't used to be this big of a smartass. Yes, she did, I insisted. Yes, I did, she confirmed, though she wasn't looking at us, staring instead at the controls as she slowly moved the slider. Yeah, seems like it's working. It's picking up speed, slowly, she tisked. Hard to tell because I can't read the display, but... It looks just by how fast things are passing below us that we're not accelerating anywhere near the same rate as before, probably because of the way we've expanded the field. I think this is about as fast as we can go, but we should make the hole in about an hour. I do not believe that is going to be enough, Foggy said. If I am estimating correctly, the bug ships will be on top of us within forty minutes. It was impressive, I thought, that Foggy could figure that out in her head just from an eyeball estimate of our acceleration. Depressing, but still impressive. I don't know what else I can do, Julie said. It's at full power. Maybe the field will protect us from their plasma thingies. I am detecting something coming through the hole, Bonso told us, his voice a dirge at our funeral. If their ships return and cut us off, we are not going to make it out of this place. I should have stayed on Helta Prime and raised my children. I feel like I'm on a combat mission with Winnie the Pooh, I told Oliveira. Julie, you getting any reading on what's coming through? I am, she said, grinning. You see that pattern? She pointed at one of the sensor readings, a wave of some kind that could have been almost anything in the eyes of this history major. That is a Helta drive pattern, Bonso exclaimed, his earlier lamentation forgotten. It's the Jambo, Oliveira sighed, sagging as if the tension had been all that was holding him up. Thank God. She's burning in hard, too, Julie observed. And you see that spike? She tapped another spot on the haptic hologram, where I assumed the aforementioned spike was, though you couldn't have proven it by me. They're about to fire. The Jambo was still way too far out for an optical camera to catch sight of her against the background noise but the impulse gun made the instruments flicker, and I thought I saw a wave of unreality across the front of our transport, where the tungsten slug went by us at a good percentage of the speed of light. The bug ship didn't try to dodge. I doubt they even knew they'd been fired upon. One second, the thing was there, black against the silver sky, something that brought to mind quartz crystals grown in a solution. And then, it was imploding, folding in on itself before the giant-sized origami was replaced by a short-lived star. The other two bug vessels split off, veering wide away from the dorsal mount gun, but it wasn't the Jambo's only weapon. The particle cannon snaked out with a hint of pale blue, even in the vacuum, and a bug ship snapped away from it like it had been stung. General Oliveira, do you copy? There was no mistaking Reitfeld's voice on the comms. The man sounded like 1980s Arnold, which was made even more hilarious by the fact that he barely came up to my nose and could have been knocked over by a stiff breeze. Yes, Colonel, 
Oliveira replied, still sounding relieved, though perhaps with a tinge of regret, as if he knew what was coming. I certainly knew what was coming. Sir, Reitfeld said, going into his scolding mother tone, I feel I must reiterate my objections to the mission commander leaving the ship and putting himself in physical danger. This is the third time you have done it, and I do not want to be the one to return to Earth and tell the coalition that I let you get yourself killed without objecting. Understood, Colonel Reitfeld. Where are the ships that were chasing you? Another of the bug ships tried to dart in, and the particle cannon lashed out at it, surrounding it in a halo of blue energy. I wasn't sure if it was getting past their shields, but it was keeping them back, which was good enough. Across the solar system at the moment, but that will not last. We will intercept in one minute, and I strongly suggest all four of your ships should dock at once, because if the enemy reaches the other side of the hole before we do... I get the point, Colonel. We'll manage it. Oliveira cocked an eyebrow at Julie. We will manage it, won't we? Now you bother to ask, she sighed. It's going to be tricky. I hope you're not too attached to the landing gear on those shuttles. Oliveira didn't have a chance to answer because the hangar bay of the Jambo was rushing up at us, yawning and black and yet oh so small compared to all four of the ships clustered together. This'll be fun, Julie murmured, her eyes focused in a way that would have been scary if she'd been looking at me. The silver walls and harsh white light of the hangar bay replaced the unreal sky and the nightless star, and Julie's hands slashed across the display. Cut in power! And we were down. If there had been one of those pyramids of champagne glasses sitting on the control panel, not a one would have tumbled. Though from the view on the main screen, the landing hadn't been quite so restful for the shuttles. All three of them were still bouncing up and down on their hydraulic shock absorbers, from where the artificial gravity of the Jambo had taken over for the artificial gravity the transport had been providing. Thank the elders, Bonso breathed, clutching at his chest, as if his heart was about to pound straight out of it. Don't be thanking anyone just yet, Oliveira warned him, heading out of the cockpit. We still have to get out of this goddamn sphere. He motioned to Julie. Colonel Nieves, with me. You too, Andy. Get everyone settled in, I told Pops, as we passed him on the way from the cockpit to the airlock. And for fuck's sake, make sure no one shoots the damn Tavinians. Oh, that'll be easier said than done. And by the way, I went on to Oliveira as I caught up with him and Julie at the ramp. How come she's Colonel Nieves, but I'm just Andy? That doesn't seem fair. Life is not fair, Oliveira confided. Outside the transport, Rangers and Tavinians were piling out of the shuttles, pulling off helmets. A few of the flight maintenance crew were giving the armed Tavinians wide-eyed stares, and I hoped Pops would take charge of that shit. Anyway, she's more a Colonel Nieves, and you're more... He shrugged. An Andy. What are we going to do about the Tavinians? I asked him, putting aside the slight for now. For the moment, hope they don't start trying to kill us. I'll think about it after we're out of here. Me? I'd been trying to think about it now, so I wouldn't have to think about how we were going to get out of here. The bridge was as taut as a guitar string when we arrived, and the only face that looked happy to be there was also fringed with fur. Brother, Anu Nim Klaas said, offering me a hand. Next time you tell me I am not needed on a landing mission, I believe I will ignore you and go anyway. I don't know if you would have liked this fight, brother. I told him. These bugs don't respond well to tooth and claw. You pretty much have to blast the shit out of them. Excellent work, Johan, Oliveira said to Reitfeld, clapping the man on the shoulder as he urged him out of his seat at the command station. Now that I am safely back on the ship where you think I belong, you are officially relieved. Report to the auxiliary command deck. You too, sonny boy, Julie told the junior helm officer, jerking a thumb backwards. Get out of my damn chair. I couldn't even remember the kid's name, but he was a first lieutenant, and he moved. Julie didn't even glance back at him as she slid into the seat. We're five minutes from the hole, she reported immediately. Graciano, Oliveira asked, sighing as he fell into his chair. Status report. Where are the bad guys? The ones behind us are 7,000 kilometers and 9,000 kilometers away, respectively, and they're not in any special hurry to get closer. Feels like they're content to herd us toward the hole. 
probably in contact with the rest of their ships on the other side. Which means they're going to be waiting on us when we come out, I put in. Or else they'd already be all over us, and damn the consequences. From what I saw of these assholes down on the ground, they're not big on self-preservation. They're preserving themselves to attack us from both sides. Shit, just when I thought we were home free. Any ideas, Olivera said. And at first I thought he was speaking to the bridge crew in general until I noticed he was looking at me. Damn it. That's the problem with having a good idea once. People kept expecting me to have them all the time. Is there any way we can jump from inside the sphere? I wanted to know. I looked around at a lot of wide eyes. Anyone? There's no way, Julie protested. The mass of the sphere would rip us to pieces if we tried. Um, strictly speaking, that's not quite true. I looked around, wondering where the voice had come from, before I realized it had originated from the intercom speakers. Who the hell is this? Oliveira demanded. Bon so, General, the health scientist told him. And technically, if you can find the exact position where the gravitational pull of the sphere is negated by the pull of the star, you could jump from that point. And does anyone know where that might be? Oliveira asked. Hands spread, eyes upward, as if he were asking God for help. Of course, I'm sending it down to your helm station. I take back every bad thing I've said about you, Bonso, I assured him. Why, thank you, Major Clanton. A long pause. What bad things did you say about me? Okay, I got it, Julie interrupted. Changing course. You might want to convince those two assholes not to get in the way. Good idea, Oliveira said, nodding to Graciano. Tactical. Target the closest of the bug ships and fire the particle cannon. Okie dokie, okie dokie, I murmured under my breath. Let's fire blue particle cannons full, red particle cannons full, gannet magnets, fire them left and right, and let them run all shoots. And while you're at it, why don't you toss that at him, killer? I mimed throwing a soda can at Graziano. That should take care of old lobster head, shouldn't it? Some people quoted the Bible in stressful situations. I quoted old movies. I heard that, Oliveira snapped. Then he turned and grinned at me. And I approve. Best science fiction movie ever. And I take back everything I ever said about you, too, General. On the main screen, the closest bug ship lit up like a Christmas tree ornament under the crackling lance of energy. And the blue tint of the halo around their ship began to take on hints of red and white. I was hoping that meant something good for us and bad for them. Then I saw something glowing near their bow, or what I thought was their bow. It was at least the part of the ship pointed toward us, and I had a nasty idea what it might be. Julie, I yelled from instinct, hard to starboard. I didn't think about it until a moment later, the fact that I was taking control of the ship from her rightful captain, or general, or whatever, fucking Space Force. But if Oliveira minded, he didn't say so, because Julie, for once, listened to me. The ship slewed to the right just as a gigantic fireball blasted out of that glowing emitter and passed through the space we just occupied. Jesus, Julie hissed. That thing was huge. How long till we're in position? Oliveira asked. Thirty seconds, she told him. Light him up, Graciano. Keep firing until I tell you to stop. Another crackling blue line attaching us to the bug ship. And this time... The halo around it glowed white from the start, and I got the feeling it was just this close to breaking, but not quite yet. I wish we had missiles, I said. They might not do any good, but at least it would keep them busy. Oh, damn, Julie said mildly, like she just remembered she'd missed a dentist appointment. The other ship had fired. It was farther away than the first one had been when it had shot at us, and the view jerked to the left as Julie tried to avoid the plasma packet. It was moving slower than light, but not that slow, and the round grazed us, not hitting the ship square. It was still enough to shake the whole cruiser like a bone in a dog's mouth, and I anchored my magnetic boots to the deck and grabbed Anonim Klaas's arm, trying very hard not to let either of us get thrown across the compartment. He grunted, either in pain or surprise, but then gave me a gesture the translator assured me was one of thanks in the Skrith culture. Maybe you should strap in, I told him, letting go. He made a sound that might have been agreement or maybe skepticism, but he grabbed one of the unoccupied acceleration couches at the rear of the bridge. 
Dry field attenuated 30%, Julie reported. No structural damage, Captain Dinshaw, the damage control officer, said, trying to justify his existence. Another cross-trainer, this time from the Indian Air Force, and I was beginning to wonder if we'd wind up with every member nation of the coalition insisting on having their own starship. Engineering reports some burnouts, but they've switched over to a backup circuit. Another hit like that might burn out a main power trunk. Well, let's try not to let that happen, Oliveira agreed. Julie, how long? Ten seconds. They're going to fire again, Graziano said. The closer of the two, getting the same sort of energy buildup as before. Discourage him, Charles. The particle cannon seemed a bit more anemic this time, probably because the hit had weakened the drive field, and the drive field was what powered the accelerator, but it was enough to knock the thing off its axis a few degrees. We got enemy ships coming through the hole, Graziano yelled. Calm down, Chuck, Julie chided, smirking as she swiped her fingers across the control screen. Jump in, now! The stars swirled around in kaleidoscope blur and we left the Dyson Sphere and bugs behind us, and way too many of our dead. Tension leached out of the bridge, as if the whole ship had let out a sigh. I cut loose my magnetic boot anchors and put a hand on the railing behind Oliveira's command station. Where do we go now? I asked him. Straight back to Earth? Maybe that was wishful thinking, but I was ready to get the hell out of the area and back home. I don't think so. Oliveira shook his head, wiping a hand across his mouth as if trying to get rid of a bad taste. Those things showing up all of a sudden at the signal source, right after we arrived. That's not a coincidence. You heard what Graham said. They follow hyperdrive signatures. His expression went grim. I want to see where else they followed them. This is the end of Enemies and Allies, a Podium Audio production. If you enjoyed this audiobook, we would love for you to rate and review it. For more sci-fi, check us out at PodiumAudio.com and sign up for our newsletter. We promise we won't spam you. Also, consider joining our community of listeners, fans, and trolls on social media. We're active on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit. We'd love to connect. You have been listening to Enemies and Allies, Book 4 of Earth at War, produced by Hannah Grenfell, written by Rick Partlow, performed by Scott Aiello, a member of SAG-AFTRA, text copyright 2021 by Rick Partlow, production copyright 2022 by Podium Audio, all rights reserved. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.